welcome okay is everybody having a wonderful day today on this friday afternoon always doing great absolutely happy to hear it so let me lay down some of the ground rules to how this is going to work so nothing tos i think we all kind of understand that rule uh i gotta say this after last week's show explicitly uh no slurs uh will be used on the platform i uh, don't need to go through another i hypocrite situation thank you very much okay my plan out uh, the window then I, yep, that plan out the window. I'm sorry, Vosh. You can't use any of them tactically this time. Uh, so, no slurs. And we're going to do our best to address people in a respectful manner. So I'm not saying that you have to be respectful, but when addressing people, we either uh, use their names or their pronouns. Does anybody have any objections to any of these rules? Okay. You, everything else, on limits, allowed. Wonderful. Now, there's one last thing I need to say when it comes to the rules. If I start talking, everybody else gets quiet because my job here is merely to regulate. So if somebody hasn't had a chance to talk, I want to make sure that they get a chance to talk and I moderate. I'm not coming in here so I can throw a, a elbow up the top rope. I'm just here to moderate. Now I'm going to have you all introduce yourselves quickly. Then we're going to go into the first topic. And we're going to get to carry it away. So I'm going to start on the left. May I ask a question real quick? Sure. What's the judge? What's the judging criteria? Is it just audience oh, voting? That's or? gonna be. We're gonna explain that last. Okay. Okay. Dima Mama, you can introduce yourself quickly. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. My name is Demon Mama. Some of you know me. Some of you don't. I am uh, sometimes uh, known as the Demon of Twitch debate. Um, uh, I am a political edutainer on YouTube and Twitch. I talk about all kinds of issues. Talk about trans issues. I am trans, um, and I also like to talk about a lot of lefty issues. Um, so if you like any of that, you can check out my website and come hang out with the imps. There are more imps than there's ever been, and I am so ready for tonight. So thank you for having me, Dylan. I'm very happy to uh, get into the meat of this discussion. Happy to have you on. Next, we're going to go to Rob Knorr. Hey, my name is Rob Knorr. I'm a conservative populist. I've lived in rural Pennsylvania my whole life. Um, my channel is Rob Knorr, all one word, uh, lowercase on Twitch, Normal America with Rob Knorr on YouTube, and I'm also on some other platforms, but I... Those platforms, I don't really do anything live, or I don't, I don't really do anything on because I've only been doing live streams lately. Um, I think that I will come out on top tonight as the best debater on Twitch. We shall see. But I do know this. I certainly cut the best promo for this event. So I already got that little title under my belt. So happy to be here and glad to see everyone. Glad everyone's doing good. So. Okay. Next is going to go over to John Burke. Hey, what's going on, guys? John Burke here. Uh, I do a lot of politics on Twitch. Uh, thank you, Dylan, for having me on tonight and all the times you come on my, <clears throat> excuse me, debates. I greatly appreciate it. Looking forward to having some insightful discussions tonight to pick people's brains that I possibly might not agree with, have my mind open to possibly have my opinions change on some things. I don't know. But uh, ultimately, it's uh, looking forward to it. Okay. And last is going to be the current reigning champion who's had a, uh, a reign for about two months. Bosh. Yeah, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm a Bloodborne streamer. Um, last night, I was the first person to ever defeat um, uh, 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 Orphan of Cause, and then the, um, the Moon Spirit, whatever the fuck her name was. And uh, I don't do the baits, so really, I'm just a wild card here, you know? Okay. Now, lastly, let me explain how the judging is going to work. Now, since this is a fatal four-way, three judges is not enough. Usually you have three judges to break any tie, but we could see one judge going for John Burke, one judge going for Vosh, one go judge going to Rob, and then you have a three-way tie. It doesn't make sense. So for this one, in the special edition, we're going to actually have five judges. Five judges, so it's a lot less likely that there'll be a tie. Now, a tie might still occur. There could be a scenario where Demon gets two and Rob gets two, and then it's, it's confusing because there's a tie, or Vosh gets two and John gets two. Now... This is uh, how it's going to work if the champion is involved in a tie. Now, this most likely will not happen, but I wanted to make this clear off the bat because you never know. If, if the champion is involved in a tie, technically, due to the rules, they retain the belt. That's how it works in boxing. That's how it works in wrestling. That's how it works here. If two other people get ties, then they will have a follow-up match on another meet week to see who gets the belt then with three judges, which means it'll be impossible for there to be a tie. Does everybody understand how it would work if, if a tie scenario occurred? Yep. Yes. Wonderful. It's a great okay. belt, Dylan. You know? Thank it's you. Nice. Oh, Thank there's you. actually a belt. Yeah, yeah, an actual belt. Yes. Yeah, oh, you can see yourself awesome. in the reflection. I keep it polished. I shine it every mm. single day. 
giving it the respect it deserves. Now, you, you literally go... send the belt to the winner. Yes. That's oh, that's awesome. I didn't know yeah. that. That's really we cool. We have them custom made. We have a manufacturer who makes belts. Every, if you win, you we don't take the belt back. You get to keep it forever. But we have oh. a free champion, just like boxing. Well, that is really cool. Thank you. We put a lot of work into the show. And for everybody out there who wants to help fund the making of those belts, because they're actually quite expensive to have custom made, uh, you can, of course, support the channel. So we're going to go into the first topic, which is actually very recent news. It's about the Amazon's workers' union. The workers voted two to one to not form a union in Alabama. Now, a lot of people are proposing a lot of different reasons as to why this happened. And this is also spurred on a different conversation about unionization efforts in the country. So I propose a question to all of you. Why do you think the workers voted not to have a union at this Amazon facility? And what do you think this means for unionization efforts across the country? You, uh, and also, you can have a wider conversation about just specifically what you think of unions as well. Everybody's going to have a small intro period, and then we're going to open it up to the floor. Bosch, you wanted to ask a question quick? Oh, no, I just wanted to know whether it was free for all that we had rounds, but you just said, so okay. we're good. Wonderful. So, all of you, you're going to have a one-minute period. Please be uh, short with the intros. Trust me, you'll have time to talk. I'm going to start it in the top right-hand corner with Rob Noor. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I was unaware of this until uh, – this and the third topic I was unaware of until like 10 minutes before we came on here. So, with this issue, I'm not exactly pro or anti-union. I think that unions make sense in certain areas. They certainly made sense in a lot of places historically. But there are reasons for particular places of work and for particular industries where unions don't work out as well. The question of why did these people vote not to have a union? Well, there's two possibilities, I guess. One, because they did their research, which was fair, and they determined that a union wasn't worth it there. And I got some some evidence to suggest that that could be the case, or it could be because Amazon unfairly put their finger on the scale and convinced people not to have a union. Uh, either way, like, I don't know, it, we'll get into the details of what could have happened. I don't see proof one way or the other. It's probably a combination of the two. Uh, do we need more unions? Not necessarily. I am in favor, though, of workers. I think that this country, through corruption in our governorship, has taken away the value of workers in the last 50 years. And so if unions were a way to do that, that'd be fine. But you also see corruption in unions as well. So to me, the question it's more about ending the corruption in our government to encourage workers uh, getting the wages they deserve. But I'm not necessarily anti-union or pro-union. Um, yeah, that's basically my thoughts. Okay. Next, I'm going to send it over to John Burke. Yeah, I mean, basically, Rob just hit it all. I think in the early days of like the 20th century, I mean, even beyond that, unions were definitely needed. You saw the working conditions of, say, for example, women in sweatshops, children in sweatshops. Uh, even in America, um, when immigrants came over, they were treated very unfairly. The unionization actually helped a lot to protect them but as with any good thing when it involves money you tend to see it just like the government slowly lean towards corruption so i can't say that i'm pro or anti i've never actually been involved in working for a union um i have literally no experience there so i do need to put that out there first and foremost but i can't i can't generalize it i can't sit there and say that all unions are good or all unions are bad i feel like according to them practicing democracy in alabama i believe it was and again i've just saw this the first time. If that's how they voted, that's how they voted. Um, I don't really have anything else to say about it, to tell you the truth. I mean, if that's how the people feel, that's how the people feel. As far as the rest of the country, I think if they're, uh, if they're choosing to unionize as a group, I would say look into the issues behind why they're unionizing. Is there, are their conditions, are working conditions not good, poor, or whatever the case may be, and then have the discussion in regards to workers' rights regarding the labor union. But um, yeah, I, mean, I don't feel very passionate about this, and it's not that I feel like it's not important. I just, I don't really know a lot about it, so. Okay. Next is going to be Demon Mama. I find it interesting that the populace so far don't really support unions. Uh, unions are about the best way for the populace to band together and stand up against people who have an incredible amount of more resources against them. In this case, um, there is a lot going on in here. In fact, as it turns out, the National Labor Review Board might actually be ordering this election totally uh, off the books and a second election to be held because there was so much Amazon tampering in the uh, de democratic elements of this election that it can't, uh, that there's a very good chance that this election will be redone. Not only is, has there now been evidence revealed that Amazon um, was working with the USPS to provide, uh, to get an illegally placed uh, ballot box placed on their campus. Um, under, of course, the security cameras run by Amazon, but also that in the weeks up, the government had to order them to stop making mandatory propaganda meetings 
every single week that pumped out anti-union propaganda. Now, I've worked a lot of jobs in my life. I've worked a lot of minimum wage jobs. None of them have ever been able to have a union, but every single one required as a part of their training for you to watch anti-union propaganda. So if you want to know why unions have declined in America, as has the satisfaction of work, America's wages, and the benefits for America's workers, it's specifically because there's been a mass effort of anti-union propaganda pushed out by every single major corporation in the United States. So that's why union efforts fail, not just because of some democratic element. In fact, I just watched um, video footage this morning that in the Amazon Alabama warehouse, they would put they were putting placards in the stalls that were anti-union propaganda. So you can't even pee in peace. That's okay. all I got to say on this one. Next is going to be the current champion, Vosh. Yeah, I respect the results of democratic elections, but that doesn't mean that those results can't be criticized, especially when there are serious inquiries into the legitimacy of that election and the extent to which other agencies influence the results. Um, people ultimately believe what they're led to believe. And if you are a modern American worker, you are insulated at all times with the message that unions are going to be harmful to you and harmful to the economy and harmful to the business. But of course, the data contradicts this in the extreme. Unions are far and away an incredibly effective way of ensuring the ability for workers to collectively bargain, which allows them to fight for their rights, allows them to fight for higher wages, uh, and for a great many other things. So what we're looking at right now, and of course the dust needs to settle a bit with this particular Alabama warehouse, um, what we're looking at right now is the consequence, I feel, of a fairly successful decades-long campaign to stigmatize unions in the mind of the American worker. We've seen union membership drop proportionally to the percentage of total American wealth that goes to the ultra-wealthy. It's a campaign they've been waging for hundreds of years, and they're doing quite well at the moment. So while I respect democratic results, barring the results of this investigation, because it seems like Amazon had their foot on the scale, had two feet on the scale. While I accept democratic results, we should still wonder, why do people, why do workers, so consistently vote against their own best interests? Why? What are they taught? From where are they being taught? And why are they being taught that? Okay, so I'm going to ask you all politely, this won't be a force, of course, to be on your best behavior, always be nice, make sugar your favorite spice, and you may all begin the first round. Yeah. So I do, I do think it's funny that Vaj hedges right out of the gate by saying he respects the results of elections because it sounds like what Demon Mom was saying there sounds so similar to what people that question the results of the 2020 election were saying. And Vaj even alludes to it when he talks about people putting their thumbs on the scale. We could talk about the intel agency putting their thumb on the scale, the 2020 election, other things like that, uh, you know, government institutions that were putting their thumb on the scale. I understand that's off topic, so we won't focus on it. But the point is this, like, I don't understand if it's Amazon's company, barring that they did anything illegal, even if they, you know, were heavily telling their people not to unionize, why that's not their right to do so. Also, I think that it's naive to think that these people don't have access to the internet and tons of arguments and tons of information that are pro-union places. So I, to just assume the naivety of the people that voted for this and say they only made this decision through propaganda, I think that that's tenuous at best. So this is silly so on a number of levels. First and foremost, the reason why we scoff at the election meddling claims with regard to the national election is because Trump's campaign team consistently embarrassed themselves dozens of times over every time they were asked to prove it. Whereas the evidence right now that there was a thumb on the scale with the Amazon election seems a lot more direct and compelling. Uh, additionally, the idea that people aren't influenced by propaganda, you're, what you're essentially saying is, how can people be influenced by propaganda when they have an internet connection? If that was the case, the entire field of advertising wouldn't exist. I think that's a ridiculous concern. These companies well, nor pour- would, Nor would Rob's channel either. Oh, true. Yeah, exactly. Wait, why? then why would my, how could I supply any info to my audience? We all have access to an internet connection. No, people get info from where they get info, and not everyone spends hours- typing up research on union relationship to proportion of wages earned by workers. Ultimately, companies like Amazon have spent billions convincing people that unions don't work. Now, they wouldn't be putting that money in if they weren't getting a return on it. I imagine they're getting a pretty good return at that. Well, and it's not just a matter of just propaganda either. We're talking about, I'm not kidding you, you can get video footage of the 
Amazon uh, of the the Amazon influence, by the way, and this is a matter of FOIA, which is currently being fully investigated. And and there's been, I think, three very serious journalists uh, who've signed off on this so far. One of them from uh, from Vice, one of them from The Intercept, and then a third from a a admittedly biased union source who was making the original allegations and are now being investigated. But in these in these videos, you can literally see where Amazon had uh had the uh voting or the uh the ballot box placed underneath their security cameras so it's not just a matter of of uh of um of pr propaganda we're talking about active and constant um pressure from the employers this is what we call intimidation and in fact there was uh there has been multiple reports from the employees at that site saying that their managers were heckling them constantly to make sure that they voted and with a very strong nudge in the direction which they were supposed to vote. This is a very dirty situation that goes so far to the, and by the way, this was a story that broke before, this has already been verified, but Amazon pressured the local town to remove a stoplight outside of their facility because the union organizers were handing out pamphlets at that stoplight while cars were stopped. And they literally pressured the town, threatened to close up shop and deprive the town of any tax revenue in order to stop union organizers from getting pamphlets out. To me, that sounds like a company that's willing to threaten its own workers in order to get what it wants. And I don't blame those workers for saying, listen, I can't gamble it. I need to feed my family. I got a side with, with the company here because it's not worth risking a vote on. And that sucks, okay. but that's terror. That's how this stuff works. That's how you you impress all right. uh, on one another. All right. So just to so just to respond to what Vaj said there. So again, he says that's because Trump's team was laughed out. Like I'm not talking about the claims that vote tallies were switched or Dominion did this or that. Whatever. I've never like really been on board with those arguments. But we could clearly see that there were agencies within the government that put their thumb on the scale, such as the intel agencies. In fact, we had 50 intel officials that supported the censorship of a story critical of Biden and his son by the New York Post, which. You we don't want to go down true. this road. We saw that. Sure, we, don't we want, I would yeah, love to go down that road. We don't have to in this debate, but I would love to go down that road. The point is that it was clear that the intel agencies, places like the places like the EPA, places like the IRS, places like the Defense Department uh, or the State Department, were all putting their thumb on the scale. Uh, wait, and wait, not I'm only sorry, that, sorry, but, Bob, but, but no, I give you a chance to talk. Uh, I'm so. This is, but you're, you're you'll have every chance to respond. You have right every now. chance That's to ridiculous. respond when you're done. You you have every chance to respond when I'm done. So the point is, in addition to that, we also see major corporations, Amazon being one of them. Uh, that put their thumb on the scale to advocate for the Democratic Party and Joe Biden. Uh, in fact, we see a near monopoly of the control of information online and social media that all went in one direction, favoring proper, favoring pushing the narrative for one side over the other. So it's good to get an agreement from all of you that those sort of things have consequences. So it's interesting that you have a problem with it when it comes to one union vote in one company, but I'm guessing neither of you had a problem with that massive corporate influence controlling the flow of information when it came to the actual biggest election in the history of our country. So the so, problem so rap, with just, rap god Rob over here, rap god uh, Rob over here just fucking rattled off a fuckload of claims about the EPA, the CIA, the FBI, everybody, the aliens, everybody's in on the conspiracy to to make Biden uh, win, right? With no fucking evidence, not a single drop of evidence. So I just find that really, really well, ridiculous. The problem, and, and it's not the, a serious part of this conversation because we have evidence. And you don't. You yeah. Don't additionally, have it's You're it's important to claims. point out that the reason why these claims are kept so deliberately vague is because Trump supporters always have this general idea that the entirety of the media is out to get them. Um, that Ooh. like the whole the government, everything, every institution except for Trump, which is funny because Trump's campaign was actively using his power as the president to influence election results long before the actual votes started being counted. Trump was doing everything in his power to lie and misrepresent as much as possible to try to slant everything in his favor up to the point where the RNC was actually held at the White House using the power of the presidency as a campaign tool for his upcoming term. So, again, like this, this vagueness doesn't fly here. If you could find evidence of like a sustained propaganda disinfo campaign sure. from the Democratic Party, that would go. But you can't because they didn't do it. Okay, sure. Uh, like, for example, I give you off the top of my head. Uh, we had an inspector general that found 17 times the FBI lied or had omissions in order to spy on Trump's campaign illegally. They did so using paid opposition research from Hillary Clinton that used as the central person responsible for that, a known Russian spy that they covered up for. That IG also said that, one, that an FBI lawyer actually changed the results 
results of an email that asked whether or not Carter Page, a campaign associate of Trump, that they used the two hop rule that Bill Benny talks about to spy Are on you, Trump's you're campaign. Still talking whether or not about then why were no charges I, filed? I mean, you asked for specific. You asked Wait, for then why were no charges so filed? Because people they always were. say this. They're like, he was charged. The Democratic he Party charged. did it. Okay, charged. No, so he was. with a conviction? Yeah, they gave him a slap on the wrist, but yes, he was convicted. Okay. This lawyer. On what? Okay. what? And secondly, and, uh, Wait, he was what's convicted the name of, this lawyer? of falsifying evidence. Uh, the lawyer was, let me look it up. Uh, I used to have his name memorized, but. Um, yeah, I, I can't remember. What was the count of the, like, uh, the post-election, um, the post-election cases? Was it like 60 cases? That yeah, it was like 60 or no so. Evidence? Where they kept getting thrown out of court. Yeah. Cases, uh, uh, yeah, and now the primary Trump representative, who, by the way, I re rem remember because I've been in this scene fucking debating you people for a long time. I know that you all were clapping for Sidney Powell back in the day when Sidney Powell wasn't. was now saying that si the Sidney Powell is now standing up here going, oh, it was just joking. It was, it was just a joke. Okay, anyways, uh, Kevin Kleinsmith was the, the name of the lawyer. Kevin Kleinsmith was the name of the lawyer that was charged and pled guilty to falsifying documents. In addition to that, the inspector general said the most shocking thing that he saw was that the actual Russian subsource that made up all of these claims when the fbi finally after getting the warrant to the fisa warrant twice when they finally talked to the primary subsource the primary subsource laughed and was like this was all just jokes over beers i can't believe you're using that to spy on a president of the united states which actually happened about? we saw Ray, well, quick, well, we're, we're like three yeah, conspiracies away from the, the first FBI. conspiracy yeah, yeah. chat chat real quick question for the for the people in chat does anybody know what this guy's fucking talking about right now oh, because no, i feel no, you like don't. We've, we've spun right, off I understand. This weird conspiracy theory nonsense and it doesn't make gotta, any sense i gotta, we I gotta ask Amazon. a question real quick i gotta ask a real quick. Sure, go for it. I'm, I'm sitting here i'm listening to all of y'all talk because again i'm not very i'm not very well versed on the whole unionization thing the only experiences that i have though is when i saw at the hands of the va that were uh, federal protected employees that essentially were protected from being fired from the hospital because they as i just stated and the quality of work was so subpar that there were literally vi veterans like laying on the floors being looked over because according to one actual secretary i spoke with she was only required to make 25 appointments a day and after that she could literally still get paid sit at the desk and do virtually nothing that's what she was required to do and they couldn't touch her they couldn't fire her now i'm not saying unions are inherently bad or inherently good but my question is, how do you curb that lack of, I want to say, ambition, care for their work? Because it did exist. I've been there many times. And that's a sincere problem. And the other thing that I wanted to point out, though, is Vosh's point as far as propaganda. If prop and I'm not saying propaganda doesn't work. I think both sides employ this. I mean, my God, all of the 2020, 2016, there's propaganda left and right. The MSM, um, I can't sit there and say I'm a Trump supporter. I'm not a Trump hater. I'm a constitutionalist. I take it case by case. But I think the generalizations that I've seen almost everyone in this room make so far, I think it's kind of like, it's not really fair because I do, I like Trump over Biden. There are things I don't agree with Trump on, but to be painted as like this one person that's all or nothing or saying like the MSM is out to get me or the government's out to get me, I think there is some validity to that. But also the one thing I'm noticing is that uh, in regards to the whole Trump issue, I feel like we're kind of going off topic on this, but I, I hate to say this, but I think Pence did the right thing. He upheld the Constitution. I even agree with Crenshaw on it. The evidence, I'm still waiting to see it myself. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I'm, ha I'm open to have my mind changed. I, I got to respect the rules. I got to respect the rules. And it's very hard for me to say that because my following, they're going to eat me alive for this. But if I can actually see the evidence, the hardcore evidence, I'll believe it. But in the meantime, Trump took an L. Uh... Damn, uh, how do you even respond to this? Is this just like a massive? Well, you can start by not being so condescending. I'd appreciate. Well, I mean, I don't know. I feel like I Saying, feel like accusing I people off the bat. Whom I, I, I don't really know who you are. Wait, and they call me a me. You know, I was talking. You know. I know you're you're getting. Well, you certainly didn't have a problem it's interrupting very Rob for like the thirty me. seconds. He yeah, but that's talking, because but Rob suddenly when it's you, a whole bunch of lies, and you're just like filling empty space. Listen, it's hard oh, for me to not. Now we're going to start insulting. How this is going to go? Excuse no, I just me. don't appreciate being talked down to like you just did to Rob I'm, and myself. And oh, I, I've been I, respectful. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Let me make a quick apology. It would be a lot easier for me to not talk down to you if either of you knew a single thing about the topic that you came here to argue about. You came here to, to fucking challenge for the belt and you didn't even do the basic homework. Actually, it would have taken no, 10 minutes I, I came to here, about actually, that you I came did. Here as a Dylan favor. should have put the topics out earlier. It's not my fault. I'm sorry. Oh, I came here. Against Dylan. Yeah, blame. blame well, okay, wait, wait, wait. Stop, 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 stop. Hold on. Stop, everyone. Wait, stop, please. Please, 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 please. John Burke, Demon wait, Mama. Wait, wait. Okay. So let, let me be clear. This is breaking news, and everybody was talking about it, so I made it a topic. So 
I don't think people can judge somebody too much for not having all the data on this specific topic. I just do want to, I, I am going to throw myself in there. Okay, wait, I just, wait, I just have to say something. Okay, hold on. So, John Burr, I think your point is well taken that there are instances where unions can protect um, uh, workers from malfeasance or from, Mm -hmm. I think, legitimate penalties uh, uh, to their behavior. I mean, I think one of the easiest examples of this would be police unions. Now, lefties tend to like, you know, they say every union but police unions. And while principally, I understand that there are elements of police unions that are both valued and arguably necessary for the operation of their force. I could imagine, for example, a world where police had no protections whatsoever, and that led to them being excessively cautious, unwilling to respond to calls because they don't want yeah. to be... Yeah, I, I understand that there could be back-end consequences to that. Yeah. I think a lot of lefties are generally critical of police unions because it seems like they have a lot of power to the point where yeah. they they do the boys club in group protection stuff quite a bit. I don't mm-hmm. think that's typical of most union groups. It is possible that elements of this rise up in uh, unions that have a more conventional organizational strategy, like, I don't know, a grocer's union. But generally speaking, at this point in time, while that remains a risk, I feel as though mm-hmm. workers have so little bargaining power that we're like, we're concerned about giving too much power to like the ants beneath our feet almost. Because we know people in corporations get away with an unbelievable amount of stuff with virtually no oversight. And they can get away with mistreating their workers because workers, I mean, they can just leave if they don't like it. The economy's Mm. kind of geared that way. So right now, I think what we should do is we should focus on bolstering unions, workers' rights. And if things dial up too hard in that respect, then we can get a little critical, maybe a little bit more uh, skeptical of the influences these unions are having. I like okay, how you and put that. I, can just, I, and, and, I, I like yeah, how you put that. I'll just that say was, real. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I'll just say real quick, um, like just to finish up in this point where you're talking, I don't want this to all be about the election, but you asked for specific evidence. I gave it. You couldn't handle the evidence of the FBI putting their thumb on the scale. Just saying it's clear that you seem to have a problem with people inside the agencies putting their thumbs on the scale. That happened. Now, on this case specifically with these unions, so just doing some – don't act like we don't know what we're talking about because I don't know the specifics. I'm sure if we start to get into the very specifics of exactly everything that happened in the vote, no one has a total knowledge of it. But I will say this. This was for best – Alabama is where the uh, plant was, where they sought to unionize. I believe there was about 3,000 votes, and they lost two to one. They've rejected the union. Now, I did a little bit of research. Uh, they start out at $15 an hour in this plant. That would make them about making $30,000 a year. If you look at the average annual income in Bessemer, Alabama, it's $16,716. So the members of this workforce in Amazon are making almost double what the average person in Bessemer, Alabama works makes. So there is a significant chance that they said, listen, this is a pretty good job for the area. We think that bringing in a union could actually cause dues and maybe won't help us financially. And it might be more, it might cause people to lose jobs and things like that. So why risk what we see as a good thing right now? I share both the people on the left's like discomfort with what I see as too much corporate control in this country. I do share that, but that doesn't mean that a union is correct in every situation. I'm not opposed to unions as a despite what demon mama said in their uh, opening i'm saying that there could be specific situations i'm for giving people the choice to vote for a union or not i understand that there will be propaganda from the people that own the company to not want a union and i understand that that propaganda can have a serious influence and if they broke the law there's something that should be looked into we'll see if that happens but having said that there are good reasons to reject unions and i could get to some anecdotal stories around here and more stories that we actually have evidence for of terrible unions in the nation if we go that direction Well, the concern that I have about that mainly is that there are unionized uh, warehouses in that area of the country that are making considerably more, $20, $21, $22 an hour. And additionally, one of the big concerns with Amazon workers is not just their wages, it's their rights. Amazon workers tend to get treated pretty poorly. They're cut to the line on incredibly narrow margins with very, very high quotas. They're held to extremely high standards of performance. And if they fail, if they can't keep it up, then they just get dropped. So a union could go a long way towards helping them with that. And we know Amazon has the money to kick towards these workers. Um, It's really just a matter of, do we believe that unions will do what we know they will do? And I think a lot of the workers in Alabama probably don't. I think a lot of people have forgotten how much unions were responsible for the oh, high standards. Oh, of... me. Hmm? Well, no, I'm and, sorry, and... I, I said your name. I just wanted to ask you a question, though. Um, I'm, not, I'm not being condescending. I'm generally curious. You sound very well educated you on this. You can condescend to me. My question is do what? You can condescend to me if you want. I'll allow it. I'll give no, you No, no, no. That's not, that's not my style. Yeah, well, it's not my, my pass for the, for the <laughs> debate. You know? No, it's not my style. No, I'm generally curious, though, because I believe in a free market, and I, I don't believe that we actually have capitalism in America. I'm a capitalist. 
But I don't believe we have capitalism. I believe we have corporatism. I believe we have so much influence and intervention in the hands of the government that is empowering the rich to become even richer. Um, so based upon what you just said, Amazon, with the strict guidelines they have, uh, how they treat their workers, which, again, are protected by, the, by labor laws, um, it, it would concern me that – how do I say this without coming off like a hmm. – Dun, 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 by, dun, empower, dun, dun. by empowering the by empowering the workers, uh, it, it almost sounds again as if it, it's kind of like this idea of. I'm trying to think how to actually explain this. Um, well, uh, while you think on that, uh, I would like to touch on a couple of things. Which is first off, the industry okay. the <laughs> industry stand or the industry average okay. for that type of work in that that uh, in the warehouse for warehouse work is nineteen dollars an hour. So even though the pay at the Amazon warehouse is higher than the the total average of every job in that area. It's not for the industry. It's actually quite a bit lower for the industry. In addition, one of the biggest problems um, with that Amazon workers have had working for Amazon is that they are constantly surveilled. Most of what they have to do, it has to be, they literally have to carry a phone around with them and press every time they complete a job. This is notoriously bad. This is what's led to stuff like the infamous pee bottles and poop bags, which is because they're monitored so tightly that they literally cannot stop to do anything else or else their pay will be docked or they will have a flag go up where they will be hassled by a manager. It's That's really, where the really poo sock came from. Yeah, exactly. Precisely. You're right onto it. And and like the 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 so this is a huge problem. Also, to make a small fact uh, correction to what Rob was saying, um, the initial union push brought in three thousand people who were willing to sign up to organize with the union. That's a lot of people. That's more than the amount of final votes that they got in the end. Now, the initial union push came before uh, three weeks of Amazon propaganda, which, by the way, Amazon was ordered by the government to stop doing because it was so ridiculous. They were having one to two meetings of anti-union propaganda that were mandatory. They were making their employees come into work early to go to these meetings or else you lose your job. Yeah, that's pretty bad. The government already had to intervene here. So they were not just, again, they weren't just putting their hand on the scales. We're talking about just a massive, massive uh, intrusion on workers' rights. And as it turns out, in a lot of places in America, we don't really have great labor laws anymore. So laborers really get the short end of the stick in all this. This is why unions are important. Um, okay. Um and, yeah. And I'll say I would like to see your data on that. Uh, I just admittedly just a quick Google search because it's not something that I'd ever looked into. But the source I found said that the average salary for a warehouse worker is thirty four thousand nine hundred thirty eight dollars. I put that in the chat. That comes down to a little more than sixteen dollars an hour. Now understand that's the average. We're talking about Amazon. The base level entry is fifteen dollars an hour. So I'm guessing at this particular plant, the average is going to be more than fifteen dollars an hour because people that have been there for years probably received raises. So when when it comes to the actual salary, they're making right in line with basically what we would expect warehouse workers to make. And it's particular in a place where the standard, the cost of living is so much lower in a place like Bessemer, Alabama, where they're making twice as much as what the average person there is working. I could see reasonably people saying, Do you we know don't that the risk cost of living is lower? It seems like you're making a lot of assumptions. You assume they're getting raises. You assume their cost of living is lower. But what actually is the cost of living? See, well, I assume – okay, okay all right, real quick, wait, real quick. I, I, would assume that, I would assume mean. the cost of living is lower because – the average salary is so much lower, and there's not people just that are completely destitute in Bessemer, Alabama. It doesn't look like a place where there's just million, uh, hundreds of thousands of people on the street. So if the average salary there is $16,000 and someone's making $34,000, I would say that it's a reasonable suggestion that the cost of living in somewhere like Bessemer is lower than the cost of living in someone like L.A., Chicago, Detroit, or uh, an area like that. Yeah, but you're choosing the a most reasonable extreme option. To we we yeah. also have to keep in mind, unions aren't just a press-button increase wages thing. They're really about democracy. The the ability for workers to even argue or, or or contend or bargain for their salaries. So it could well be that a union could organize there and they could meet with management and they could hammer out something that doesn't necessarily increase the average wage tremendously, but it hammers out more rights or better protections for like overtime work or that sort of thing. It's not just about like, do we give workers more money? It's do we give them the power 
to fight on even footing with the corporations who up until this point just decide their wages. Because that's how it used to be. And back in smaller labor markets, I mean back before the modern capitalist, you know, system that we live in today, back 50, 100, 150 years ago, because populations were lower and because businesses weren't as massive and all expanding, for some people, especially people with a certain set of skills that were useful and not super common, they could actually argue for their wages. God, I remember when I was a kid, my parents said, you know, when you go in there, because I was walking around handing out resumes, you know, when you go in there and they hand you a job application form, you tell them you want, and I think it was like $12 an hour, because that was a lot, you know, back when I was 16 in high school. Um, you say that. But of course, you don't get that. Nobody actually argues for their wages, unless we're talking a lawyer or somebody with a very, very high skill set. We're talking about you go on in there and you take the minimum wage. And that's how it's been for decades for millions of people. And unions are the antidote to that. The ability to actually do what my boomer parents told me I should be able to do. Argue for your wage. Okay, but I don't, and I don't, one, and I don't one, disagree. One more I don't thing disagree. I want to just bring up. Hold on. Just sure. one more thing that, that is off of, off of what you were saying, Rob. Just so you know, uh, I, I just had to do a quick fact check on this. The Bessemer location opened in March of 2020. So, yeah, there's not any workers there that have been working there for years and have gotten pay raises. Um, also, it should be noted for everyone who's watching this, the federal poverty line is at $24,500. So when you hear a term like, oh, $30,000, whoa, that's so much, that is Rob – attempting to sort of play at the your ignorance of the state of american no, it's, poverty it's not it so is, if i can it so if i very can explain, close i make the poverty line. so if i could explain i'll talk a little about my life i make about 15 dollars an hour i make about thirty thousand dollars a year you know what my rent was when i lived here in my little area in clarion county pennsylvania 300 bucks a month right there are mom and pop stores here that if you increase a federal minimum wage to 15 dollars, would literally go out of business because they're literally not making any money they're just making enough to operate and they're paying people like eight nine bucks an hour but people could live off that in this area because things are so much cheaper so i, I understand if you don't live in an area like this why you would I mean, think the cost nice. of living that's is nice universal and it feels nice but listen you, you're you're, you're trying to say like no that. listen but, don't live I'm like just, that. you're just again, pulling what? on an anecdote from your own life Watch, thank that's you for not not interrupting like we could have a discussion thank you for not interrupting every three seconds well, I'm, oh, I'm just, I'm just, yeah, just so, um, too yeah. high for you. So, I'm just yeah. Googling. Anyways, so, uh, Give a second. Right, right. Okay. So anyways, uh, Wait, to, to continue on this. Bessemer's poverty yeah, rate is actually 28.1%. That's insane. Bosh, Sorry. But, okay. So can I have a second here? Okay. So Dean Mama, you wanted to talk after Rob, I assume? Okay. So I wanted Rob, to hear John Burke's to... thing too. I'm sorry. Just because we okay, John, John go before me. He's talked least. So that's cool. Okay. John, were you talking before? Yeah, I just I was so, gonna let them keep going. Okay, John, okay. you go first. Then we'll go to Rob. Then Demon Mama. Sound good? There yeah, you go. absolutely. Uh, just to go back up to what Vosh was saying, um, you talk about negotiating salaries for employees and things such as that. I'm a small business owner myself. Um, when somebody applies for a job, you know, to empower to empower employees to essentially negotiate their salaries. Uh, or to empower them to the ability to do that. I don't think that's just like we set that there and that's just going to be, they have that option. I think naturally they probably would do that. Who wouldn't want to try and negotiate for a higher, a higher salary? Well, who dictates the level of salary? Well, the business owner does essentially, right? I would assume that. Like they have the negotiations based upon like what do we feel is a good compromise in regards to how, what you should be paid. And I know that local economics take a major play into that as far as pay based upon where you live. But I think the biggest contributing factor is your your set of skills, your whether they be entry level or you be experienced, what kind of education do you have that actually supports the job that you're going to do and what you bring to the table. So as a business owner myself, I don't play my I don't pay my employees <clears throat> excuse me, minimum wage. I actually invest in them. But I invest in them because I I think a lot of people don't seem to realize that if you lose an employee, I put a lot of money into training that employee. If I lose that employee, number one, I'm taking a hit financially. I'm gonna take a hit in my business because I don't I can't afford that. But number two, it, it doesn't sit with well with me to have the employees essentially leverage something over the business owner's head saying that if we don't get what we want, then essentially what, we unionize? I mean, I support that. I think that's a sense. That's also part of free market right there. Um, so I think, I mean, I kind of see what y'all are saying. I agree in some states, I, I agree. In some cases, others, I don't. But it does. It, it's very concerning to have this idea that uh, employees should be empowered to leverage things against the business um, or the business owner, rather. Now, you said corporation, so maybe that's what you're referring to instead. So I'm just trying to be clear on that one. Are we talking about like small business? Or are we talking about large-scale corporation so, businesses? Uh, it's just the problem to me is that essentially you're fighting to maintain a system where you're the only one who has the ability to dictate the wages of your employees. I mean, ultimately, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you do make that decision. You pay the wages. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can't yeah. write your checks for you. But I think that yeah. it's fair for them to at least have an input. 
So when it comes to small businesses, yeah, sure, yeah. I think the best kind of union isn't like a workplace union, but it's, um, God, I'm forgetting the term. It's when you unionize everyone of a, a specific field in a given area. Trade so, union. Yeah. So like a city will have like, this is the grocers union, you know, or city will have, this is the X, the Y union, sectional union, sectoral bargaining. Yeah. For the whole sector. Now, if it's mm -hmm. true that you pay uh, your workers more than minimum, I'm sure you do. And it seems mm -hmm. like then you take good care of your workers and they engaged, they joined a sectoral union. Uh, mm -hmm. In all likelihood, the beefs those unions would cultivate wouldn't be with you. They'd be with the shitty business owners who do mm -hmm. everything they can to skin flint the people who work for them. Um, and I th and but I think that's a good system that, too. Hmm? And because that's the but could you guarantee that though? It's that's, not that's possible. That's the thing that concerns me. Though. It's not possible to guarantee that, but I can guarantee that a lack of unions has led to a lot of workers getting exploited and a significant decrease in the average wages of the American middle class. So I can't guarantee there won't ever be issues with solution A, but I know there are big ones with solution B. And we've seen 50 years ago what the system used to look like with widespread unionization, and it seems like it was fairer. And it's not like people were getting thrown out of business back then either. The business owners were doing well too. It's just a matter of how well do you distribute those funds? How amicably do you? But I think that in the case of a sectoral union, I imagine you would be almost unaffected. It would be about the less fortunate people who work at small businesses similar to yours who maybe aren't getting such a fair deal on their wages. Well, then let's let's take, for example, a startup business. I'm sorry. I mean, I just I really enjoy right. this. So say like Rob wants to start a grossing business, say, for example, he wants to start his own little grocery store. And they created that type of union previously discussed. And he said, well, all I can afford to pay my employees right now is the minimum wage. Anything above that, I'm not gonna be able to expand. I don't have the startup capital to support that. That union comes in. They say, this is what you have to do. Therefore, what is Rob left to do? Um, I think. And, in... that's how, and if I oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Sure. No, well, you're I mean, I want your perspective yeah. on that, too. So I, and Posh, I don't disagree with anything you're saying. Let me be quite clear, and I think John agrees with me. No one here, I think, saying unions are a bad idea. We're saying that they they shouldn't be forced. I think I, hopefully we all agree with that. Uh, yeah. So they shouldn't be forced, but certainly you should have the option. And again, if Amazon did something illegal, we will see. I'm assuming it's going to be investigated. They should be punished if they did something illegal. I have no qualms with that. I have no love for Amazon. Don't get me wrong. And I certainly think that it, corporations are exploiting workers. So I don't have a problem. My point is, though, that unions aren't always a panacea. Uh, so in this circumstance with the hypothetical, I could tell you that in the town of Clarion, uh, there was a, where I kind of have lived around my whole life, there was a uh, company that my father worked for that made windows and they decided to unionize and uh, at first the union actually did a lot of good things not really with wages like you're saying Bosch but with kind of uh, you know um, paid leave time working conditions and things like that the problem was the union bosses that came in started to not really represent the will of the people that worked there and so they started pushing for a bunch of stuff that the people were like eh so what ended up happening was they pushed for increased wages by about four dollars per hour and uh, uh, basically, the company ownership sat down with these union bosses for like a month, and when there wasn't much budge on it, they came into work one Tuesday and said, the company's shutting down Thursday, pack your stuff up. So my dad worked there for about 16, 17 years. There were people that had worked there for 30 plus years, and it was just like, now I understand what you're saying. Well, that's one crappy company, or it's just one situation. I get that. I don't think that impugns all unions. I'm just saying that there are particular places where it could be more beneficial than others. And the other thing I'll say is, it's not a panacea like you're saying, Bosch, even if it would be a good idea to union there's so many things that have occurred over the past 50 years that aren't just the decline in unions that have led to workers being screwed over in this country, such as free trade deals and the outsourcing of labor to China. Even if you like, there's a possibility and, and there's many more we could talk about, but I don't want to go on all day. And this one's very important because what could happen is if enough people unionize for Amazon in the United States, Amazon could just be like, well, okay, we'll take our business elsewhere. We'll go to a place where we could pay people less. And so now you're in a difficult position because of all these outside things like uh, free trade deals that have shipped labor overseas, uh, bringing in like cheap workforce in the form of immigration and things like that. Now the bargaining power of labor is decreased. And so now someone in Bessemer, Alabama has to think, look, the union sounds like a good idea, but I'm making a job that's double the normal rate of people that live in this area. And all in all, things are okay. So I don't know if I want to risk it given what I've seen all over the place. And was it Amazon? Am I wrong that was going to put a shop in? There was this famous story about AOC complaining about her district. Wasn't that Amazon? And Amazon just packed up and was like, fine, we won't come to your district. 
So those things happen. And I'm not saying that means Amazon's a good company or that's a reason to reject unions. But this is something that's in the mind of someone as they're voting whether or not I, to accept the union, right? I want to make sure that, that Demon Mama does get to talk here because they I want to respond to one they, last thing yeah, and then I'll just, uh, you respond then Demon Mama. Right, then I'll then I'll keep my hands off. So <clears throat> there's there's a lot there. So broadly, one of the problems we have with small businesses today and with unions today is that so much wealth has been siphoned off into gigantic mega corporations that it's mm -hmm. really difficult to engage in the production of startup businesses because the capital isn't there, rents are extremely high, and people don't want to pay reasonable prices for commodities that you could sell at a mom and pop shop. Everyone wants to go to Walmart and get it for two thirds that price because it was made yep. with plastic injectors over in China yep. by basically slaves <clears throat> and then shipped on over here through the Suez Canal. So we, the problem that we have is that the fact that unions can hurt small businesses is a product of a lot of downstream economic consequences that we're facing, not just as a product of globalization, but also business practices that defer to these megacorps. So one of the issues is technically outsourcing should be good for everyone in this country. It means there's more money in this country. If you're outsourcing, that means that you're engaging in... Um, in a, uh, I forget the term, but when you're specializing, they do this thing better or cheaper, we benefit from it, we take the wealth. That should make everyone hell wealthier because the systems that we've set up in this country should allow that wealth to be distributed, but they haven't been. More money gets stored in offshore Cayman Island accounts, which means the average worker doesn't have as much money to spend. Comparative advantage, thank you, Chet, that's what it's called, comparative advantage. The average worker doesn't have as much money to spend, which means that they're more likely to be forced into buying from the megacorps and not from small businesses, which also leads to a ton of other problems, like every neighborhood looking the same because all the mom and pops close and everyone just goes to the local target. And th there are a lot of problems here. I mean, maybe you call it corporatism. I think this is an inevitable consequence of capitalism because this is benefiting the people with capital, the people with power. But if we both agree that's a bad thing, I think that unions are a part of the solution to that problem because workers that demand things have power over megacorps too, like Amazon. And if they have power over megacorps, they have a little bit of political maneuverability, maybe something to allow companies like Amazon to start paying their fair share, both to workers and to the government. It keeps wealth in this country, which means that there's more wealth being spent by workers, which means people can go back to shopping at small businesses. We had an equilibrium. Within the system of capitalism, we had an equilibrium. It was strong unions. It was... Um, uh, economic systems which circulated wealth around the country, and that worked, at least for a time. We've thrown the equilibrium off, and unions, I don't think, are the thing to blame there. It's a combination of outsourcing and the government's unwillingness to do anything about the unchecked power of these megacorps. But if we fix that, and I think unions are a part of fixing that, I think we can benefit everyone, and even small business owners will be making more money. That's my belief. And I'll, I'll, I'll obsede my time, by the way, because I've talked way too much, sorry. Uh, yeah, so there's a couple of things I wanted to touch on here. The first off is something that we've kind of been ignoring for the last few minutes, um, which is that Amazon can't outsource. Amazon has to deliver to the people who are buying here. So there is no option for them to outsource. They have to get local workers. I mean, unless they're going to find a way to pass through um, mass drone laws, which so far have been shot down pretty extensively. Um, that's just not true. They need local workers in order to make, in fact, the hardest challenge for Amazon is what's it called? I think it's called the last mile. Um, the last one mile is the hardest part of Amazon delivery. And that's where they work people and exploit people the hardest. Now, there's a couple of other um, things that, compound with this one of them being that uh amazon is uh increasingly uh eating up a chunk of of commerce in the united states these giant giant corporations they're the ones that we're mostly talking about with unionizing see unions have a vested interest in the businesses that they're a part of succeeding otherwise they don't have jobs and then the union disappears so now while there might be some unions that overplay their hand or that fuck up and that ruin the business that they're a part of a smart union, which is going to be a lot of unions or a functional union, is going to be hoping that the business succeeds, but that they're getting their just pay. So when we're talking about that, you don't have to worry too much about small businesses because small businesses don't really need a union in order to be able to bargain. If you only have five employees, it's very easy for five employees to say, we're not coming to work unless you pay us more. It's companies specifically like Walmart, Amazon, Best Buy, whatever else you want to think of, that we need unions there. And we don't, and because of propaganda, because of constant anti union thought, because of constant uh, union busting and deregulation, I'm we muted. don't have. How are we those doing, unions, chat? I love you. Which means we have a massive, massive 
uh, workforce of exploited delivery people all over Amer all over America, which is allowing Amazon to kill every other business type, by the way. For those of you who don't know, Jeff Bezos has been very explicit about what his goal with Amazon was. His goal with Amazon was to get it bankrolled by investments so that they could run the company at a loss for as long as possible and put out every other competitor out of business, and then they can jack their prices up. That's what Amazon is doing. Amazon wants Amazon to be the only place you can buy anything in America. And guess what? If that ever happens and there's no unions, America is going to become an Amazon dystopia overnight. And I bet that we'd only see a few months until we started seeing Amazon uh, company towns and Amazon bucks being paid for wages. And that's not the type of future that I'd like. OK, you know? but but just to be clear here, right, like I don't think that the unionization, if Amazon's that nefarious and I'm not disagreeing that they are, I don't think that unionizing would be a correct fix all that would solve all this. And I think, look, let's be clear. I think all four of us are talking that unions could be good and that they definitely should be allowed to have the option to unionize uh, that could exist either in a socialist or a capitalist system. I think we're all agreeing to that. So to me, the more nuance is, one, do we have proof that it was through subterfuge or through some sort of nefarious means that yes. the these people chose i don't think that that proof exists i think we'll see what well, we the already of an investigation you mentioned said. earlier like, that there was like no there already is evidence this is the thing now we can't we can't say that the entire thing that the entire uh vote which is, is exactly my point well i mean yeah, yeah you can't throw it out entirely but the fact it is a fact that amazon has already been in trouble in this specific incident okay. for so taking any, illegal actions they've already so, had to be censured by the state they are all right so, so every again throat that so, they can. okay so uh, again we don't have proof we'll see what the results of a lawsuit are and we'll see we what have it proof says. of that first um, one, yes. no, uh, we don't have proof we have evidence but we don't have proof that that was what no, tilted no, the, the vote to the go the way it did That's the government did okay have to step so in, anyways so. Uh, anyways uh so just just going on from there so i think that the actual more interesting conversation because there's a lot of agreement here is uh one what system's more responsible for this type of thing sort of uh, more left-wing politicians or right-wing politicians and secondly are are, like, would we, and I, I'm, I'm just going to throw this out there based on a conversation we had the other day, Demon Mama, and I'll just ask this real quick to, to everyone. Would you force unions? Like through, force? like through government force? Would you, would, do you think every company should have a union through government force? No. Okay. No. I, I, I just want I mean, I don't, I don't even know how that would work. Uh, like, I think. Well, right. That, I think that well, we, we talked about the other day them. about wanting to say probably the same way around workers. like insurance. I we want it about, like in an ideal in an ideal uh, world working towards like uh, co-ops. I think that would be great. But that's a much longer term goal than what okay, we're talking about fine. here. Right we now, don't we're have just to talking about how to like say how to like save the american worker from just okay. the absolute atrocious conditions that they're in right now okay so i agree that the american workers in terrible conditions i don't think that we that the main focus needs to be unions though certainly that could be part of the solution however like i think you could see things and i think it's particularly by giving the government more power which is encouraged lobbying which has allowed companies like amazon because they get you say lack of regulations the exact opposite is actually true because we give the government the power to intervene in these businesses it allows people to lobby it allows Amazon to lobby the government and then get laws that are favorable. No, the no, best no, no, example no, no. I could give is, like, like, why, true, why do you constantly interrupt? Please let no, me finish because you, 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 you have the you opportunity make, wait, wait, to Wait, hold on a second. I want to explain You say things all the time I disagree with, and you say things all the time I disagree with, and I don't wait, interrupt. Wait, okay. Rob, uh, can you spend uh, 25 seconds finishing yeah, your thing? And the then we'll best, go for 30 seconds for Dean Mama. There we go. Yeah. The best example I could give is the stimulus bills that we saw posted that actually were a huge boon to Amazon and Walmart. It was one of the biggest transfers of wealth from small businesses and workers to large corporations that this country's ever seen. And that was interventionist left wing policies. Even the government, the Republicans signed on. They deserve fault for this as well. Trillions of dollars that's going to cause inflation and went primarily to corporate America off the back of small businesses and working class America. Okay, Dean Mama, and then I'm going to ask a question for the room because uh, since nobody represents the position, I'm going to see if people can engage with it. Dean Mama, uh, sure. So, um, God, there was a lot of claims there. Uh, the first off uh, that I would um, contest is that the idea that we we don't have evidence that unions would be a good answer. Actually, we do. We have not only history, but we also have data on our side. Unions were responsible for a massive, massive, revolutionary change in American work conditions around the turn of the century. And also, we've seen that unionized workplaces have safer work conditions, better pay, and higher job satisfaction. The only reason that people fight against unions is because 
corporations make the most money out of it. Now, I also disagree very strongly with this idea that like uh, it's government intervention that made lobbying happen. No, it wasn't. It was Citizens United that allowed corporations to give endlessly to super PACs that has allowed for corporate lobbying to get out of control in this country. The corporate lobbying is out of control, and that's a result of deregulation. That's a result of, make, of the government saying, nah, actually, we're not going to really look into this anymore. So yeah, that's just factually false. And, and I, I, it really frustrates me, too. Also, Trump's stimulus plan, which transferred a lot of money to yes, a lot of corporations, also, if I remember correctly, I believe we went over this data in the last conversation that we had on this, actually, if I remember correctly, still gave uh, something like 60% of it to smaller businesses. So I do agree that there was a lot of problems with the way that Trump approached it. He gave out a lot of handouts to a lot of friends and allies, um, political allies and whatnot through his stimulus package. But I just think that that's a problem of Trump and the Republican Party being um, horribly incompetent and greedy. Okay, quickly, I wanted to ask a question. So since nobody, uh, Vosh, um, is it- I have one quick thing to say, very quick. Uh, this is a bit of a side argument there, but it just occurred to me um, that if you had stronger unions, you could rely on those unions to protect workers and wouldn't have to rely so much on government intervention. One of the reasons why the government seems to keep meddling in the affairs of corporations and their workers is because there isn't really an alternative. But if no, hold on, I gotta are... disagree with you there, Vosh. I'm sorry to cut you off, but wouldn't you just be replacing one overlord for another? Well, I would rather, if I had anybody advocating for the rights of workers, I would rather it be the workers themselves than a bunch of Washington bureaucrats. I mean, they, the unions aren't overlords, the union they're leads, bargaining. The un... I mean, union leads are voted on by you the see, people who are part of the no, union. No, no, I, I, yeah, I agree with you there, but I feel like the human conditions being ignored here in regards to like absolute power and you know by the people for the people. I get what you're saying there. Like, who better to represent? But, unions, but the same thing could be said about electing uh, a congressman to represent you in Washington, where the case may be that comes from your district or somebody from your workforces, which I imagine. But when we're playing, talking but... about the needs of a worker in mm -hmm. a given workplace, I would much yeah. rather have a person yeah. who works there who's been elected as the head of a union managing right. and resolving the disputes between workers and the corporation than like right. government lawmakers who do these massive and wide swaths with uh, oh, essentially no right. larger oversight. Sometimes they know what they're talking about, sometimes they don't. I think it'd be better for everybody, frankly, if these discussions were kept more local, more intimate, and more direct between the workers and the corporations than like every right. couple of years we have some bombshell revelation where the government does X or Y, right. you know? But you see, but you know, I agree with you there. I agree with you in that point because that's why you also like I'm I'm more state versus federal. And that is, but the point that I'm trying to make though is if there was a union to form wherever I'm at, where I'm working, yeah, I would definitely want the representative to come from me, from the foot, foot soldier, if you will, the, the, the factory worker. But the human condition still exists in regards to as they elevate. So if, if I'm an elected union representative, am I still a worker or is that my full time job now? That's all I do is that. Or do I remain a foot soldier? Depends on the union. I mean, if it's a big enough union, it'll be a full-time job. But for a smaller corporation, it could be. I mean, your argument against uh, like overlords ruling over people is the reason why we need some check for corporations. You get it from Washington or from the workers who you hire, but it has to come from somewhere. Uh, that's okay. that's all Quickly. I'll say. I wanted to. I wanted to be. I'll be the bad guy quick, since nobody wants to be the bad guy. So suppose like all these you're doing everything to help these small businesses but if these larger corporations can give people like cheaper products better pay and health benefits comparative to these smaller mom and pop shops why should the state be stepping in or anyone stepping in to help these small mom and pop shops when the workers are getting better conditions and better help from bigger corporations why would anybody who cares about workers jump at the bit to help these small mom and pop shops when I can get a better job at Walmart. Uh, you should I can be explain it. Uh, yeah, if you'd, if you'd like, uh, I mean, why, why would you uh, light a fire in your house to keep you warm in the winter when you could just set off an explosion instead? Uh, the, the short term is fantastic for corporations like this. They can send out all kinds of cheap products all over the place, but they can't last. We know that their plan in the long run, they've been very open about this, is to essentially be able to raise prices back to what they were those benefits will disappear they are gaming the system using massive amounts of venture capital massive amounts of wall street investments in order to essentially uh, screw over an entire country in the name of their own personal profit and if 
you know, if we, we should hope for a wise government that can see forward into the future should recognize that this isn't sustainable, that this is ultimately only going to serve the interests of the owners of Amazon, the owners of Walmart, the owners of these other big corporations, and won't actually build a sustainable system for us. You don't want just a, a lighting a cup of gasoline on fire and it makes your house really warm for 10 seconds. You want to be able to stay warm all winter. We want our country to be able to sustain itself into the future with good jobs. And sometimes that might mean we have to challenge some of these really, really nice short-term benefits like Amazon selling all of their products at a massive loss so that they can get cheap products in the short term but can ultimately screw over American workers in the quick, long term. Question. Okay, so uh, um, if, quick, quick, quick follow-up question for Demon Mom if I could. Okay, but mom and pop shops are a sustainable model comparative to what Walmart, who's been a staple of American commerce for a very long time, providing better jobs than mom and pop shops for what a good 30, 40 years now, comparatively. Uh, when is the when is the moment that, that they're going to undercut and do be providing worse jobs than I would have gotten at a random corner show uh, store owned by I don't know? Uh, We're Jones already Earth. seeing that. We're already seeing that. We've already seen that happen. In fact, um, Amazon prices have gone up. I, 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 I don't have the study on hand, but it, it's very easy to locate if you want to look into it how much Amazon prices have actually changed um, over time. In addition, uh, if we're going to expand this out from just Amazon into talking about stuff like Walmart, well, Walmart has a tendency to create food deserts completely unintentionally because they will put their Walmarts in locations that are not to serve any need, but to serve their maximum profit, even if that means that local people have to drive. Now, that's not saying that 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 mom and pops are going to be the only thing that ever opens, but sustainable businesses that can last in a long time by their foundation are better than companies like Amazon that can offer in the short term, uh, maybe 30 years or so, um, uh, to offer lower prices or whatever, as they slowly gut out town by town and and ruin the the local um, environment as well as as well as the uh, the local work uh, environment as well. Um, you know, um, okay. this, that's the uh, problem. Yeah, yeah, and I, I problem. just yeah, just to kind of so so like part of the problem is government intervention in many ways actually causes the problem, and then we say, well, now we need the government to intervene to solve the problem. That's not to say there's never a place for government regulation, but oftentimes we can see unintended consequences. So for example, uh, we had, uh, before COVID, we had a very low, almost historic low unemployment rate. Well, this is good because it means more bargaining power for people that are looking for labor, that are looking for jobs. But after, uh, then we say, well, we need to import a bunch of people. We need to, um, you know, shut down things have you know and they ended up resulting in companies like walmart and stuff doing awesome uh while well, small businesses did poor uh to answer demon mama's claim that the stimulus went to small businesses the net effect of the policies that we saw over the past year and this is under trump as well don't get me wrong in fact the bulk of it was under trump the net effect of those policies was to greatly enhance the wealth of companies like amazon and walmart the very companies that you're suggesting that we shouldn't do many of those policies were endorsed by people on the left whether it be the lockdowns the stimulus etc so another thing that you could see is like minimum wage laws. Like I say this all the time. We have a mom and pop grocery store in my town. People do have a sort of civic sense where they were like, hey, instead of going to the Dollar General, we're going to go to the mom and pop store because we'd rather pay a couple extra nickels to give them the business. Problem is COVID shut them down. Uh, the lockdown shut them down. Dollar General's doing just fine and will be able to raise their prices. But even aside from that, a federal minimum wage increase would have also shut them down. Now, Dollar General would be more than happy to pay the increased minimum wage. They'll just pass the price off to the customer and they'll cut people's hours but they've just lost their only competitor in a 15 mile radius wait so they're happy they could they could raise their price so we see things like this all the time which is these disastrous interventionist policies that are actually harming the power the collecting the bargaining of labor and then you know again i'm not saying that unions can't be a good thing but if we're talking specifically about policies to benefit small businesses a lot of the problem is the fact that our government has so much power to pick winners and losers and that because of their intervention and how there's lobbying that's able to then influence so, uh, just uh, just wait wait much? just one uh, there's just one major problem with that and it's that been talking a little bit we we know trump mishandled the lockdown so i'm not going to dispute your point on that but with regards to what you're describing you're describing capitalism the economy of scale ensures that larger megacorps will always be more economically efficient than mom and pop businesses and therefore will always be able to flex their weight around more. It's only government intervention that's kept this problem from cropping up sooner. Anti-monopoly laws, antitrust laws, uh, the fact that it's illegal to, um, uh, to engage in certain forms of pricing out your competitors. What you're describing right now is capitalism. Without the government, this would have happened way, way, way faster. If you want to fix this- But those companies have scaled to that level without capitalism? 
Well, no, I'm, well, capitalism is what allowed them to scale to that. Well, oh, are you saying industry can or cannot thrive with or without it? I think industry can mm -hmm. do just fine with collective ownership. But now, mm -hmm. wh whatever the reason we're, why we're here, this is the inevitable consequence of the economic system we live in. The solution to it seems simple enough to me. We need to make sure that people who work at big businesses and small businesses alike um, get uh, the equitable treatment, and then we need to make sure that we can afford tax breaks and other kinds of preferable treatment to smaller corporations. There are benefits to smaller corporations uh, or, or, or mom and pop stores. I don't want to walk down Main Street of my town and see nothing but chain restaurants. I want to be able to see the unique and vibrant local culture that I moved to this city for. And as long as megacorps keep swooping up all of the real estate, that ain't gonna happen. So we give preferential tax treatment to small businesses to make sure that they can fight on a level playing field. There are plenty of things that we can do, plenty of ways we can legislate to make sure these businesses continue to exist. And hey, if they're a little bit less economically efficient, if it means the government has to spend a little bit of our tax money, I say that's worthwhile. Because I would rather have a 0.2% hike in my taxes than live in a country without any local culture. And a country where entrepreneurship is dead, because the only way to start businesses is to be born a trust fund baby and spend the 1.2 million your daddy left you on a new yachting business, you know? I want to preserve those elements of what people, I guess, call the American dream. So I'm okay letting the government be the ones to ensure small businesses can maintain some degree of relevance. So can I try and understand what you're, what you're saying here, Voss? Because um, I think I actually sure, agree with you. But after, after okay. this interaction, I do think we should move on to the next topic of the night. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I, yeah hit me for I sure. Just wanna, sure. Yeah, I want to make sure that I'm understanding you correctly. So basically, you're, you're in favor of government interventionism as long as it's not favoring large-scale corporations from coming in and actually forming monopolies, kind of like AT&T did back in the 80s. So you're incentivizing local mom-and-pop businesses to receive tax breaks, uh, favoritism over large-scale corp. Is that, is that what I'm getting from this? Yeah, essentially. There are significant okay. benefits to small businesses that don't necessarily play out in the GDP. But I think those okay. benefits should still be recognized. Okay. Well, just wanted to make sure I understood them. Are we going to do final thoughts? Or? Oh, yeah, I don't know. Basically, yeah, that, that, oh, that's what we're doing. We're doing final I'm good to wrap up if, um, if it's so yeah. decided. Yeah, so each on. people, like, just one minute. So we'll start with the Imamama. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I contest the idea that uh, on it like just just outright that government intervention um is is like a bad thing um i i don't think that we have any evidence of that in fact uh i i would argue that it is a lack of government intervention in the uh pandemic that led to us having this terrible like the worst of both world situations because uh the government was so hands off the 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 virus got out of control we have over 600,000 dead americans um and we also because there was no support for small businesses have the only people remaining are large corporations i know i've seen this with my own eyes in my own town that i live in nearly every local uh, uh restaurant is out of business now and the only thing left is mcdonald's that sucks that is a result of incompetent and incomplete government intervention not government intervention alone um and i think that's important to distinguish and also i will remind everyone that we were talking about um unions which i think that unions are a much 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 better way of of like vosh said earlier uh preventing the government from ever having to get involved because if people can self-determine in their business and bargain against their boss who they produce labor they produce products and labor for uh that solves the problem before it ever even becomes a problem so uh support unions unions are really important and uh, unions have all but disappeared in america we need them back or else we're going to be facing a amazon owned dystopia yeah so that's my feelings on this issue okay next is going to be vosh oh uh, yeah i think i've expressed my point more or less uh, there are a lot of people who think this is adversarial but unless we're unless we're looking out for the literal 0.001 percent i mean <laughs> unless we're out here boxing for bezos I think that there are economic solutions to these problems that benefit basically everyone on the supply chain. Domestically, locally, workers, union workers, managers, everyone. I mean, it's not to say managers at these Amazon union warehouse or non-unionized warehouses. It's not like they're always doing great either. I know how tough managerial work can be. It's work. And I know that often you're placed under quotas just as stressful as the people below you by the people above you. And the reason these managers are so hard on the people below them is because they know that if they're not, they'll get booted and replaced with a person who will be harder on them. So I don't think this doesn't need to be an adversarial relationship. There's only one group of people who would really hurt from unions. And those are the people who own those Cayman Island, you know, bank accounts. 
aside them, and I think they're doing just fine without us helping them, everyone can benefit with a little bit of wealth redistribution that I think unions could facilitate democratically and fairly. Rob North? So uh, I think basically everyone's agreeing on the substantive issue of whether or not unions could be successful. The disagreements, the scale of exactly would they be able to solve all these problems, I don't think that's the case. Though I have no problem with people getting out and talking about like if Demon Mama and Vosh and even me would talk about collective bargaining and helping certain businesses out. I don't have a problem with that, with educating people that that could be better. I do have a problem with any sort of policy or government force of trying to make that occur, which it seems like no one's advocating anyways. When it comes to the issue of what happened under the law, uh, under the government intervention regard to COVID. No, the government intervention was specifically designed to help these large businesses. Uh, oftentimes you could see large groups of people at Home Depot, Walmart, other places, but the mom and pop local hardware stores and places were closed down yeah, because they couldn't meet the get regulations. Uh, we'll talk about COVID at another time, but there's no evidence whatsoever that any of these lockdowns were necessary, were effective at causing any sort of uh, help whatsoever, or that having a larger lockdown would have been something that would have been beneficial. But the point is just this, what the government intervening and a lot of the policies we see, particularly coming from the left actually harm workers as well, such as the importing of people, minimum wage laws, which hurt small businesses. Uh, oh, but free trade bills like NAFTA and the TPP that were pushed that would have hurt small businesses. All of these things are terrible. And also businesses don't have to outsource overseas. Like we saw with the AOC situation with Amazon, they could outsource to a different city. And lastly, I just want to say when it comes to the question was, why did these specific people vote in a way? Uh, I'm not saying that it couldn't have been untoward pressure from Amazon. But if you look at the average salary and how much they're making, uh, there is credible evidence that people could have made a compelling argument that would have been a risk that possibly that company would have moved and so they decided because they were making almost twice as much as what the average person does in that area they decided that it would be beneficial for them regardless if you think it's true or not but they made that decision not because they were coerced because they actually believe that it could be possible uh, either way john burke uh okay yeah there was a lot to unpack there so the first point that was made in, in regards to that there was no government interventionism in regard to the lockdown which led that's actually not true whatsoever there was massive evidence to show that whether it be a federal or state level within month six there was over 100,000 small businesses that went bankrupt to the hands of the government in their lockdown so it makes no sense logistically how demon mama can sit there and say that there was no government and yes there was there 100 percent was and there shouldn't have been a lockdown I'm, I'm i'm totally against that and you can you can make the face of your tv and Hide your crowd up, that's fine. I haven't done that to you, but if that's how you get your people off, go for it. If you want to sit there and say that there was no government interest, then why are, where are those businesses now? Where are those businesses now? That's the problem. Um, so the other point that I want to make in regards to this, as far as like the unionization is uh, leave it up to the people. Leave it up to the local demographic if they want to have a union. I agree. I, Vosh makes some solid points. I get as far as like looking out for the small workers, making sure they get a fair day's wage. I understand that. Also, they're taken care of, not mistreated. So I think, um, yeah. I like the idea of no government interventionism and uh, allowing the people to vote using a democracy or a democratic process to see if they want to establish a union. But uh, I, I do like the idea of favoring small businesses in a sense to encourage the small or the entrepreneurship mindset to, to flourish. And Vosh is right on that. There's like certain areas that unless you have a, a tremendous amount of startup capital, good luck. Good luck. I had to deal with that myself personally. It was very difficult. Um, and yeah, that, that's, I mean, I, again, I'm, I'm open to learning a lot about this, but uh, ultimately I think my feel for is I just don't like a lot of government regulation in the sense of telling me what I can and cannot do, uh, because I think it's in the best interest of myself as a business owner and my employees to see everybody flourish, like rising tides raises all ships. So, but I think there are counter arguments to go against that that doesn't make sense in regards to why well, you do have a lot of corporate greed and things such as that. So it's, I don't think it's so simplistic to say yes or no. There's a lot of things to unpack there, so. Okay. Next, uh, we're going to go into the next topic, which this one is a little bit more broad, so it allow for more wiggle room. Uh, so if you don't know a ton about one certain area, you'll be able to uh, use this to wiggle around a little bit. Um, do you think that a cultural shift to the left in the United States would be beneficial for America? Broad, but simple question. Yeah, I'll take it. Throw it over to Bosch. Since you're champion, you know what? I'll throw it to you first. I'm bringing the game from the start. You started off. Yeah, I know. A bit of a contentious take. I know nobody expected it from me, um, a socialist. But yeah, I think that'd be kind of cool, personally. I, I have a preference towards that. I think a lot of people, a lot of people on the right especially, have a fear that people on the left just want to flip the perceived imbalances in society. Like, Black Lives Matter types want to make it so black people have power over white people, and, like, women are going to hate men, and, like, so on and so forth. And... 
look, I'll say, especially if you're on Twitter or the internet or whatever, there are a lot of people who may give that impression. But when we look systemically at what is trying to be done and the power systems that are already in place, I think it's a fairly yeah. unfounded fear. Maybe it crops up time from time. You know, I'm not a big Robin D'Angelo fan myself, but generally, I feel like we could all do for a little bit of intersectional analysis. What's wrong with our country? Who's being hurt and why? What are the power relations between the people here? Who's affected by what? Who here is affected by what, you know? And what can we do about it? And I think if we take that and we have an honest conversation about it, then we can arrive at a lot of really, really positive outcomes that would benefit literally everybody. I mean, nobody would go home losing anything. So I'll stand for that, yeah. Okay, next will be Demon Mama. Yes, we absolutely should have a leftward cultural shift. It would not only be good for our country, it would be good for the entire world. Uh, the right simply at this point in time is holding everyone back. Whether you're a centrist, a liberal, or a leftist like me, you're being held back by the far right in this country. The far right that peddles conspiracy theories, that rides constantly on hate, everything from their obsession currently and this cannot be contested. If you spend just a few minutes looking at the, the most popular right-wing figures online, they're churning out anti-trans content. They're churning out content that cannot be defended against the idea that it's disgustingly racist. It is disgustingly racist. This is a this is a, a, a massive problem, and it's holding us all back. It is we can't even have basic discussions about the future of democracy with people who by and large, literally call Donald Trump their god emperor. So what, if you're out there and you're thinking, well, damn, I don't, I don't want to be too mean to right-wingers. Well, it's not really right-wingers. It's the far right. The far right is like a millstone hanging around the neck of this planet that wants us to go back to some sort of like super, super Christian, uh, anti-degenerate uh, 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 world where where equality is just gone and it doesn't we don't actually have to talk about real issues that matter and i know that not all right wingers way, uh position themselves like that sorry one sec a lot of them do. if you've noticed the difference now i'm handling right this right convo i'm trying to be a little more calm a little more rhetorically effective okay creator. a little bit I less spend, going for I big dunks a little bit more reaching out that okay that's what we're trying to new anti-trans videos making fun of my people for being something that they're not and that's just not acceptable. It's holding back the entire world. We don't even have to touch on economics, although I think we should. But on a social level, we will never have a just world. We will never have a world that can deal with the challenges of things like civil rights and deal with the challenges of things like the environment and climate change and space travel if we can't even get the most basic left-wing reforms in place. I'm, we need a left-wing turn. It's required. We won't be able to go to the future with a millstone hanging around our neck. Okay. Next is going to be John Burke. Oh, man. <laughs> okay, I'll stay on topic. Um, so a little bit about me. I used to be a diehard Republican. I used to, uh, I used to think uh, in a lot of terms that uh, I, I would say Demon Mama actually described. There were some things that she said I agree with, a lot of things she said that I didn't. But I think, yeah, there was a lot of conservatives in the GOP, I think from like the Boomer and a lot of the later Gen X, that embodied uh, the idea of Christian values being forced legislatively upon the people, and I don't agree with that. Um, in regards to America becoming more progressive, here's how I see it. Um, if you're trans, if you're straight, if you're gay, I, I don't care. I think you should be afforded the same human rights as every other American. Um, and in regards to people saying things that, well, you know, I'll, I'll skip that. I'll get to that later. But yeah, to my, my, my overall thing is that live and let live. Everyone should be afforded the same right. I'll even take it a step further when people, uh, you know, I used to be against gay marriage. And then I actually, you know, I had to, I learned a lot. I, I got around a lot of people, had my mind changed a lot. And I started to understand. And I was like, you know what? Um, uh, I don't even think the government should be involved in marriage. I think that's a union between two people that if they want to do it, just get a priest, do your thing. But I know it's, I know it's a little bit more complicated in that regards to taxes and things such as that. But yeah, I think it, there are some good things that have spawned from progressivism. I think there's a lot more um, open-mindedness that is coming, especially from like the millennial generation, because no one expected us to do anything worth a damn. We were the, uh, give everybody a trophy generation. But I think we've seen a lot of progressive thoughts and with that, though, does come the bad. Uh, you know, if we want to say that the alt-right exists, well, absolutely they do exist. And there's a lot of people that are, uh, that do view Trump as God, King, Emperor Trump. That is very concerning. Um, I, I don't see a lot of mainstream figures saying that. Uh, I, if you're taking into account, like, Alex Jones, uh, yeah, that guy's, like, off the rails. Uh, 
But in regards to also, there's people on the far left that are promoting the idea of child drag shows and things such as that. So to demonize one side without showing, and I don't even want to say personal responsibility because no single person in this panel is responsible for an entire group of people. I don't agree with that. I think individuals are responsible for themselves. So to say that they're alt-right is horrible, yeah, I agree. They do try and hold people back. They do want to enforce their religious views on the people. And I think there's people on the left that do fall into moral degeneracy and involving children and things such as that. And it does exist on, on all specters. But um, yeah, I think the country will be better off in, again, in, in some capacity going more progressive. But overall, the case should be do whatever the hell you want. The government should not be intervening. Uh, if a baker doesn't want to bake a cake for a trans couple, he shouldn't be forced to do it. Freedom for all. Next is going to be Rob. Okay, so the problem with this topic is going to be how do we define the left? So in some senses, we do need to go more left in what traditionally were considered left-wing values, such as free speech. Like Berkeley was considered a home of free speech. Now the modern left is anti-free speech. So when they say go more left, they mean more. We should deplatform people. We shouldn't engage with people that disagree with us. We need to censor everyone we disagree with. We need to have cancel culture, et cetera, et cetera. So no, we don't need any more of that. The way the left is considered today, how we understand how it's practiced in the country as we see it today. No, we don't need more of it. And the first thing we have to ask is what direction has the pendulum be swung? Almost every institution in this country has become far, far more left wing. And could you say the country is better now than it was, say, even what we considered on the left 10, 15 years ago? No, I don't think so. Specifically, when the question talks about culture, we could see, for example, academia is a cesspit at this point, And that's because such a radical shift to the left. You don't have to take my word for it. You could take left wing professor Jonathan Haidt, who founded Heterodox Academy, that talks about the indoctrination that comes with the radical shift in extreme left wing politics that's occurred in academia. You could talk to James McWhorter that talks about the toxicity and the new racism is anti-racism, uh, uh, where he talks about the elect, the critical race theory people that want to demonize people based on their skin color and make the world focus victimhood and skin color. Um, we'll talk about the trans issues. That's the next topic, so I probably won't focus on it much here unless it really comes up. But yeah, I think free speech and things like that are important. We've shifted too far radically to the left. It's causing division in this country. The likes we haven't seen for decades, and it's a really bad thing. So instead, what we need is a shift back towards the right culturally, while understanding that what we really need in this country is a balance of ideas from the past and from progressing. Like those things are important. You don't just throw out the entirety of the past. So we'll get into a definition of what we consider left and what parts of the left would be good. But certainly right now, our culture has radically shifted in every institution, including corporate America, that's continuing to exploit people using the ideals of the left and lip service of the left. Uh, that's how bad this shift to the left's become. We now have Nike that's going to criticize the United States or LeBron James that'll criticize the United States while they're dealing with China. We'll move Major League Baseball will move from Georgia over a reasonable law, but they'll still have games in China. And so this is what the left's allowed. Corporate America has totally co-opted this radical shift to the left, and it's leading to a disaster for this country and for workers and other people that we talked about previously. Okay, wait. There was okay, a, a, so uh, the the round is open. You may engage freely. Uh, again, remember the rules. Continue. Yeah, there was a lot there that I take uh, issue with. First of all, muted, we, I, oh, am I mute? Oh, that, yep. I think you are. Sorry, well, I had, I had, uh, you know the safety mute. Can't you know, can't I was, you should just let him keep going. I was for like moving a around. Oh, my, yeah, why didn't you just let me keep going for a couple minutes? Come on, I could have been building to something. Okay, I, I, I take issue to several points there. First and foremost, there's one thing that I don't want to discuss here, and it's corporate performative wokeness, okay? Because that is not the left. So right now, there are more Democrats than Republicans in America, more progressive-minded people, I guess, than the opposite. For that reason, corporations stand to make money off of virtue signaling to that demographic. They have done this for all of the history of businesses. Back in the 1950s yes. and 40s, they were virtue signaling with their like anti-black messaging. No Irish need apply further beyond that. There were businesses which would advertise themselves as being, you know, like back in the abolitionist days, always, always, always. If a business thinks that it can make money by appealing to a certain set of moral sensibilities, it will do so. And right now- Can, I, can I ask a question, real quick question on yeah, that, sure. if you don't mind? Would you say back in the 50s and 60s that one of the solutions was we should have had a shift to the left? Well. I mean, yeah, because the civil rights movement happens. Right, so. and it's going to be worse if the culture has shifted so far to one direction or the other that we'll see that it'll be worse. Why do you think but you're the 60s admitting right were, here that we've already shift shifted left. massively to the left? Right, we've shifted massively to the left. That's why corporations are virtue signaling to Wait, well, wait, hold on. Well, so to well, me, actually, that's Rob, a, so, I got to say, he's saying that they've done this this entire history, like, and I agree with to, to the right, 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 this is, to the right and to the left. To the right and to the left. Yeah. yeah. 
but like to but the, it was virtue signaling for the sake of like racism it's like jim crow era saying hey we don't serve actually, black people and it's like oh yeah i'll shop there but, but they, yeah they've done this forever more. i mean but but this isn't yeah. like the left it's not co-opting the left that process of corporations trying to make money by repping the values of their perceived customer base is as old as commerce itself if i wouldn't the reason have, they're doing it to the left now is because we've had a radical shift well, to the, the left the reason if we, we didn't have that shift corporations wouldn't be virtue well, signaling. Well, hold on the just, society just society has been thing. wait i want to i want to make sure I just want to say society has been moving to the left for hundreds of years. That process has been fairly ongoing. Whether we're talking about the treatment of like non-heterosexual people or non-white people or just basically any minority demographic, society has slowly been getting more progressive. And unfortunately, your concern has been echoed throughout the ages because the stuff you're saying right now is what they said after slavery was abolished. It's what they said after uh, the suffragettes were allowed to vote. It's what they said after the civil rights movement and the gay rights movement in the 1980s. They said it in 2015 after gay marriage was made legal statewide always the criticism is we've gone too far left but now it's time to shift back to the right we're going too far into degeneracy we're going too far into anti-american values well to me i don't really care how far left or right we are i care about addressing the problems we face with solutions that work and right now we have a lot of problems that i think could be fixed by moving further leftward i felt that way about the civil rights movement or i guess i would have if i'd been around back then you know i certainly feel that way about you know the jim crow and slave days it always seems like a shift leftward helps and that the conservatives are the ones clinging on to the dust of history while progressives are the one making the new bold argument that a generation later gets accepted as standard fare so what we need to talk about right now is what are the problems we can face and what can we address them with to me, we got a lot of racism, a lot of sexism, a lot of transphobia. We can address that. We can address it sensibly. Some of these things can be addressed without any government intervention. It's just a cultural shift. And some of it maybe needs a little bit of wealth redistribution. But if we fix these problems once, they're fixed forever. And I think that's something worth investing in. I got to disagree with you and in regards to I don't think that it's going to be fixed forever. I think we're dealing with issues that exist since the dawn of mankind. I think these issues, I think as long as ignorance exists, we will always have these issues. I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. Make it better. But I do want to bring it. Yeah, that I would say, yeah. Okay. We, we right. do our best to make it 100%. But the thing that, that does disturb me in a sense is that I feel like there's a lot of people in regards to cancel culture, the restricting, the restricting rather, of uh, free speech. Uh, Dis disagreeing with people. I know before before we actually started the debates, uh, Demon Mama and Rob were discussing transgenderism and things such as that. And having a simple conversation like that, I think, is exactly what's needed these days. But unfortunately, regardless of what y'all were actually saying, it's like there's a lot of people who don't want to actually have these conversations because it's been classified and labeled that if you disagree with somebody over some one instance, say for, say for example, uh, transgenderism, instinctively people naturally go to transphobic. And phobia, meaning denoting the fear of. There can be actual disagreements with people and regarding what they stand for and say, I disagree with you. Doesn't mean I hate you. Doesn't mean I think you're a bad person. Doesn't mean I think you're a bad human being. I just disagree with you. Well, it's not always I think like that's that what we need to get more back so towards. There's like a lot I'd like to speak on on this, seeing as how this is something I deal with on a daily basis. And in fact, on the last panel I was on on here, I did encounter some pretty explicit transphobia. See, the problem is, it's not that people don't like uh, don't understand or want to understand and want to have a question it's that they never get to that point in the first place and i will give rob a lot of credit for this because rob is one of the on this particular issue that we disagree a lot rob is quite personally very respectful to me and most right-wingers are not that is just a fact i have encountered this so much i engage constantly i have people in my chats constantly and i'm always willing to have a dialogue as long as some basic respect can be established but that basic respect is almost never Never granted. Well, Demon Mama, you've been disrespectful for me since we started. Um, I don't think I've been disrespectful because of your well, identity. I've been I would highly disagree you with you. came in here uh, talking. Rega no, no, no. Regardless of what I disagree with you on, you were disrespectful. Um, it had nothing to do with well, identity. It had everything to do with what the topic we were discussing. You were disrespectful. If so if based upon hurt, what, what you just quoted me. I know you're, you're, you're jumping in. You don't want to have me talk. But if, if your feelings are hurt, I'm very sorry yeah. that your, healing, your feelings were hurt. You see, um, now, you're just being, you know, now you're being so, condescending again. You can see, condescend so to me once, remember. You, you have a pass. Okay, there's, based there's upon three, everything you've just said. One second. One second. There's three people talking at once. And here's the pro tip. I know John must understand this. He's hosted panels. It's crazy. This is magic, actually. When three people talk at once. Yeah. You don't get triple A information, you get none of it. So <laughs> what we're gonna have Wise. is Demon finish their point, then John, then Vosh. Fair? Demon. Yeah. So um yeah, uh we have a lot of ways we have a lot of ways to go. I don't really like the idea that like uh the Civil Rights Act getting basic 
uh, equality for um, black people in America um, should be considered like a far swing to the left and that we need to go back from that? Like what, should we just have some slavery? Like, no, nah, I don't, I think that's a ridiculous false equivalence. Uh, we need to go to the left because the world has been staunchly locked in a far right worldview for most of history and it's sucked for most people. For myself, there's like a couple of things I really wanted to talk on before I yield my time. The first one being that 10 years ago, I couldn't get healthcare because I was trans. That's it. Just because I'm trans, that was that was considered a pre pre existing condition, and I would be ruled out of getting healthcare that I needed. That's pretty discriminatory. That's pretty unfair. I don't have a choice in that. It's just who I am. Next, the other thing that I wanted to bring up is that the right is the king of cancel culture. The religious right has been the main people trying to stop all forms of artistic expression from freaking out about metal, from from trying to frame uh, D and D as like satanic. Little Nas X. Uh, yeah, little Nas X, they're doing it today. It happens all the time. Hell, you could even go so far as to say that the right wing having a collective meltdown, and they did. Every major popular channel on the internet has had a meltdown oh. over Hasbro deciding or Mattel deciding to say that they're, we're going to have it at be Mr. P or Potato Head versus Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head and having a meltdown over, ah, it's wokeness gone too far. It's just they're freaking out. They are the kings of fucking cancel culture. And this has been the case forever. The Hayes Code was predominantly Christian. It was made to appeal to the cr traditional Christian Republican right in America. All of these things have been, for the longest time, the domain of the right wing. And so you get mad that a couple of, of people on Tumblr criticize your shitty Twitter takes. Well, that's not cancel culture. I'm sorry. Now, Mob problem, you know, mob mentality is always going to be a problem no matter what stripe of the of the world you come from. But the idea that the left is the ones doing cancel culture when uh, it's only recently that even Tumblr and the Internet even existed so that people could call you out on your bad takes. That's not cancel culture. You're just getting a little bit of criticism when before you ruled the culture. Okay. That goes out to my John right. Berg, Vosh, and then I see Rob is raising their name. So a hand. So I'm going to write their name down. John. Yeah, absolutely. I highly disagree with saying the right is the king of cancel culture. I'm not going to say the right didn't participate in cancel culture back in the early days of, you know, when Christianity dominated this country. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and, you know, Vosh made a good point as well as talking about that uh, people would virtue signal in regards to being racist and people would favor that. They'd want to shop there. Uh, I'm not going to say that doesn't exist. 100% it did. And that's why I think progressivism has come in and actually done a lot of good in that capacity to where I think more and more conservatives, I'm happy to see this, are starting to understand the importance of the separation of church and state and how your religious values should not be forced on anybody else, especially through the legislative process. And I don't agree with that. I don't agree with you being discriminated against in regards to being transgender and seeking mental health or, excuse me, uh, you said insure a fucking medical health. Excuse me. Uh, no, you shouldn't be discriminated upon that. Again, I think that's like that's not right. But to say that the right is the king of cancer culture, I disagree with that. You had Gina Carano that was just fired from Disney because she made some beep bop boop tweet, and that wasn't even regards to transgenderism, and they jumped on her for it. So to sit there and try to pin this all on the right and act like the left hasn't had like their hand in this pot, I think that's very disingenuous, intellectually dishonest. Yes, they absolutely have. Both sides are guilty of this. They did it with Sean Hannity. When Keurig was going to drop Hannity, the Republicans rallied and said, oh, we're going to throw out our Keurig. It's like, okay, well, you're throwing away a good coffee maker. They already got your money. What sense? So to sit there and say that it's just one side is very unfair and it's very unfair balanced but what i say the right is like probably spawned it yeah to an extent possibly but why are we pointing figures at this point if we all agree that cancel culture is bad pointing fingers at one another isn't going to solve that problem but it Wait. seems like that's what this has turned into is just I mean, a constant no 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 you talked i'm going to speak now so when you sit there and we want a finger point we're not achieving anything john can i ask you a quick question first sure who who the gene is the uh, star wars person right okay mm -hmm. continue sorry i just yeah. want to make sure yeah gina Carano. yeah uh so there's been a lot of that and um if companies want to bend the knee, I'm not against that. Like, I'm not against Disney firing her for it. If that's the route they want to take, I believe it's your right as a business owner. Do what you see fit. I don't agree with it, but it is what it is. But uh, to, to go off the other stuff as far as progressive, I think, there, yeah, there's been a lot of good that's happened as a result. We've seen a lot more push for equal rights and things such as that. Yeah, 100%. But again, I do feel like, and I do agree with Vosh, that... Whether it goes left or right, for me, it's like I just I wish it would favor more individual liberty, which I think encompasses what I want and also what I think Demon Mom wants in regards to you being treated for uh, your, 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 your health. And I think that should be all encompassing, whether it be left or right. I think that's a basic human freedom. So that's just that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, uh, like I, I, I recognize that there are some examples that you could sort I, of... I understand. It's going to be one second. Um, I know it's Vosh and Rob next, but... Uh... A lot of that was directed towards Demon Mama, so I want to make sure they have time to respond. 
of course. Yeah, I, I just have a quick response to this, which is that I recognize that there are some sort of cultural issues that you could probably claim a lot of people got really worked up about. Um, I think maybe you could say even some of that is in the Gina Carano uh, uh, situation. But if you look into the Gina Carano situation, there was it wasn't just one tweet. There were a lot of tweets that made a lot of people feel offended. And she is the she is one of the front running actors in a public television show that's run by a corporation. The corporation made that decision to distance themselves from her. I mean, I to me that's not just that's not really the same thing as me literally not being able to have uh, the right to health care because the laws in the country that are pushed and defended predominantly by the right wing of america right. um yeah like th these are totally different things i get it I it's agree. frustrating when people get mad about products or they get mad about uh about a person that they don't like in their show but this stuff happens all the time by the way like it, it, this this happens even for like non-political issues somebody uh wrestling is a great example of this we all love wrestling here in wrestling there's been a million times where where somebody won a fight and half the fan base thought they didn't deserve to win that fight freaked out and it caused vince mcmahon to do something to make more money you know this happens all the time obviously that is ir irrelevant but when we're talking about the right versus left with regard to cancel culture it was the right that pushed through things like the comics code which outright just outright banned horror comics like that's artistic expression being strongly clamped down it's the right that pushed through uh fucking uh music censorship it, it, it the right has a bad track record on this but who are you convincing though like when you're when you're sitting there saying the right or the left who are you convincing like if you're wanting i think the ultimate goal is that you're wanting to win me over to your side and support your argument correct which i think is the premise of all debate but by you continuously finger pointing it was the left to cancel gina carano but i think both the the the, the points that we're making are 100 percent accurate the cancel culture is cancerous it needs to go away it needs to stop but again the the idea of finger pointing and saying you did this you did that both sides are guilty of this so if you want to continue the Mr. Potato Head, yeah, do I think we're getting worked up about stupid stuff? I think it goes back to what Vosh said, and I've said that many times in my own following. This is corporations playing upon the dollar bill. They, don't, they honestly don't care. If you really think large-scale corporations and businesses really give a damn about your individual rights or the fact that you're trans, they don't. They really do. You know why? Because they know you're going to spend money. It's actually reported that black demographic spends way more money on clothing and shoes, and that's why Nike doubled down with Colin Kaepernick and the flat, all that stuff. Go look at it. Go look at the statistics. It's incredible. Do you think do you think Nike actually really cares? No, I don't think so. I really don't. I think they want to make a lot of money. But again, then you, your point actually still stands with the right pitch the knip fit of Colin Kaepernick and everything is like, oh, my God, you know, we're going to boycott him again. I'll be I'll be completely transparent. When Kaepernick took a knee, it really pissed me off. But then again, I take a step back and really think about it, be educated. It's like, you know what? It was actually kind of a beautiful thing. The fact that this guy got to do that exercise his free speech protected, might I add, it's fucking beautiful. Pardon my language. It's beautiful. I don't agree with it, but I, I can't sit here and cherry pick somebody's rights because I disagree with it. I think it's a very beautiful thing to say. Now the NFL fired him. Then we go back into the whole idea of free market. They can do what they want. But again, go back to the original point. The finger pointing, that's not going to fix this problem. If we keep saying the right did this or the left did this, what are we going to fix? It's, we're just going to keep sitting here going around the, around the table like, well, you did this. Okay, can we all agree that cancel culture isn't going to fix I have a point on this. I, yeah. I'll get to well, eventually. Nah, yeah, so. I, I yield. I'm sorry. Vosh, I, you've been waiting a while. Then Rob. Yeah, so I don't know what we mean by cancel culture because there's a threshold where we all agree that it's okay to publicly denounce a person. If a, if an, an actor won an Academy Award and they went up there and Sieg Heiled and gave a three-minute speech <laughs> on the need to eradicate Serbians from the earth, I'm pretty sure... I, I feel like... And I hope the conservatives would agree with me on this one. I hope we would all agree that, hey, maybe we should sort of rethink hiring this person. There's, I, there's no, thresholds. Man, I've there's... already been told what I'm supposed to think by other people on this panel, so I'm, 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 well, I'm just, like... I'm assuming. I'm, know, I'm taking an inference. So we, we know that at some point there's a type of behavior that warrants, I guess, what we would call cancel culture. What you said, John, is that you want conversations, and I love conversations. To me, the yeah. problem is that oftentimes conversations are held in bad faith, or they're basically just held as a proxy to socially manifest whatever it oppression is being discussed so take trans issues trans issues mm -hmm. are complicated okay I, I i got a bachelor's in sociology and my professors still didn't know what they were talking about with half those issues i honestly learned more from the internet than i ever did from education or proper academia and even online there are a lot of different interpretations and it's an ongoing subject and a lot of what we understand about trans issues runs in complete diametric opposition to what we've been told traditionally about men and women and how all this works. And I think the discourse there is not only 
going to happen. It's a good thing. Um, mm -hmm. Because otherwise, I, you can't just expect people to get on board with mantra. You can't just say, this is the dogma, this is the party line, roll with it. But we have right. to recognize that this problem has happened before. We had this problem back during the 1960s, because back before then, used to be, you were white, you could just kind of say the N-word. You were kind of okay, you know, like, it's just fine. Yeah. And then it feels like, and it felt like to a lot of people back then, I know this because I talked to my grandpa's friends, somebody snapped their fingers, all of a sudden you can't say that anymore. And all the discourse changed, and all the, and now it's not politically correct and so on. Now that's not to say people who have questions about trans issues are the same as people who want to say the N-word. It's just that sometimes these big cultural snaps happen, and it leaves a lot of people feeling like they don't have the right to even talk about what's just taken place. So I encourage the conversation. The only thing that I want to be careful about is, are the conversations that we're having good ones? And are they the conversations that might hurt the people the conversations are about? So some people like to, example, converse about, say, black-white IQ gap, you know? Interesting subject for academic discussion, but people don't often talk about it because they're interested in the science. They talk about it because they're looking for a proxy by which to express hatred of black people. Sometimes you see that with the trans stuff, too. It's not really a good faith conversation. It's just about bringing these issues to light so they can be used as weapons, as, as, as bludgeons to hit people with, you know? So we have to be careful about that. Maybe we'll have a couple of awkward years or decades on these issues, but I think that good faith conversation is the only way forward. But it has to be good faith. That's the only possible way to get through this. I think okay. based upon, uh, um, yep. uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Rob, I'm, I follow Rob, I, I, yeah, yeah, so first time to get to talk on this topic, so there's a lot to say, first off, everything that Demon Mama and John Burke were talking about, I could sum up in this, uh, yeah, cancel culture, when the right was the dominant force in culture, I would have blamed the right for that cancel culture, now the left is the dominant form in culture, Guess who gets the blame for it? Yes, I absolutely agree. I have not changed position on this. I've been pro-free speech from the time I was a youngster. I remember Dee Snyder and John Denver going on Capitol Hill to argue against censorship of music. I remember reading about the comic book code and how terrible that was. Heck, one of my favorite comedians is Lenny Bruce, who was routinely arrested for being offensive because he was making fun of the Catholic Church. Yes, all of that stuff was terrible. And so when Vonch talks about like, oh, well, this stuff used to happen in the past, of course it used to happen in the past, and it was a sign that the pendulum had swung too far culturally to one side because it wasn't just them enforcing laws and things like that. The real problem was that that was the dominant cultural narrative, which those were the things that you could say. That's exactly what we see happening today, except it's on the left. And I'm not concerned about Mr. Potato Head or even Gina Carano. I'm talking about things like the universities actually telling people that they can't teach right-wing perspectives that's occurring over and over. Again, not my words. This is a word of heterodox academy that's founded by a bunch of left-wing professors that talks about how terrible it is. And even left-wing professors that used to say, look, I'm basically lean more towards social programs and things. I'm afraid to even teach things on the opposite side of that anymore because we've gone so far to the left and there's so much power given to these people to just make accusations, such as the professor at Yale that just said, hey, maybe it's okay if someone dresses up like Pocahontas, but they're not Native American. That professor then gets circled and screamed at. This is occurring at university and campuses all over the place, and it's been occurring for 20 years, and now we're seeing it fester its way into corporations, into the media, and into other polit political ways, uh, political venues. We see this occurring. Now, the other thing that I think is worth talking about is we're just saying that, oh, progress, progressivism, it, that's all good. So, like, well, I agree, and, and we're going to talk about trans issues. Am I, am I wrong? That's the third topic. So, we, uh, we could talk specifically on those issues, but the idea of treating people like crap, well, that's not necessarily just a left-wing value to stop doing that. In fact, many conservatives and many mm. Christians, for example, think that treating people with dignity and respect, even if you disagree with their life choices, is something that should be achieved. Mm. In the same time that we hear the left saying, well, we need to treat people with dignity, some of the most vile, vitriolic things are being said, not just by random people on Twitch and Twitter, but by politicians. They're actually encouraging, like people like Maxine Waters is actually encouraging people to chase Republicans out of areas. We see the calls all the time to deplatform Republicans. I could talk about specifically things that critical race theory just being taught in federal government about how all white people are racist. This is uh. being taught in federal agencies. That's how far we've shifted to the left. 
again, you have people like James McWhorter, Eric Weinstein. These are traditional leftists that are saying, my God, this is you, getting Robin too D'Angelo scary. The pendulum has swung too far. It's going so to single-handedly lead us to the camps. This. We agree that if the pendulum swings too far on either side, that it'll lead to that types of forms of cancel culture. Where is the pendulum right now? And you've already conceded the pendulum has swung far to the left. That's why corporations are virtue signaling to the left. If the culture was on the right, then corporations would know it wouldn't be profitable to virtue signal on the left. So these problems that we see of the actual anti-racism, racism, going after whiteness, trying to reject whiteness, we see that there's now an industry in propagating race hoaxes because there's so, like with Jesse Smollett, there was just one oh, that happened no. today at Albion College that just came out as another race hoax. These things are getting crazy. The radical push to the left has encouraged victimhood mentality where the number one goal to achieve is how can I be the biggest victim? And it's encouraged this form of cultural Marxism where instead of looking at people as individuals, I think there was a great man once that said we should judge people based on the content of their character. Now we're being told increasingly by the left that we have to focus on people based on the color of their skin. You even see senators like Duckworth and Humrono that are saying they won't confirm people based on the color of their skin. We see hospitals like in Boston putting out medical journals saying it's time to only accept or disproportionately accept people based on their skin color. We saw the CDC try to give out a vaccine and said that 6.5 but 6.5 more percent people would die. And the number one factor that they gave as to why that was okay based on their recommendation was the people that died would be disproportionately white because elderly people were more disproportionately white. This stuff is running rampant. So all the like nice stuff that you're saying, like, well, hey, shouldn't we treat people with respect, like interracial marriage or gay people? Of course, of course we would. That's not just a progressive mindset to treat them with respect, right? That could be something that's on the conservative side as well. We could have mm. arguments as to politically what the policy should be regarding those groups. But it is clear that right now the pendulum swung too far to the left. And if it goes further to the left, the insanity that you're seeing today will look like a cakewalk. They'll take away your right to speak. You hear people credibly talking about putting Trump supporters, 9-11 style commissions, putting them in re-education camps, using violence against people. We see the violence that's widespread in the name of the left and all of it's deemed oh. okay. Even people on the left that are in academia realize this is a disaster and the pendulum needs to start to swing the other way. Okay, so I want okay. somebody who's on the left to kind of respond to this. I'm sorry, John, I have your name written down. I promise to get oh, you. Go one. ahead. No, you go ahead. Okay. That was just, there was so much. Like, there was so much there. wouldn't do like, smaller chunks, but I felt like everyone no, else I, was I mean, I feel big, like so. every time, I, it's, it's one thing to talk, you know, at length on one thing, and it's another thing to just fire off, like, a list of totally contextless, random things that sound vaguely scary. It's a lot of fear-mongering, and it sounds like sort of conspiratorial, uh, you know, rattling off of, of these things. I mean, I feel like anybody could do this. I feel like a, like a 9-11, like a 9-11 truther could come on here and do the exact same thing. And what are you supposed to do? Ask them for a fucking book about it? Like, you got to keep your, your claims down. I don't even know what to tackle there. Uh, I did want to comment on one thing uh, that John brought up, and I think that this might be, might serve as a little bit of a, maybe a small olive branch between, uh, between John Burke and I, which is that when I, when I talk about finger pointing, it's not because I, I like, hate the right or anything when you talk about finger pointing the reason why i point the finger at the right is because they're still doing this to this day i mean the rnc their platform is anti-gay marriage to this day they are still so like the problem that we have is that Ooh. the right is still being predominantly the the arbiters of the most serious forms of, can oh. of what you call cancel culture um oh. what's that That's sorry the, wait no hold on hold, uh, so Yes, no, I will agree with you that that, oh, that definitely sure. did stop. That definitely did stem from the right. Yeah, I agree with you, 100 percent there. Yeah, yeah. But and that's what my hope is for in regards to the GOP to progress in the sense of being pro marriage, pro game, pro. But go even further to say pro do whatever you want, and yeah. there should be no government. But my question to you though is who 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 who's anti gay? That's a politician calling for this. Wait, no, wait. Uh, like anti gay as, marriage. Um, anti gay marriage. Wait, that's literally yeah. the platform of the RNC in twenty. Can you show me? Yeah, uh, just look it up. I, I promise you. Just go to the RNC's platform. They were against gay, they were against gay marriage in 2020. This was that, no, the only like, reason I, I disagree with you. That. I've I've literally heard no one say anything also, regards to that. Just so you know, uh, I, um, Donald Trump, who was mm -hmm. the Republican candidate controlling office, banned trans people from the military against the advice of of the military. That has nothing to do with gay marriage, though. That's wait, 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 no, that's, no. That's I'm talking about examples. Marriage. I'm talking about examples of what I would consider to be the most serious forms of of uh, of cancel culture. Yes, I, 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 it is a fact that the Republican Party has included being for traditional marriage, 
even until this last election. And maybe that'll change. I hope it does. But until it does, I'm not going to stop pointing the finger at where it's due. Sure, if you want to say that like the left gets really mad about Star Wars, to me, that's very, very inconsequential in terms of when we're talking about actual legislation that affects the lives of people like myself and uh and uh, all over the country and we see this this has a downstream effect as well when you have people who are willing to push blanket bans on trans people people who are uh you know a vice president who less than uh less than five years ago was advocating in favor of conversion therapy for gay kids um that 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 this is this has a downstream effect on what the state the accepted standard is in our country and that is in my opinion a much more dangerous form of cancel culture than any of the I don't even know other things that have been rattled off here. I hope that we can agree that that's like a little more important than a, a Star Wars actress who maybe the fans of the Star Wars series got are too woke and they don't like her jokes on Twitter and they got mad about it. Like I, I recognize this could be a problem in certain circumstances, but it doesn't even compare to an entire group of people, my people, people like me who were banned so, completely from serving in the U.S. military. Like, if I can respond to that, because that was directed at me. I know, Rob, I know you sure, want to get it edge sure. in real quick, but being there. So you keep bringing up Gina Carano and you keep doing this compare and contrast using her as the example. That example was made originally in regards to leftist cancel culture. So what you're using it for in comparison right now is not applicable. You keep bringing that up. Now, you want to talk about conversion therapy for children and stuff like that. Do you think that that is covered under free speech and somebody's individual beliefs? Do, you, do I think, do I believe yeah. that the right to torture a child? No, 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 no. Vote protected? to speak it, to say it. Oh, sure. They can say that, okay. but they also, but okay. I also have the right to criticize them for that. I, I also have the I right to agree. point that out. I 100% to point out that, that we have somebody who became the vice president of, Amer of the United States. And I can use this as a point to say, hey, actually, we haven't really swung very far left if a guy who five years ago was advocating in favor of conversion therapy, which is I torture, just for the record. Um, I th is the I, vice president. I think one of the problems we have with this discourse is that um, the term cancel culture equates a lot of different things that cause yeah, different levels of harm. So I, agree. I will say something. I'll acknowledge it up the front. First of all, there are a lot of people on the left, and I mean all the way up, up to academia, who are very, very sensitive and often engage in these ideas in a performatively bad faith or sometimes in a ridiculously um, a condemning way. Like they go out to hurt people because they disagree. I think that is a thing that the left does from time to time. And I do think that right now the left has more power generally when it comes to wielding corporate support. There are more people who tend to agree with the left in terms of most big social issues. BLM was supported at like 70% at its peak. Gay marriage about 70% right now. So these com companies are going to tend to side more with those perspectives because it makes them more money. The problem is the thing that people on the left are concerned about first and foremost isn't really cancellation. It's real world harm. That's measured in metrics. So with black people, for example, the generational income gap between black and white people in this country is enormous. When we talk about the prison industrial complex, the disparity, or dis the disparity in the rates and extent of incarceration when controlling for all of the other relevant factors. So when you're just looking at race, Black people get shafted pretty hard when it comes to trans issues, all the stuff they have to put up with, health care and discrimination from employers and gay people, blah, blah, blah. So these are types of harm that aren't just cancellation. I mean, this is serious stuff. This is marked social progress yeah. stuff. This is the stuff that people 100 years from now are going to look back and they're going to go, wow, glad I didn't live back then, you know, because everyone 100 years from now will be a black gay trans person, obviously. Um, but... The problem is, as long as those problems exist, people on the left are going to be sensitive about those issues. It's almost an immediate and inevitable reaction. As long as uh, uh, LGBT kids are at like an 18 you know, times higher rate to get kicked out because of their sexuality or whatever, they're going to be sensitive about those issues. And that sensitivity sometimes manifests in a way that's toxic or unfair. And I mean that when I say toxic or unfair, because I don't think, now I'm not saying this is either of you, uh, John, Rob, but say you're a mom or a dad, I'll just use my parents. My parents are progressive people, really. They vote Democrat, they're nice folk. But when I explained trans stuff to them for the first time, like six years ago, they were lost. They don't, they're like, they were like 55. They're, they're, it was beyond them. And you know, I've, with time, I guess they've acclimated a bit to it, but I know that if they had had that conversation with the wrong type of left-leaning person, they would have been called a fascist. I know that. I know that for a fact. 
I'm thankful that I was the one to have that convo with them, you know, their son. Um, as long as these problems exist, people will react to them in harmful ways. So I think what we have to do, the only thing we can do is, you know, grit our teeth, try yeah. to ignore the discourse and work on fixing the actual underlying problems. Because once we fix the actual underlying problems, we're no longer at risk of invalidating those concerns by criticizing people who are trying to cancel other people on social media. At that point, the discourse is open season because we're no longer fighting over an underlying set of real material problems, you know? Yeah, uh, and, Robin, and to build on that, uh, yeah, uh, I just wanted so, to have uh, call one thing on there, just while this is relevant. <laughs> It'll be well, quick, I'm sure. Go ahead. It will be very it, quick. All I just want to say is that that's fine. I just, I just want to say that, like, do you blame people for being a little bit sensitive about this when you might not be able to get the treatment you need to live your life if you might be fired from a job just for who you are? What? I can understand why young people on the internet are a little react reactive about that. No, I'm just I'm just saying in general. Yeah. Uh, no, I I, I I do get it. I do get it. It's just, you know, it's just an unfortunate situation sure. all around. Okay, Rob. Okay. Yeah. So again, what they're conflating is just something like Gina Carano or Mr. Potato. Like I agree with Vosh that cancel culture could mean many things, but I think they're erroneous when they say that we're talking about actual policies on one hand versus just mean words on the other. That's not what's going on. Again, I cited in what I said last, a bunch of real world implications. We now have sitting senators that are saying that they will choose to confirm someone based on their skin color. We have the CDC offering suggestion on who gets a vaccine saying that their suggestion will result in 6.5% more people up to 6.5% more people dying but that's okay because they're disproportionately white uh i could read like I'll, I'll just read like some of the like let me ask you this demon mama if i could just get a quick answer what is torture about conversion therapy can you explain just real quick why that's torture oh no uh i don't want to violate uh tos real quick but um okay. if i might explain very bluntly um uh, many common uh, conversion therapy techniques um, involve uh, placing electrodes onto the genitals of children. Well, th um, that's clearly torture. Yeah, if that, uh, if that yeah, happens. That's, no what, that's incredibly common. In fact, nearly every type of conversion therapy, which is basically parents having the ability to ship their kid off to a camp where they are told they are wrong for the most basic form of who they are is a form of psychological okay torture. let me just uh, let, let me just well, ask you this wait, then. No, wait, do you think do, do you think wait, wait, let me rephrase just... the question i like uh, 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 do you think that telling someone that there's an inherent flaw with them by immutable characteristics of how they were born is a really bad thing is it that part of what's bad about conversion therapy saying that they're open more can you explain that further? Because that right saying that the way someone was born makes them flawed. Do you think that's a terrible thing? I don't know what that means. So okay. I don't know. Sure. Uh, right. Great. So I, I, uh, I, I, let's I, just I, go. I, that's I, fine. That's fine. So. Uh, uh, in a series of events at the Treasury Department and federal financial agencies, diversity trainer Howard Ross taught employees that America was built in the backs of people who were enslaved and that all white Americans are complicit in a system of white supremacy by automatic response to the ways we're taught. In the accompanying documents, Mr. Ross argues that whites share an inborn oppressive streak. Whiteness, employees are told, includes white privilege and white supremacy. Consequently, whites struggle to own their racism. He instructs managers to conduct listening sessions in which black employees can speak with their experience and be seen in their pain, while white employees are instructed to sit in discomfort and not feel and and not fill the silence with your own thoughts and feelings members of the group you are aligned with mr ross says are not obligated to like you thank you feel sorry for you or forgive you for training like this mr ross receives five million i could put about a dozen examples of just federal training where that stuff occurs uh, you're not going to pop in here i'm going to yes, keep talking, I am. But yes you asked me a question about uh, you're not going to therapy. you're not going to pop and in now here you're trying to talking. play like, an equivalent again, you wait, seem torture. to be the only person that has wait, a problem okay, with inter interjecting okay i just want to be sure to okay so the question is about conversion therapy and like a comparison to um, the telling someone telling someone that there is something immoral about them based on factors they can't control and how they were born. Okay, I, uh, Rob. I mean, uh, dear mama, sorry. I I actually like. I'm going to contain. I'm going to be as diplomatic here as I possibly can. That is one of the stupidest comparisons I've ever encountered on any panel in my entire life. The idea that some random jackass who does some dumb presentation to a bunch of like half asleep treasury workers that happens to like have some cringe takes about race on it is at all equivalent to shipping your kids away to facilities where in many cases they were sexually abused in the name of, of, of converting them, quote unquote, from their sexuality or gender identity. That is like, it is offensive 
on like 10 levels. And this is the type of shit that I've been talking about. In fact, I had a note on here about talking about uh, building off of Vosh's uh, point about good faith discussions. These types okay, of- Okay, I'm gonna interject since she said I was offensive. Wait, I guess this is actually, how it works. Actually, you're not I'll going to interject. I will right? I guess actually, that's how it works, correct. Wait, Next time okay. I want to interject. I want to get in okay. on that energy. Okay, there's, a lot you know? of, there's a lot of interjection, but I, I, I do- but no, There's only one person wait, interjecting, wait, let's be clear. Okay. okay. You. But there was, there was just three interjections. Okay, so I'm gonna have Dimama finish the point. Then we're gonna throw it to Rob. Then we're I interject, to so now it's four. Okay, great. And then John. Okay, <laughs> Dimama, Rob, Vosh, John. There's the order. I I think this is an incredibly bad faith, and not only that, but um like uh, uh, sh shockingly uh inconsiderate comparison to make between some. Corporate training or nails? government training oh in some God. random division get... that you think is slightly objectionable nails? versus children literally being tortured, which, by the way, it's not just me who says that it's torture. It's every serious medical and psychological um, organization in the world believes that that's torture. Yeah. And you're going to try and play equivalence to, with that. I don't think that I owe that the time of day, but I'm going to give it just a little bit of time of day for the purposes of the viewers here. Conversion therapy is torture. You not liking a, a presentation that you have to see as an adult at your job and having a problem with that is not even close to the same thing. Uh, with all okay, due respect, now, stop being such a snowflake. All right, so it, it's ironic that she calls so a snowflake going the entire here. presentation okay. where we're talking about yeah, the left her this, claiming absolutely. to be a victim. Uh, she wanted to make this topic about trans because her identity is being a victim. That's totally the identity of Demon Mama, and she tries to interject that into every possible conversation. That's why she feels that she can interrupt people, treat people rudely because she feels she's a victim. And I only bring it up because it's a microcosm of the problem of the pendulum switching too far to the left. So she could behave in ways that are rude or just, you know, it's not a big deal. I don't really care. She could interject. She could make all these problems proclamation of demands and get on a moral high horse. And it's all in the name of her claiming to be a perpetual victim. Uh, now, if people are having things attached to their genitals, clearly that's a step further than what I was saying. I said it while you were saying that, like, yeah, that's clearly torture. The majority of conversion therapy didn't include things like that. The thing that's offensive about conversion therapy that most people that understand what it is would say is it would be offensive to tell people based on the way they were born, if they were born in a certain way, that they needed to change who they were because there was a flaw with it. You saying that this just occurred in one agency, we're not talking about private people deciding what to do, although that might be immoral or heinous. We're talking about the left, the pendulum has swung so far that you're literally allowed to call all white people racist, and that is taught in federal training programs. I can go through a couple more real quick. There's literally dozens of these I can come up with. It's Sandia National Laboratories, which developed technology for American nuclear arsenal. Executives held a racially segregated training session for white male employees. The three-day event, which was led by a company called White Men, its full diversity partners set the goal of examining white male culture, making employees take responsibility for their white privilege, male privilege, heterosexual privilege. And one of the opening exercises the instructors wrote on the whiteboard that white male culture can be associated with white supremacists, KKK, Aryan Nation, MAGA hats, and mass killings. On the final day, trainers asked employees to write letters to women and people of color, and people apologized for their privilege in being white and promised to be a better person. Department of Homeland Security diversity trainers held a session on microaggressions based on the psychologist Daryl Sue. In his academic work, Sue argues that white Americans have been fed a racial curriculum based on falsehoods, unborn fears, and belief in their own superiority, and thus have been socialized into oppressor roles. Trainers taught that Homeland Security employees are a myth of meritocracy and colorblindness is the foundation of racist microaggressions and micro inequities. The trainers insisted a statement such as America is the land of opportunity. Everybody can succeed in this society if they work hard enough, etc. was racism. If white employees disagree, his point is dismissed as a denial of individual racism, which is another microaggression. The point is this stuff occurs all over the place at the federal government, at corporate America, and academia, and it's too far. All of the advances, even if we would concede, which I disagree, that all of the advances we were talking about of the left of treating people decently based based on all of these characteristics, even if we say that was all part of the left. The problem is the only way we can advance as a society is to have a pendulum that doesn't swing too far to the extreme one side or another. When we have these arguments being made that people can't, this is what I'm talking about with cancel culture. You can't even disagree with this. We all know this. Like you can pretend that it's not the case, but we all know this. For example, we saw with the Covington kids, did you ever think we would get to a place where adult black racist and a Native American agreeing with them could surround a bunch of kids make racial and homophobic slurs, and the media would demonize the kids and celebrate the adult races that went after right. them. That's where we're at as a society right now, and it's infil infiltrating every okay. single institution in this country. Okay, okay. Oh, it's, Vosh, uh, you're next. Okay. I, it's a lot. So but categorically- yeah, I mean, it's a lot. Everybody's been shooting off a lot. Categorically, I just want to point out that, well, 
I'm not saying the examples you've cited are entirely invalid. The reason you're citing these examples is because you can't do what I can do to prove the opposite. The fact that there are demographic disadvantages experienced by certain groups. So rather than me talking about individual examples or like this was like a bad uh, workplace training seminar or something like that, I can just point to a swath of disproportionate outcomes sure, for let me, let me, black and white. Well, well, I, do, we well, I just want to say, I know that's sure. not what you were trying to do. I know it's apples to oranges. So I, I just want to say that with regards to your, your arguments there, look, a lot of what you're talking about, I call it like these Robin D'Angelo, like white guilt conferences, okay? What it usually is, is it's like white people draft up a big PowerPoint presentation to show to other white people in some government or high corporate position where they explain how being white makes you mean or something. Um, look, white people, racism's a thing. White people have been dealing with the consequences of them enacting white supremacy broadly in society for a while now. Sometimes they while out and do some weird stuff with that. It's like cuckold porn, okay? There's a big, big, big market for that. Big, black, muscular black guys having sex with white wives, you know? Is this white people externalizing their guilt and fetishizing it? I don't know. This Robin D'Angelo stuff strikes to me similarly, okay? I'm just not a big fan of how they handle it. But I don't let like... Me, if I could just ask you a question, like, you know, on this... Hold on. Like, I, oh, no, I no, no, wait, wait, wait. wait no, I want to hear the question, but then I want to finish with the... Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I, I just want to... So, like, for example, we would say, no like... No questions about you, cuckold porn, please. Uh, no, no, no. When you talk about, like, structural oh, no. inequities, like, and I'll <laughs> talk about that the next time I get to talk, but just to ask you, you would say one of the examples of the structural inequities, like law enforcement's treatment, treatment of black Americans, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's part of it. Okay, well, then, if, if would we also say that law enforcement's mistreatment of men which are incarcerated in all of the negative factors that compare yes, whites massively. to blacks. The criminal justice okay, system so treats is, men so worse than it does black that. people. The le that's right. So the left has caused the mistreatment of men, correct? No. Actually, the issue has gotten better because of feminism. Feminists have fought against mm -hmm. many of the discriminatory practices that have led to the disproportionate sentencing of men. But yeah, men do get so shafted explain, in the criminal justice system. That's right. And the, the point is this, the left and feminism and what we see is often talking about the patriarchy and it's demonizing men. And the truth of the matter is- I don't is believe that feminism is say, about demonizing men. Okay, but it, that's, well, we could have that discussion. That's fine. There but are feminists what we who dislike is, men. Like, but... It's non-falsifiable. Like it's non-falsifiable what we see ends up happening. You say, oh, if there's inequities in a group that we generally consider uh, a group that's a minority or a group that's underprivileged or oppressed, we say that the left can save them. We need the left. But if we see a group that the left considers to be a majority group or an oppressor group, that they're being negatively affected, you say, ah, again, it's the left that can save them. And I make that point but to say, when left... you talk Wait, about these so... structural inequities, just real quick, when you talk about these mm -hmm. structural inequities and how that's different, you aren't proving that a further shift to the left would benefit these structural inequities anyways. Because the term a further shift to the left is so vague as to be useless here Stop it. when i when we're talking about the disparity between men and women's treatment in the criminal justice system we're talking about a disparity that has been alleviated thanks to feminism there isn't some group of men's rights advocates who've been doing the the work on this feminists have been doing the work on that in this regard yes with regards to the criminal justice system men are oppressed it feels funny saying it but it's true the disproportionate sentencing of men significantly outstrips the disproportionate sentencing that black people experience relative to white people now do many people talk about this no because a lot of people on the left and the right don't disagree with the underlying biases that lead to that being a problem. They say, yeah, men are more dangerous. Men should be locked up for longer. But I feel like that's an issue that the left, while not entirely, has been at least partially working on. So to, to speak to the broader point there, I don't like these Robin D'Angelo conferences. I don't like this whole telling white people that they're all racist by default of being white thing. I don't think these conversations are productive. And frankly, I think that their content runs antithetical to what I was taught sociologically. The idea behind intersectionality isn't that like some power groups are worse than other non-power groups. It's that we're all bound up in a huge collection of different types of biases, benefits, and negatives that make up and shape our life experiences. So a white person may be racist. That's a thing that can happen. But why are they racist? Probably because they live in a society that allowed them to internalize some ideas about race. But they aren't the only ones who live in that society. Latin, Asian, and black people live in the same society, and there are plenty of black people who have internalized basically the same ideas about themselves that white people have internalized about them. It's all really complicated, and that's why I do not like these conferences, these, these workplace training panels. It's because they simplify it. They make it essentialist. They tell white people they should feel guilty. I don't think that's good. I don't think any person should feel guilty for a thing they haven't done. But we need to be clear again, while these things are problems, 
and I do want them addressed, I don't think this speaks to the incredible disparity between the types of real problems conservatives are trying to address and the types of real problems that people on the left are trying to address. Because I would take the left side on those issues pretty much 99 times out of 100. It seems like they have a much better idea of what solutions need to be levied here. And as a final point, very last one, I, I yeah, conversion therapy is pretty bad. I, I don't know how we got on that topic. I left for a pee break a second ago. I, I legitimately remind, missed how we got I there. But it's pretty uh, I, I, can, I, I got it. So basically what happened was um, the topic of conversion therapy came up and Rob Noor uh, was, I believe, somewhat comparing it to the classes uh, some corporations uh, have on whiteness. I federal mean, government. Yeah, or federal government. Saying federal that government. someone's born evil or someone was born flawed and having a conversion therapy for it is wrong. I, that, I would agree that's, with that. That's so, not what right. conversion I have a question is. for you. It's an offensive comparison. It is a stupidly offensive comparison. And it actually drives me nuts that nobody's jumping on this. Like, like with all due respect to you, Vosh, I, I love you, but holy shit, Thank this you. is such an, an absolute fucking false equivalency that I can't even believe it. You're talking about some rattling off so fast that nobody in the audience can even understand it. And thank God, because their heads would have probably collapsed from how stupid it was to compare some random, like poorly put together Robin D'Angelo, like training to systemic conversion therapy that in the best of circumstances involves shipping your kids away to a mental asylum where they will be taught on a daily basis. They will be monitored and taught to to uh, to reject the most core parts of their identity, the, the a, a type of therapy which has shown to induce severe and long-lasting mental health issues. And you have the gall to call me the fucking victim here? You absolute sad snowflake. You should walk away from this with your <laughs> tail tucked between your legs. You sad, <laughs> pathetic piece of shit. Mm -hmm. No, okay, wait, I had, wait, I had a question. Okay, wait, hold on. I, I had a question. Wait, okay. I, I, okay, to be clear, that was, I mean, that was. <laughs> was that a violation? I'm sorry, was that a violation of your policy rules, Dylan? Which rule? Which one? What she just did? Was she was she being nice? Was that was that considered nice? Well, no, I, said, be nice? I, I said at the beginning, I suggested it, but it isn't a rule, mm, okay? okay? It's like, uh, it's, you know, it's. Um, Vosh, if I said to you, real quick, this is all I'm saying. If I said, mm -hmm. if I had a seminar at the federal government where I said black people are inherently inferior and they need to repent for their blackness. Well, okay, wait, like, for, wait. first of all, I, I need to be a stickler for details here because usually these conferences aren't saying white people are inherently inferior. It's usually that they're subject to a set of preconditioned biases that are ingrained in them by society. And this affects almost all white people. It's not a moral essentialization in the same way they just say saying all black people, people are racism. Are racism. Right, all I, white people are racist. Well, depending on which for. academic you ask, you'd say that all people are racist, period. And that's a language that I tend to subscribe but, to myself. But, but, wait, let's, wait, 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 please, 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 please. I, I want to ask you this question example. very badly. I'm begging right. you to ask, to receive this question. Okay, sure. The, the issue that I have with this comparison... No, wait, I'll answer that in a second. The question that I have is, given the fact that demographically, it seems like the left is fighting for groups which are demographically disadvantaged... What changes would you want made? Because I don't like these Robin D'Angelo workplace seminars, but it seems like they're um, deviations from an otherwise fairly consistent set of policies and cultural prescriptions which maintain white hegemony. Like, yeah. I agree these things aren't good, but the reason why they're exceptional is because in pretty much every other measurable demographic in society, white people tend to be on top, whether it's representation in higher government, CEOs, whether we're talking about educational attainment or wealth disparity. So even though these things are a problem, we're not talking about a problem that is manifesting itself is to such an extent that it's leading white people to be oppressed. So given that, that people on the left seem to be fighting for the oppressed, what, what changes do you want made? How do we address that oppression without, in your mind, um, enabling some sort of backlash? Okay, that was like the longest question okay, in the world, but, but no but problem. Right after I, that, John Burke hasn't got to talking forever. I tried. Okay. Oh, God, well, shelf it then, I guess. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm interested okay. in hearing Rob's. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so here would be my answer. Just because you're saying that you're speaking up for a problem doesn't mean that you're necessarily solving it. In fact, it seems that a lot of the so-called liberal and leftists that will seek to speak up for minority communities are doing so from a position of privilege anyways. And so just because they pay lip service to the cause doesn't mean that they're getting results. For example, we could see the most left-wing controlled political areas in this country claim to be speaking up for African Americans and other populations, but actually they're worse off in those areas than they are in most other areas. We Wait, could also I... see that the left is 
it's all the, just real quick like you, you gotta uh we can see that this sort of mentality has led to a disproportionate like all you have to do is look at like the left talks about helping the poor so let's go to la and look how the poor are doing not good the left says that they're going to help black people let's go to the areas they control and see how things are going not good so Wait, you're conflating Democrats the aren't idea the left. and we've already like so you're conflating the idea if we see groups that are disproportional you say and we acknowledge those groups or we claim that they are oppressed groups then it's the left seeking to help so, them wait hold but on I would this is a, a really the really dumb the analogy have, no it's it's wait like, hold on even, this this like democrat the governors the left... therefore the left is causing black poverty is a completely ridiculous point black people tend to live in areas uh, that like inner city areas for a wide variety of demographic reasons and they tend to vote democrat because republicans have been more overtly racist in the past 40 years the fact that democrat we're not talking about which leaders are doing what we're talking about solutions I want reparations. I support right. Black Lives Matter. I want criminal justice reform. I want police reform. The ideas that I and the rest of the left are proposing, infrastructure reform, jobs programs, these are ideas I have that assist the impoverished, that assist the oppressed. Okay, so, so, so I just don't, don't want to run off with this areas, like governor's... Right, right. So we can you know, see the areas that have came closest to embracing the ideologies of the left you want are actually worse for the very populations that they're how? claiming to solve. In what policies people, have been implemented and, so that have hurt those people? Well, so for example, uh, Black Lives Matter, you say you endorse. Homicides are up almost 200% in inner city America uh, and at many inner city African American evidence? communities That's because, because of BLM? Black Lives Matter pushed a narrative, excuse me, Black Lives Matter pushed a narrative that led to defunding police or demoralizing police, which has directly what? led almost wait, every wait, time wait, they wait, 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 no, hold, wait, do you have effect. any I mean, evidence that the increase in violence yes, is right. because so BLM the, made police not want to do their jobs? The reason why yes, violence example, has gone up is because uh, of the example, pandemic. Uh, the, Okay, so for example, uh, no, violence hasn't gone up because of the pandemic. There's no evidence for that whatsoever. No, they're, example, wait, they're absolutely, Portland, wait, do you want that, papers so on that? For example, we can see in Portland, we can see that the mayor of Portland originally defunded the police. Now he's calling for $32 million in increased police funding because they realized it was a huge mistake to defund the How police. How did he the defund the police? Like New York, because they cut the salary of the police that they were giving. They did, okay, wait, so like they, wait, did they million. defund no, it? Can I, inter can, I, can, I, can I just interject something real quick? Um, so to, to go off of what Vosh and Robert are talking about here, there, there are parts I agree and disagree with both of you. I think that in a sense that the BLM definitely had inflammatory rhetoric that pushed into the regards of the, which helped with the overall idea of defunding the police, which was a horrible idea. We need a police reformation. We need better training. Uh, so I think that's, if, is that what you're saying, Rob, in regards to that's how it led to it? Like not saying BLM is the cause, like the direct, like they were the ones that went in there causes violence. It was the propaganda pushed by the BLM in regards to defunding the police, which led to the increase in violence. And the actual Seattle and Portland, places like that, it was actually shown. There's articles all over about that they're actually saying, hey, we cut funding in the wrong areas. We need it back. Now we have police that are not being paid. Police are quitting. We can't hire enough people. We can't get qualified people to apply. Therefore, we're having a spike in violence. So I think, yes, I, I do agree that violence did increase as a result of the pandemic because people were stuck at home. Um, you have like the, the case that the Le Miserage, Jean Valjean, stealing a loaf of bread to feed his family. I can't blame these people when they're, when they're told, uh, by the way, by the government, that you can't work. What are you supposed to do to make ends meet? Well, you turn to criminal activity. And I can't, I can't say that I blame these people. I can't. I would do the same thing to feed my family. But at the same token, yes, I think that a lot of what the BLM supported or a lot of the inflammatory stuff that got pushed out, and I wanted to lead into this point, is that I think that we're, we're looking at the zealots in each movement and painting the entire movement because of the extremists. And I think that's magnified due to social media. I think a lot of these things that you've discussed, like everybody's discussed, were needed in our society. We did need to progress. We did need a lot of issues. Say, for example, like BLM brought some very good issues to light in regards to economic disadvantage by the black community, which mainly uh, inheritance wealth, which had they not pushed that, I never would actually say, you know what, I want to look this up. This is actually a very interesting thing. And a lot of Republicans will go, no, I don't want to hear that. It's like, no, no, hear me out. And the reason I think a lot of Republicans' ears are closed or we are consistently being screamed at and told that, well, you're this, you're that, based upon the zealots of a movement that are like the representation of the whole, according to some, which I disagree with adamantly. So a good faith conversation, I agree, is needed. But when you're screaming at me, when instantly you're calling me a populist or snowflake or thing, then the conversation shuts down. We're not going to have a discussion. If we're going to sit here and virtue signal, pound our drums about how angry and upset we are because we disagree with somebody, we'll make no headway. We'll, make, we'll have no discussions. We will just shut down. But... Wait, to I go just, back to the overall point, go, I'm I, sorry. I, I, I no, I just, wait, I just, I need to finish that because Rob, I feel like you completely avoided that point. 
So yeah, crime has been down in the past year. Murders are up, but it's because of lockdown. People are unemployed, staying in their houses, getting mad and killing their spouses. The idea, you just spewed off a narrative that is not only not supported by the evidence, like I think you just made it up on the spot, that the crime mm -hmm. escalated because BLM de demotivated police officers and you avoided the central question which is why is it that all the ideas that i as a left-leaning person have seem to serve the interests of helping oppressed people and then when i bring that to you and i ask you what would you do what would your solutions to these problems be instead of answering that you say well hmm Look at these Democrat cities. How are they doing? Well, I don't like Democrats. And I don't, by the way, think that cities are doing generally in America particularly well. Find me a major city in America that doesn't have its problem with crimes, homelessness, uh, poverty, racial inequity. What I want are ideas that will work. National solutions or local, something that will alleviate this oppression. We can talk about it with crime, with race, with income. We can talk about the gay or trans people. We can undo the trans military ban. We can, uh, we can uh, uh, make it so that uh, it's no longer longer possible to fire people for being uh, LGBT in the states that don't have laws protecting as such. There are things that we can do, and I support these solutions, but either you ignore those problems or you find a way to address them that doesn't contribute to this cancel culture you're concerned with. So how, how do you do that? Right. So, so what I was saying was that just because you're saying we're advocating for this group, one, many people do that from a position of privilege, that they're just a virtue signaling that they advocate for that group. So it doesn't. And second, just advocating for a group isn't necessarily that you'll bring solutions to them. I would solve these problems in a totally different way. I think the more we focus on race, the worse race issues become. This has been shown to be the case when we look at all metrics of race relations How? in this country. By the advent of Black Lives Matter in 2013, people said and that about like the that, civil rights race relations, race relations have decreased at going on. Uh, since then, uh, we see it. We could see anecdotal evidence, and we could see the actual, real evidence when people are asked of different skin colors of what they feel about other people. Now, when you talk about real world solutions, look, I'm pointing out that the real world solutions that oftentimes are employed by groups like Black Lives Matter. That so we they solve say the problems by ignoring them. No, that's no, not what I'm suggesting. But people would have said, said the same so thing I back during the civil rights point movement. Real quick. Rambling so, so Rob. The, 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 no, I'm making the point. It's a twofold point. One, your solutions aren't working. And second, here's what my solutions Wait, which be. of the solutions so the that council... I just stated to you doesn't work? The ones that I right. said so, to you. Uh, for example, so for example, Black Lives Matter and the idea of defunding police. Let's see what the Council of Minneapolis, the police. defunded the police said. The City Council of Minneapolis, Minnesota, voted earlier this year to defund the police department. And in July, Council took its effort to reimagine public safety, additional towards dismantling the police department. Further, one of these additional actions was for new million dollars for MPD. Unsurprisingly, the Minneapolis Police Department crime data reflects a rise in assaults, robberies, and homicides, as well as property crimes and arson. It also reflects more people have been murdered for the first nine months of 2020. Crime uh, also went up during the civil rights now protests. Minneapolis, now Minneapolis city government shocked to discover after it vilified, maligned, and defunded its police, meaning police are not outperforming their routine duties, crime has risen. Council President Lisa Bender said in June that her constituents' fear of dismantling police department comes from a place of privilege. Got that? Rob, now I never mentioned defunding the police. Right. And the, also, the, the, your the arguments is, here would the apply the to the, the civil the, rights movement. Real quick, I'll finish this section real quick. I'll finish this real quick. The point is, oftentimes, people that claim to be on the left and push more radical left-wing policies actually cause harm. Now, the second thing, when we could look at actual not focusing on race and just rising tide lifting all ships and conservatism and things like that, we could see under Donald Trump, employment and economic numbers in the African-American community and other minority communities were doing quite well before COVID. So the idea that it's only the left that is offering solutions is just nonsense. Okay. And the point is this. I'm not saying, and I'll finish real quick here, I'm not saying that there isn't a place for the left. I'm saying the question asked here is do we need to shift more to the left right now the status quo is radically to the left and there is no evidence that's been provided that shifting further to the left would be beneficial all of the things that you said i don't really like this when you were saying about robin d'angelo and all these things do you think those things are more likely or less likely to occur if we shift even further to the left that's the thing okay. i think they're relatively wow. trivial but shifting your way would lead to the perpetuation of actual harm not like being inconvenienced by shitty workplace mandatory training courses but actual harm your solution to race relations is to ignore okay. it where would you have been in the 1960s crime rose back then too absolutely it, it did there were riots the movement there was were different. wait no Can wait no Rob wait hold on really, you really, wait, really wait, wait, wait 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 stop wait demon stop no you say it's different now because you're around now back then no, that's you would have said true no hold on back then you would have said it then 
because the logic is the same. We don't need to talk about these problems. All we're doing by talking about them is exacerbating the issue. Uh, crime is going up. There is more racial tension between white and black people. The civil rights movement is only leading to more hatred. We just need to chill out and not address it. That was word for word the line used by people back then. And everybody now thinks they wouldn't have been back in support of uh, second class citizenship for black people back then. But the fact of the matter was that a lot of white people were in favor of second class citizenship back then and they used your arguments verbatim and you didn't address any of the actual points i made i didn't mention i can make the, the exact argument for, for example many of the causes of rob now i've been trying to get I'll, 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 okay, i've said i've said enough so I'll, okay yeah. give me a second i'll let rob respond and then demon can ask their question Right. This is a misnomer because when saying that because the objective reality now is different than it was in the civil rights movement, because I say that we shouldn't have the exact same prescription. And in fact, the less we focus on race, the better it would be. I'm not saying never talk about issues when they deserve to be talked about. But clearly, we've gone too far and we make everything about race now, which is causing a substantial amount of the problems we see. If Vosh says, well, if I say that now, I would have said that then. Well, we see members of the left, including examples that I just gave that are advocating for segregated spaces and safe spaces for minorities. So that means Vosh, if he endorses that, would have endorsed segregation back in the days of Jim Crow and in the Democrat controlled KKK. Of course, a serious he would have, argument. but I could easily say that I could easily say that, right? If you support segregation today, you would have back then. That correct? if you're in favor of safe spaces, you would have been in favor of an apartheid state. I feel like that's a little bit of a reach. Your argument was analogous. It was a one-to-one -one argument. No. It was the same. My, the argument for safe spaces is sometimes there's a supply cabinet in the back of the room uh, in the in the fourth academic building on the left where maybe people can just like chill out and not argue. That's a safe space. The idea that safe spaces contribute to the same social harm as like segregation did is ridiculous. But I mean, it's your not just safe spaces. It's actual segregation. For example, we see universities that are having segregated classes. We see universities that are having segregated graduations. We see federal agencies yeah, that are doing segregation. We see right all of this stuff's occurring. So if you're for that now, you would have been for segregation and but white spaces not, and black I'm spaces in the that. past. Okay, but many on the left are. So why would we shift some further people to the left? are? Usually, this is the same problem as the megacorps that do the woke virtue signaling thing. Academics and university professors feel like they need to kowtow to a very vocal minority, and as such, they engage in these practices. As far as I can tell, in academia, what you're talking about right now, these segregated graduations classes, are extraordinarily rare, and they're usually like one off or two off things that are thrown out there because one action committee was especially annoying that previous semester to uh, the D. I don't think this is anywhere near comparable to a broader argument in favor of segregation. And to those people, by the way, those people fucking hate me. The type of leftists who engage in that behavior despise me with every fiber of their being, more so than they ever would you, trust me. So, I'm not in favor of that. I'm just saying, like, I don't think that ignoring the massive race relation disparity in this country is gonna fix the problem. I think we need to tackle it head on, you know? Okay, I want to throw it over to Dean Mama to ask the question. I've talked so much. I am time. done now forever, I promise, for this thing. Uh, yeah. I just had one quick question for Rob. Um, do you think BLM is a terrorist movement? I think that some of the people that have operated in control of BLM and acted under the oh, guise no. of BLM have acted in terrorist ways, but certainly there could be people in BLM that aren't terrorists. Because that's really different than what you've said basically every time you've been on here. And I can't help but wonder if that's because you've got more eyes on you this time. In fact, it was literally just, what, a couple of days ago, I think it was, that you claimed that BLM was a terrorist organization? It's interesting. I guess you're uh, you're losing yes, that. Yes, if, they, if, they, if you were at a BLM rally and they're advocating for destruction of property, that is terrorism by the definition of it. Yeah, but if I you look up the definition of terrorism, it is using violence or intimidation to achieve political goals. That is exactly what some people in BLM do. Yes, fact, and I, I said we that. talked, for example, way, on the debate we had the other night. Hold on, on the debate quick. we had the other night. Okay, 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 okay. I know we're going to get the filibuster again, stop. but stop. I muted. I'm not a lawyer. I don't think okay. planning vandalism so is the same the, as terrorism. So the question was, and I know, John, I'll throw it over to you because, John, you haven't got a lot. I don't lot think to those are the same things. Afterwards. But Dima asked Rob if he believes that BLM is a terrorist organization, and Rob, you then responded, "Well, certain people." at these uh, events have uh, acted in a terroristic fashion by destruction of property, which by the uh, Google-like definition of it is is terrorism, right? Correct. Okay. So did you answer the question? Well, I was just going to say, when we saw, we had this discussion just well, Wednesday, I'm not shocked you forgot, 6% of the events of Black Lives Matter resulted in this sort of violence. If that was any other organization, we would say that they're a terrorist organization or have a serious problem with terrorism within their organization. 
can what I, you're can saying I, is you think it is. Wait, wait, can I, can I ask you a question then? Yeah. Uh, me personally, actually. I'm not supposed to do this, but can I ask you a question? Sure. So then if I was to like point to uh, the Proud Boys then and say a certain amount of interactions they've had on the ground uh, seems to a high level of it seem to be violent, then they're a terrorist organization. Or we could look at the Capitol riots and say, well, that Trump spoke there. There was a lot of Trump figures. That seemed like a Trump rally. A Trump Would the Trump organization then be a terrorist organization? Is, are we kind of playing loose here with definitions? So the Proud Boys would be different because I think that I don't know the figures, but I would say a reasonable percentage of interactions that they've had at rallies probably resulted in violence. So you would have a better argument. We were told not just by people like Demon Mama, but people in positions of power in this country, including people in the Biden administration, media, et cetera, that there was a terrorist organization and white, white supremacist insurrection that occurred January 6th. If you look at the amount of Trump rallies that resulted in riots, you could point to one. If you look at the amount of Black Lives Matter rallies that resulted in violence, you could point to hundreds upon this hundreds upon analogous. hundreds in connection with Antifa. Antifa. No, it is definitely analogous. What it is is I'm willing to call out all political violence. But when you see an organization over and over and over, 223 by the Princeton study, locations of violence that occurred during Black Lives Matter, that's more than Wait, four per state. Or, when you say organization... Do you mean the ILC endorsed violence or people, members of the ILC, like, or do you mean like the movement umbrella term broadly? Because hey, the movement umbrella, I don't know what you mean. Okay. So we get movement instead of like organization, right? What about the civil rights protesters? Right. Would they have been terrorists? Well, Martin no, Luther and, King this is, and again, this is the argument that's constantly used by people that want to excuse violence on the left. They constantly compare it to the civil rights or the Boston Tea the Party. No, political violence isn't riots. justified. Political violence is not justified in the one, one and Every one time that it's been justified in history, there's been 10,000 times that it wasn't justified. What about and yeah, this? Is again, but I'm not, I'll just say <laughs> Wait, this real but with quick. The, the Vosh, so, so again, so, that, so what Vosh is saying, if you were for violence in the past, then you're for violence now, I'm correct, I'm just Vosh? asking if your argument would lead no. to them being called terrorists because the civil rights movement did to lead to a lot of riots and there were groups within the civil rights protests that actively organized stuff that you just impugned Black Lives Matter for, flipping cars, breaking windows and the like, would you have called them a terrorist group? And if I was there at the time, I don't know what I would have called them. What I would call them now is no, because that was one of the few times in history where that thing, something like that was justified. But even some is of terrorism them would have been no longer terrorism, terrorism if it becomes justified like post hoc? Right. So if you're a slave and you involve and you use violence or intimidation to not become a slave, then no, that's not terrorism. If you do so because and again, this is the justification okay. that you constantly see from the left that's advocating for political violence today. Remember this at the end of this, the only people that have condemned political violence from all sides are people like me, people like Demonama. And I'm asking you, Vosh, do you think some of the political violence we saw from Black Lives Matter was justified? I don't have a problem with political violence. You support the police, don't Good. you? There you go. There you go. Well, do you support uh, so the police? There you have it. Uh, the police, uh, giving the monopoly of use of force to the police is one of the best decisions that we've ever made as a society. The government should have the monopoly on use of force when it comes to enforcing the law. All right. The fact but that you tried to every, liken the police okay. to well, political wait, but, terrorism uh, what, is not a question. question. Okay, 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 okay. okay. So a here, here's something I'm going to throw forward. Do we skip the last topic or do we continue on this one? I, uh, like, well, like, I just like, have like, one more thing to say. Last, and I know. Do we skip I, the last topic and keep to this one, or do you want? Yeah, to let's the skip the last. Topic? Okay. I'd love to do the last. Then topic. I'll say. I'll say. You've just, been okay. talking about it the whole time. <laughs> I'll just say okay. one thing. Then the problem with that is that pretty much every civil rights protest in American and I guess world history has entailed some degree of what you would consider terrorism. Whether we're talking about the abolitionist movements, whether we're talking about gay rights, black rights, trans. <laughs> Whether you go back, I mean, was Stone were the Stonewall riots? Was that terrorism? I don't know. But if you can post hoc remove the terrorist label because you ended up agreeing with their aims, then what you're saying is you don't have a problem with political violence fundamentally. You just have a problem with how it's used sometimes. The police are a form of political violence. We made the decision to give them a monopoly on force. And when we expect the police to suss out situations using their guns and their ammunition, we're deferring to an expectation that political violence should be relegated to a small portion of our population. But there are times when we've gone past that. I mean, you said it yourself, the abolitionist movement and all of the slave uprisings, I'm sure, is something that you would support as well. That's also political violence. I think that political violence isn't bad on its own. If it leads to good outcomes, as it has in some cases, abolitionist movement, uh, the Union crushing the South during the Civil War, then I'd say it's good and dandy, you know, and that at times it's not good and dandy. ISIS uses political violence. I am not a big ISIS fan. I don't know if that's a contentious opinion in this room, but I'm not a stan. <laughs> 
as it were. I just think it's about the outcomes. It's not a principled opposition to right. And so and so think yeah. of what's wait, been said wait, in two thousand. No, 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 no. Okay. Wait, wait. okay, sorry, I'm oh. sorry, but John, uh, you you were waiting for the longest of times. You have been an extremely polite guest, so I want to give you the endings thing, and then we're going to probably move on. I, I, hmm. Because you you were. I'm I'm no I'm I'm sorry. I'm honestly enjoying the conversation. I really am. I'm learning. I'm. I'll pick John's I'm, I'm, section if he wants. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like <laughs> no I, I actually agree with Vosh on the idea that the police oh man again this is coming from a guy that was once a diehard back to blue blindly uh, and there was the understanding of that when you essentially give all authority to a single group of people they will abuse it authority uh, oh god how do you say uh Supreme authority always corrupts, you know, uh, absolute authority corrupts. Absolutely. I agree. I think that that was an issue that the BLM definitely brought to light that even convinced a cis white male such as myself was like, wait, they actually have a point here. I was like, maybe we should actually take a second and take a step back and like, wait, there, there are some things they're getting right and there's some things they're getting wrong, but the conversation does need to be had in regards to there. Are, there's a lot of brutality behind the badge. There's a lot of authoritarian uh, viewpoints being held by police behind a badge. And I agree with you there. Um, to go back, though, I feel like both of you are missing a kind of a point here to say, well, do you view the BLM as a terrorist organization? Do you view the Proud Boys as a ter terrorist organization? Here's the issue. Unless you have a standing army and a way to enforce the views We're gonna of said them. army through justice or uniform code, whatever you want to call it, whatever regulation of laws, you're going to have those that act in bad faith under your banner. And you can't control that. So what I mean by this is if we all form our own little group here and we say we're for freedom fighters and then Vosh decides to take the freedom fighter banner and go say, you know what, I'm going to go out there and rape and pillage. And now he's a representation. Not, I'm not being that literally, but you go, you know, some the example. But now he's Did a representation say that after of I my fist organization. Pump. Jesus. <laughs> I'm sorry. He kicked a puppy. He kicked a puppy. OK, we'll, we'll take it that far. And then suddenly the freedom fighters are now responsible for having kicked a puppy. I can't, I can't say that that's justified. I, I say that he did that in bad faith. It wasn't. So I think the overall point is, what is the actual group's message? What's their mission statement say? And judge it based upon that. Now, when you do have leaders of an organization that just came out today that purchased a 1.4 million home in California as a, a co-person of the BLM, there's, a, there's something there. The Proud Boys, I think the Proud Boys are a direct representation of what happens when you get little government involvement, when the police are actually not doing their jobs. You, it's, it's cause and effect. When you have Antifa out there causing massive amounts of violence in the street, well then, you know, with cause and effect, birth the Proud Boys, and they're there to counter Antifa. When both of these things could have been basically evolved or avoided if the police actually would have done their damn jobs, and when somebody started throwing a brick, you drop that motherfucker. Um, pardon my language again. So I, I think you're both arguing good points here. But I think the overall point is that you're trying to generalize an entire group. I mean, the BLM is comprised of like how many millions of people? So if one person goes out there and throws a brick through a window, you know, I actually marched. I, I shouldn't say marched. I went to a BLM rally and walked with them because I wanted to see. I actually took my phone. I, I wanted to go see. And nice, nice people. Like, it was cool. Now, you did have some people that were being like downtown Dallas where I live. There were people that got violent. I saw a BLM members saying, no, we don't support that. And other BLM members saying, yeah, we do. So who's right and who's wrong here? But what is the official message of BLM? I think that's what you have to judge by. But I think that you two are you're, you're having some really good conversations here. But I think the overall point is that you can't take accountability for the zealots and the extremists. It'd be like, you know, me, somebody that's like considered right leaning, taking accountability for the extreme alt right. It's like, well, I don't agree with that. Does that make sense? Maybe I'm not getting that. Yeah, point but there's a, there's two, there's two uh, fundamental. Uh, so what you're saying is you're a Nazi I'm... sympathizer. Okay. That was a, that was so, a, no, don't you pause on me. That, you knew well, that was a that's joke. The official, that's the official uh, Vosh position. Uh, he just stated it. It's very clear. So we're going to have to wrap this up uh, because we don't have a ton of last time for the last topic. So And we want to get to it. So I will be asking the judges for their votes for this round as well as we move on to the next topic. The next topic has to do with the bill. Can we get and, final thoughts on this topic? Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah, we can do it. We'll run a little over the show by limit though. I'll okay, do one Rob, minute. You can start. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the, the important thing to do is look in totalitarian, uh, to the totality of what Vosh is saying here. Uh, he's saying that we need to shift even further to the left. He's conceding that we're already far to the left. That's why corporations suck up. And then he's saying that he justifies political violence. So he's just given the rationale for increased political violence for the right and the left. Both sides will say that my cause is just, therefore I could use political violence and we're going to see increased amounts of that. John talks about how we shouldn't totally trust the police. Agreed. I don't disagree. 
agree with that. He talks about don't judge a group by a few bad apples. It's not a few bad apples. It's uh, it's billions of dollars of damage that these groups have caused. And we have to look at the comparison of how the people in positions of power, which again is t- pendulum swung to the left. How did they treat the people January 6th and Trump supporters in general? And not just the people that engaged in violence, but the hundreds of thousands of people that were there. They're treated like they're terrible insurrectionists, white supremacists, terrorists, etc. But then the same people doing that in positions of power, then when I say, oh, we should look at when we have a group that committed far more violence, far more often, we should look at them with suspect eyes too. They say, no, the important thing to remember is this, we're already on the left, Vosh wants to go further to the left, it'll cause increased racism, it'll make things worse, and it'll cause the excuse for political violence for both sides to continue to escalate. Nope. Terrible idea. A lot of that was made my, uh, my final statement now, while the, uh, the yeah, piping hot don't fresh worry. tea is still served. One second. John Burke? Sir. Your, do you want to do an ending statement or do you or your last statement fine? I guess not. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, no, I'm, I'm good. Okay. I, I see. Bosh, same. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, like to me, the argument that like saying you want to move to the left and saying some forms of political violence are acceptable means that now all violence and all racism can get, can get worse would be like saying that it would be like saying that because you've made it illegal to murder now soon like the state will be shooting or locking up everyone i, I think it's a completely ridiculous extension like a, a illogical extension of the positions that i hold i'm not asking for violence on the streets i'm asking for less riots like what took place during black lives matter are unfortunate but they're also what happens when you have systemic racial inequality that's here in america that's any other country on earth you want to fix it, you address the underlying problem. It's going to go that way with any social problem you can find. As long as there's racism, as long as there's sexism, homophobia, transphobia, classism in this country, there will be conflict. And the question is, how do you address it? Do you ignore it? Well, that's been the common hegemonic talking point for hundreds of years. That's always been the default talking point. Just don't talk about it. Don't acknowledge it. But that doesn't work. Eventually, these things come to boil because the thing that you want to ignore, the thing you want to shelter away, is a part of the lived experiences of tens of millions of people every day for their entire lives. That's always going to be there. So how do we deal with this? I say we don't focus on whether we're moving to the right or the left. I say we focus on which ideas are good. What will solve these problems? I think left-leaning ideas will solve these problems, but I advocate for them because of the ideas, not because they're left ideas. And anyone who watches my channel knows there are plenty of left ideas that I disagree with strongly. So let's just focus on the issues. I'm done. Demo. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to start off by restating what I said at the beginning. The American right, especially the American far right, is a millstone around the neck of all people on the planet. It is pushing for, uh, I mean, God, even in this conversation by people who are probably not uh, necessarily considered far right, we have equivocations being made on conversion therapy, which is just absurd to me. And and in addition, I want to note, I just want to note, just so that we can get the the honesty out of the air here, uh, Rob Knorr, uh, rambling Rob over here, just spinning off all kinds of things that he wants to go off on just two days ago, ex- explicitly stated that BLM was a terrorist organization. So when he doesn't have as many eyes on him, he sure is more willing. And also, interestingly, I also happen to have uh, some video from my Wednesday stream of this still being a tweet you got up on your Twitter, that BLM is a terrorist organization. So I don't know. I just can't help but feel you're being a little bit dishonest here and trying to run down the clock by constantly filibustering the rest of us with whatever bullshit you could be pulling out of your ass. I don't even know if half those things are real. Does the audience, does anyone here know? Nah, look, this is all just a distraction to, to, to pull away from the fact that it is true. You would have been against the civil rights movement if you were alive at the time. And so would most of the American right. In fact, most of the American right is against it right now. The BLM protests are the modern civil rights movement. They have been an uprising against genuinely horrible conditions for black people in America. And there are many other movements that are going on alongside this that you just blanket dismiss and you want to talk about cancel culture this and cancel culture this. It's not a serious approach. You just want to feel good with the status quo the way it is, nice and comfortable for you and not for everyone else. You want to sit here and make jokes and laugh about conversion therapy, which is torture, by the way, and uh, and something that doesn't affect you at all. So yeah, that's what I have to say on this issue. Okay, last topic. There was a bill, and I always say it wrong. Arkansas, Arkansas. Arkansas. Oh, fuck, I did it again. Okay, Arkansas. No, no. Some people actually say it that way. You're right. True. Some people just pronounce it that way. True. Yeah. I, I just got a big true. Okay, base. Okay. Um, 
uh, Kansas, Kansas can use whatever pronouns it wants. Um, uh, it has a bill that just passed through. Uh, there was a veto. The governor vetoed the bill, but it was a bill uh, that has to do with the medical services that trans uh, individuals can receive in the state. And so the, the topic is very simple. Uh, was the governor right to uh, veto the bill or should it have gone through? Simple as. Uh, or any other topics on how this can impact trans issues across the United States going forward and possibly around the world. Uh, I'm going to start on the left-hand side with Demon Mama before going around. One minute. The the case out of Can of Arkansas is unbelievably disheartening. I'm not going to lie; it it really hurts to see this type of stuff go through. Uh, I was happy to see the governor vetoed it, but it didn't really matter. It's going back through anyway. And this is a law that will functionally bar trans people from getting the health care they deserve, and also penalize doctors. Notice they're targeting the doctors who might want to follow their Hippocratic oath and give the treatment that trans people deserve in the state of, of Arkansas. And it's sad because I think that we're going to see a lot more of these across the state. Um, laws that are um, hidden under the guise of, oh, won't somebody think of the children? And they'll be used to oppress and harm physically trans people all across the country. And we're seeing this rhetoric ramp up more and more. And it is sad. Because uh, what's happening is that our country is is balkanizing over trans rights. We have regions of the country where where the ability to get medical care is an almost impossibility, and that's going to by all and by by everything that we can see, that's only going to keep happening until we have what a patch a patchwork where some people are trapped in a state where they can't get basic respect, they can't get basic health care, and then you have to flee to another part of the United States. This is ridiculous. And, you know, uh, I don't know. I feel like the some of the opinions that have been displayed on this panel show why this is happening. It's a huge problem, and I hope we can defeat it. Thank you. Okay. Next is going to be Vosh. Oh, I wasn't muted. Cool. Um, yeah, it's. I agree. It's fairly disheartening. It feels like a pretty inevitable consequence of the past couple years of Republican disinfo. <laughs> Regardless of your position on transgender people, politicians probably shouldn't be making state legislation denying certain types of health care. That's very strange to me. Regardless of your position on this, the idea that a bunch of 85-year-old legislators are making decisions on what types of medical care can be done, that's very weird to me. See, at least with abortion, which is also something that gets broadly legislated on, we're talking mostly about a moral question. But when it comes to transgender youth, we're talking about, is this medical care good for the people who take it? Right now, the medical consensus seems to be, yes, the types of transgender identity-affirming care we provide to uh, youth are effective. They reduce suicide rates. They make people happier. They allow for further integration into society. It's just a slam dunk. And now a bunch of legislators, for political reasons, have decided that no, not only can you not get this care, but if a doctor attempts to provide it, they go to jail. It's abhorrent, it's anti-scientific, and it's completely unjustifiable. I can't fathom a good explanation for this, apart from one which defies the medical consensus on the issue. You'd have to argue that no, all these doctors and all these associations are wrong. That's the only counter argument, but that's, I mean, that's a tough argument to take. Okay, I'm gonna throw it over to John Burke. Yeah, um, based upon the article you shared, uh, everything y'all had already stated, yeah, I 100% agree with. I don't think any politician should be able to sit there and say medical, yeah, I, everything. But the article that you'd shared, Dylan, unless I'm misunderstanding, this is in regards to providing puberty blockers and things for transgender minors, which I thought, am I, misunder am I misreading this, misunderstanding this, or is this the, is this the way y'all want to go with this conversation? 19 and younger, or 18 that, and younger, yeah, for this yeah, law. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's definitely something that needs to be brought up, because I feel like we're kind of missing the overall point in regards to people that are under the age of 18. We're talking about providing puberty blockers to children. No, I, I don't support that. Now, if we're talking about in a case of somebody that is transgender needs to receive medical treatment, like go to the doctor for I have a cold, I'm dying, whatever, then yeah, it's discriminatory 100%. But in regards to providing somebody with something that's going to change their body, if I can't get a tattoo until I'm 18, if I can't drink or smoke until I'm 21, 
which again, I, I disagree with that. Um, we're going to sit here and provide the means for a child whose brain is not fully functional nor developed to change their sex? No, I don't support this. When they're 18, yes, 100%. That's their right to do so. But as a child, no, I can't support that. I would never support that. Okay, next is Rob Nor. Okay, so I am... I, let me first say this. In order to agree with this law, I'd have to say that... The, or the passing of it, I would have to say that the overwhelming preponderance of evidence is this healthcare would not be acceptable for anyone, right? And I have to admit, as this was a topic that just came, I'm not the most well-researched in puberty blockers for children and things like that, right? So it is difficult because I do have libertarian concerns of having the government intervene and say that you may not choose this healthcare or another. However, having said that, I think that I can make a case that it's probably more likely that we don't have evidence that these kids are that these kids are capable of making these decisions and that there aren't adverse side effects and things that could happen that are negative to them. So first off, that you would have because these people are children, I find it very ironic that we're saying that children as young as what well, I guess we'll get into it, 9, 10, 11, 12 are capable of making these decisions when in any other area of life, we know that nine year olds, 10 year olds are not capable to make these decisions. Furthermore, that we could see evidence that 80 to 95% of young kids that think they experience some sort of gender dysphoria, if not treated, actually grow out of it. So the overwhelming amount of people, if not treated, will grow out of this. We also see that a lot there are lasting effects that could happen from puberty blockers even though people say it's uh, it's completely reversible that's not true first uh, as we'll talk about like there's psychological impacts that may not be reversible at nine years old as you're just entering puberty maybe you're more you have a different view of your gender than once you're 12 years old and you've went through puberty so you're stopping that natural course of progression in addition there's also side effects that occur from these drugs and there's been many people that have transitioned later in life or took these drugs later in life that said that they thought it was a mistake so i do err on not allowing children to make the these life altering decisions with their body. But I do understand and I'm willing to listen to the science and have that discussion. I do have reservations about a, the government being able to tell people what sort of treatments they can and not exist. I just don't believe a nine year old is qualified to make that decision and the parents shouldn't make it for them. Okay. Mind uh, if I, uh, uh, yep, you can grab it. So, uh, John, I want to, I want to puberty blocker pill you in a moment. There are a couple of concerns I want to address, though. First of all, the idea that 90% of people who experience gender dysphoria end up recovering later on their own is not true. That's an often miscited statistic. It was like 90% of people who have ever, under any circumstances, ever demonstrated gender nonconforming behavior don't go on to transition within the purview of one set of data. It was like utter nonsense. In reality, among people who take puberty blockers, I believe about 1% of them end up not deciding to go ahead and properly transition with hormones, which is an unbelievably high rate of success. And mm -hmm. thankfully, puberty blockers are highly reversible, meaning that for that 1%, we're talking about maybe a slight variance in bone density, later puberty start, relatively minor physiological issues that were assented to, not just from this kid, but from the doctors around them. See, we talk about this like these nine-year-olds are just going on in there and making these decisions on their own. Not at all. Usually what happens with the prescription of uh, puberty blockers to a child is a child demonstrates extensive early symptoms of gender dysphoria, which can emerge in a billion different ways. I won't even get into it. So if the parent picks up on this, you can the parent takes the kid over to a pediatric psychiatrist, the psychiatrist evaluates, and that psychiatrist might then refer that child to a gender clinic or to some psychiatrist that has a specialty in that particular subject. And then that psychiatrist works with this kid for years. I mean, the pro this is not like a snap, snap, snap decision. We're talking about extensive long-term um, psychiatric intervention to make sure that this kid actually is ge demonstrating gender dysphoria, not just, you know, flipping about a little bit, not just likes wearing dresses, who doesn't, hey, hey. And um, only after all of that do they start get putting on a highly reversible, safe, and well-tested medication, puberty blockers, that have been used on cisgender children with thyroid disorders since the early 1980s? Tested provably, even if you don't transition afterwards, this is medication safe enough The kids have been taking it for decades. And hey, if they don't decide to transition, they get off it. Very, very minor, very, very unlikely side effects. Definitely worth the risk, which is the consensus of the medical industry at the moment. So... I think this is safe. And we know, by the way, that we're comfortable 
um, prescribing mind-altering substances to children because I know that because kids can get Ritalin. Kids can get antidepressants. As long as a psychiatrist is here through the process, making sure that everything's above board, I don't see any problem whatsoever with allowing gender dysphoric children to have the opportunity to experience puberty in the gender they want to be. Yep. Uh, there is uh, no evidence that there's any long-term harm from puberty blockers. We wouldn't deny a kid uh, a, the right to have um, to have an antibiotic. Why would we deny them the right to have the puberty blockers that they need? This has been well studied. I mean, beyond beyond compare. And the fear mongering on this and the disinformation mongering um, is just so wild to me. There's this idea again, uh, Vosh, you, you you mentioned this slightly. This idea that like they're just blasting them out of a cannon into the hands of kids. It is so hard, even for adults, to get HRT in most places of the United States. Let alone kids getting puberty blockers, which aren't HRT. They're not the same thing. They're very different. Um, and and it there is an entire process. There's never more. There's never less than two doctors. Uh, that are going to be weighing in on this. The fear mongering on it is just outrageous, and the result is that uh, is a demonization of uh, basically whoever can be blamed at the moment. Whether you want to blame the trans agenda, some vague thing like that, or you want to blame parents, which is just you know parents transing their kids is just a non-existent thing. There is no evidence of this ever happening, um, and or, or or whether you want to say it's doctors secretly lying about the medication that kids need i mean no matter which angle you approach it from it just doesn't make any sense it's just fear-mongering it's that's all that it is and um it, it's really funny because uh there's just about no process that's more reversible than puberty blockers you just stop taking them if you don't want them anymore and you can immediately begin be, begin puberty with no with no real problem in fact it's happened like you mentioned many times in addition the trade-off is that you have an incredibly uh, uh, dys dysphoria-inducing puberty that changes your body in ways you don't want, that's traumatic, that leaves you leads you feeling um, ostracized and being targeted by your by your um, schoolmates, which is a very well-researched phenomena, and uh, suffering greatly from um, uh, an, an incredibly highly increased rate of depression and suicide for having untreated gender dysphoria. Um, there really is no leg for this argument to stand on except for bigotry. And that's the thing that's so sad because, no, I, I recognize you're, you're laughing at that, but no, in reality- I'm laughing because you sit there and you ad hom left and right and you create these fallacies from out of nowhere. Nobody well, on this panel has displayed right. any sense of bigotry. No one's tried no, no, to create no, 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 any fear mongering no, except you. You Excuse pander me. left and right to your own audience. Multiple times I've sat there and I watch you accuse Rob of saying you're doing this because more eyes are on you. You're the very same one who said, I'm going to do this for the sake of, my, of the audience, the viewership. You're very hypocritical in a lot of the arguments that you make. You, you go ad hom left and right wait, and you wait, create wait, wait, these fallacies. I'm, I'm sorry. Of, it was my turn to talk. And fear and, and, no, John, no, I'm done John, with you. I'm done. John, no, you John, interrupted John, nonstop the John, name calling is not up. But the one me, thing I, I do want to objectively verifiable. And I'm about to talk. You. This is hormone the hormone therapies, of an transition related surgeries, and referring to this, you keep you two keep utilizing puberty blockers. But what yes, you're not talking about are talking the permanent about. things that are also in the bill that you, you don't are ignoring. Know anything about that. I promised you. How do you know, know that? Is you're making you assumptions could. based. I'm sorry. Are okay, you a parent? Do you have you children? Know. Do you have okay. children? Okay. Okay. Give do you have second. children? Give us a second. Okay. Because if, if we're gonna go anecdotal, do you have children? Answer the question. Do you have children? Wait. Okay. Can. Okay. One second. If, if, because okay. I don't know if I'm not trans. Do you have children? Can you can you be Sorry. justified? Is this, is this on? Is this on? Sorry, one second. One, two, three. Can everybody hear me? <clears throat> I find it nobody, very interesting. Is, nobody very can interesting. hear me. Nobody can hear me. Okay. Yeah, I hear you. I can you hear you. The restart stream. Okay. So people can't hear me. Okay. I can hear you. Does anybody? Okay. I just want to be clear. Clear. Does anybody have a history of hearing problems in here? Mm hmm. Okay. Is, what, is, does those hearing problems in any way uh, like impact the way to um, hear me when I speak? I, We're good. I'll, I'll assume not. Okay. So let me just make clear one of the earlier rules. That when I'm talking, I'm not talking to like jump in because I got to like save my best friend, John Burke, me and John, we, we grew up in the same high school. We, we, we go back real far. Uh, we were buddies in, uh, buddies in the war. Uh, he, we support each other, but uh, I'm not here to save John. I'm just coming in to moderate. Okay. So Demon Mama, 
Uh, I want to give you a piece of time to respond to that. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, it's funny you bring up an ad hom. What you did is the the textbook definition of an ad hom. You ignored everything that I was actually saying. You didn't let me finish, and you tried That's to not say an ad hom. Some... That's not an ad hom. Look up ad hom. That's not ad hom. That's deflection. What you I describe wanna... is deflection. Get it right. At least get that right for me, okay. please. Dear mama. An ad hom is uh, when you uh, when you try to discount an argument by making attack against the character of another person, which you did, which you did when you brought up the idea that somehow I'm playing it up for my audience. Now I have insulted Rob a few times on here, and I think it was I, th I personally think it was a little deserving given the experience last time. But you didn't even let me finish what I was saying before, which is that. I wasn't talking about you or or Rob's positions here. I was talking about things like the state of Arkansas, which has just against all science, against all recommendation, defied, by the way, a bunch of random state senators who don't really know the science. They're not scientists. They're not people who actually know about any of this. They're not trans people, that's for sure, have voted to defy everything that we know to be good for trans people. And they justify it along all kinds of silly fear-mongering lines that, don't, that aren't backed up in data. In fact, they're directly contradicted by the data. And your sort of, you know, childish blow up there was was pretty emblematic of the type of stuff i'm childish talking about childish blow here. up you've yeah, sat there you've interrupted consistently you name I have not you sit there and you do this to your you want to talk about childishness that, if your people scary? that you Being claim scared? to represent if you are a representation of your people that you've continuously said you're a very poor representation because there can be Thank no you. conversation I love, with you. I, I love you're that very you're very childish. Literally, you are very you are childish. Literally doing I've enjoyed Bosch, every other whom I actually disagree with on a lot of things, but I enjoy I the fact that Bosch will Bosch reason with people okay. and actually have a conversation. You, it's like talking to a petulant child. You nice. literally said, I feel he was deserving of said insult. Yeah, I do feel Rob like, is literally, I do feel but, like Rob does, yeah, definitely. But that's still insulting somebody. <laughs> Whether you that. feel it, it's still insulting somebody. Yeah, guess what? And guess Rob, what? You insulted Rob wasn't everyone, insulting including you. No one insulted you. And guess what? And guess what? You, you've been treated with nothing but respect on this audience. panel, and all you've done is thrown a temper tantrum like that's a baby. True. Like a, yes, you have. My no, God. I mean, watch the record. The audience will decide. The judges will Okay, okay, so. I like being involved. Wait, wait, okay. I still haven't finished my point. I like, I like a, I like a good derail every once in a while. Okay, I like a good derail. I like a few clotheslines. They're fun, but I do want to make sure that we have enough time to actually talk about the topic because we are on a tight time schedule. So I saw that Rob wanted to ask Vosh a question. Yes, but uh, right or so Demon, Demon Mama, Mama either. Yeah, or Demon Mama, but Demon Mama, you you were making an original point earlier, uh, so I do want to like give you about like thirty seconds to finish that before throwing it over to Rob. Uh, yeah, again, my my point was is that this is based off of fear mongering. It's based off of disinformation. The decisions made by uh, the Arkansas uh, state uh, governance were not based on science. They were not based on rational decisions. They were based on bigotry. There is no other way around it. the The evidence disagrees with any any other position except for to allow doctors to treat their patients, regardless of their age, just like we would for anything else. It's just bigotry. And and lack of understanding that backs this up. Can I uh, can yeah. I jump in with one oh. quick thing? Oh, um, yeah. If it's quick, that's cool. Sure. I just want to say that on on an intuitive level, I understand hesitance about this topic. Actually, when I first became supportive of trans people, because I mean nobody's born believing anything. When when I got into it, you know, um, the the whole kid child puberty blocker thing felt really weird to me. I'm not dismissing that point of view because it was something I initially felt, but it does feel weird um because these are like these really big pivotal decisions that you're making about life and sexuality and identity and the kids are young you know and in th then the far right sometimes they run off like really crazy like it's some crazy grooming scandal thing but that's always been dumb and i'm not even going to dignify that with a response but the more i thought about it and the more i looked into the available research i became more confident in how solid the science was on the issue and to me, it stopped being a matter of scientific ambiguity, and it really just became the moral question. To what extent do I think it's okay for a child to influence the quality of their future in a medical setting? And we know what our answer would be if this wasn't a trans issue, if it had to do with a surgery, if it had to do with a depression or with a psychiatric condition, if it had to do with something like that. Even with non-medical stuff sometimes, like their identity or, or hell, even a decision what job they might prepare for in the future. Those, it's not a same as transitioning, but it'll have consequences down the line. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that my concern really just was a sort of intuitive rejection of the idea. 
the more I thought about it, the more comfortable I got with it. Maybe everyone won't feel that way, but I, I just like I want to say that I'm sympathetic to the, you know, the um, base concern with how it all plays out. You know, uh, okay. Rob. Yeah. So one that directly answers Demon Mama that the only justification for having concerns is bigotry. That's not true, as would be easy to prove, as even Bosch proves that. Well, sometimes uh, it's secondly, bigotry. To be fair. Well, it, uh, but 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 sometimes it's different none than this, case, this is the only reason, case. right? So so uh, so That's let me ask you this, Vosh. When we're talking about this right. case, let me ask you this, Vosh. So like we're talking about kids as young as nine years old. Um, how does a doctor determine whether or not someone has gender dysphoria when they're nine years old? This is a. I mean, if you want, I can explain what I've read in it, but it's really complicated. I mean, I probably couldn't explain to you the total process now, for a doctor can diagnosing I, can I just, any other. Can I slightly change the question? Sure. Does the input of the child heavily weigh in? You just said it did, so I assume you would agree with that. In the same way that a psychiatric evaluation for depression would, yeah. Like, you need their input. I mean, you can't just measure a chart in their brain, but it's not something... Child psychiatrists are aware enough of how flippant children are that they don't make mistakes in this regard, which is the reason why so few people get on puberty blockers and then later decide not to transition fully. Okay, the reason so, why is so because there's a stringent process for this. Okay, so here's what, so this is, uh, again, we're talking about children as young as nine, them making decisions about how they identify as they're hitting puberty for the first time. Like, this is nonsense. Like, we would wait, not, like, we I don't I just answered your question. Make, wait, just, so wait, what no, if, a kid, no, 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 what if because, a kid was feeling depressive? Like, what if you had a young kid, like 10, 11, they were feeling depressive, they, or psych, let's say a psychotic, they were hearing voices uh, in their head. Uh, from time to time, they would feel a compulsion to do things they didn't feel they wanted to do. Now, the only way for a doctor to properly diagnose that, and you should diagnose that, by the way, it's probably as early as possible. The only way to diagnose that would be a doctor working with this kid, learning about their experiences, talking with the parents too, getting input from the kid, and considering the fact that when you're getting that input, the kid is a kid. I mean, kids aren't reliable narrators, but you still need input from that kid. Now, that decision okay. to put a kid on okay. anti-psychiatrics is a big one, and it can have severe okay. That's psychiatric That's completely non-sequitur. It's completely non analogous no, How is that a non-sequitur? If it... I mean, again, if people give me a second to finish my point, I'll explain why, right? Because we can see that 80 to 95% of people, kids that experience gender dysphoria pre-adolescence, once they get to adolescence, they lose all signs no, of that. That, I that just, means that I 80 to 95 per... No, you said true. that number wasn't accurate. Right I have now. the study. I could link the study. Wait, like, do you, you want me to link right? you mine? Like Detransitioning is incredibly uncommon. Like, that's just a fact. Detransitioning I'll, I'll link the study. isn't common. Why would... What, so... so if you could provide well, evidence that study. speaks to the opposite, that. I'll link the study. Sure, yeah, it's yeah, from here. a medical journal. I'll wait, link wait, it. Wait, if you wait, can find uh, evidence, Rob, I'd be willing could, to read Rob, it. Yeah. Could you please link it in the Discord? I, I can't. Oh, sure, it. sure. Yeah, my bad. Uh, so just our Discord group chat, or yeah, yeah, just the group chat we have for the thing. Yeah. Okay, so I'll link it right here. Uh, so, and the point is this, like. So there is a significant chance that if every kid that just said this, a nine-year-old, and the doctor's heavily relying on them, that there would be people that would be misdiagnosed, and they would receive this treatment. So then the question becomes this. If there is a chance of misdiagnosis, misdiagnosis and also if there are potentially long-lasting effects to puberty blockers, why wouldn't we be skeptical of allowing these children to have it? I can't engage okay. with this hypothetical because you're operating on a false presumption that a majority of people who get treated for um, puberty blockers later end up going off of them. But it's factually incorrect. I can't engage with it. The vast, vast majority of people who get puberty blockers go on to transition because they were correctly diagnosed. And then of those who transition, either surgically or through hormones, only a very, very tiny percentage of them experience regret. And a lot of the regret they experience and some detransitioning gets listed as such, even though the only reason they're doing so is because they can't afford to continue buying the hormones that they need to continue their transition. Correct. So we're talking okay. about the people who are hurt I, by this are a fraction of another fraction of a smaller fraction. Now, you're telling me this like 90% get misdiagnosed. I can't engage with this because it's not true. It is yeah, true. Uh, the no, the data is until... Now, just for, real quick. I mean, I, you've again, I'll wait for some... I want to have a, a, a say I'm, here. I'm right? tired of, I'm tired okay, of your constant interruptions. It's absurd. I've been incredibly polite. I've been incredibly polite. I've been incredibly polite. And I... I don't have not been polite. Okay, Give me okay, both are muted. Okay, so this is how I'm going to do it. So, Rob, this back and forth has been going on for a while. I haven't heard uh, much from Dean Mama and the same with John Burke. John Burke actually hasn't talked for so long that he evaporated and no, oh, wait, no, he returned. He Sorry. now exists again. 
Um, so um, I'm going to give it over to Rob for about 25 seconds, and I'm going to go over to Demon Mama. Okay. Until Rob. someone provides a different piece of data, the 80 to 95 percent of people, we could also see the study that says that it decreased the suicide was 89 people that said it was literally only 89 people that said that they had family support and that they got puberty blockers and they thought that was a good thing and lowered their thoughts of suicide. The problem is that's only 89 people, which is the only study I'm aware of that says that it lowers suicide. The second problem with that is they all admit that they had familiar support, so it could be correlation or correlation, not causation. Chances are, if you're a trans person who has family support enough to get medical care, that means you would be less likely to have thoughts of suicide than it's someone who didn't so we don't have evidence that the only defining factor was these arguments and it are these treatments and lastly bone density and psychological impacts of puberty blockers in addition to side effects are quite relevant which if i ever get a chance to speak about the studies as long as everyone else i'll get into it okay. so dear mama okay so first of all, I just want to remind everyone that Rob opened this by saying I don't actually know very much about this, and now he's trying to unilaterally represent studies from 2008, um, which, like Vosh correctly stated at the very beginning of this, were about anybody who ever had an issue, quote unquote, with gender, not anybody who ever went on puberty blockers. The detransition rate, the desistance rate for puberty blockers is incredibly low, and in fact, it gets even lower when you control for societal factors like familial mistreatment, societal mistreatment, income, things like these that can strongly impact your ability to live a good life as, as a trans person, okay? And, and the other thing I want to address here that has been uh, just sort of totally ignored is, is this is not a, a, an issue of concerns. Concerns would be the state of Arkansas appoints somebody to go talk to a whole bunch of doctors and figure out what the science is. This is a bunch of uninformed, bigoted people to, acting on their own prejudice and outlawing the medical, the worldwide medically accepted treatment for trans people because they don't like trans people or because they don't understand trans can people. I, can I ask you a question? No, no, no. Quick, Please, no. Okay. For, the, for the love of God, no. Um, this is not a matter of concerns. This is so far beyond concerns. There's a hundred different ways that you could voice concerns. Nobody has a problem with anybody voicing concerns. What we're having here is people like you stroll in here, misquote studies in order to, to, to literally just so disgustingly saying that like, oh, anybody who starts puberty blockers, 90% of them stop. That is so false. It's not what I said. It's abject said. lying. Yes, it is. And no, we all not. know it because we'll be able to watch the VOD and you'll be able to see what it was that you said. It's going to be great. I love having things on record. Okay, um, real quick. So, what I said was, I'm not, what I said I'm not was that yet. I know you, Philip. This has nothing to do. Yeah, I mean, nice. I know you wanted to grab my little. I, I, okay, I, I, I will say that Dean Mama, it was a back and forth between Vosh. I do want to give Dean Mama a decent amount of time to talk on this one. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. I love love having a, a little bit of time. Um, yeah, so the uh, the concerns are not the issue here. This is a matter of people trying to justify their bigotry under the uh, under the idea of just asking questions. But you can ask the questions. The questions have already been asked. The science has been done. There were thousands of people dumping their life and, and fucking blood and sweat into understanding these issues and you and the people of Arkansas, the Republicans who voted this down predominantly or who voted this up in, in, in Arkansas predominantly don't care. They don't give a shit about the science. They never bother actually looking into it. They don't care about the truth. They just want to justify their belief that trans people are bad, that kids shouldn't be able to have access to medical treatment, and it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. May okay, I? Uh, yeah, of course. And then um, John and uh, Vosh, you posted links. Do you want to like comment on that afterwards? There's really not that much to say. The data supports my position. I could provide more if I need to. Okay, Rob? Uh, the data that I provided was 80 to 95 percent of people that experience gender dysphoria in pre-adolescence no, grow out of that once they hit puberty. I did not say 80 to 95 percent of people that are on puberty blockers later than get off them. That is something that Demon Mama, as usual, has to misrepresent. Then, she only wait, has then maybe we agree. Do we agree then? So you acknowledge that I acknowledge then there were a lot of kids who demonstrate gender um, nonconformity, but of the p kids who do get put on puberty blockers, almost all of them go on to transition. So would you agree then, given those two data points, that pediatric psychiatrists are exceptionally good at determining what actual cases of um, gender dysphoria Vosh, are? do you think a child should be able to surgically transition? You mean like uh, like uh, bottom surgery? Under the age of 18, yeah. Um, That one I'm not super comfortable on, no. Well, Why not? 
The main reason is because the success of those surgeries tends to correlate, I think, with types of growth, like physical growth, that um, make it easier to for those surgeries to succeed. That's mostly a data-based argument. If it could be argued to me, though, that if a person was like 15, 16, and you could make that surgery, then I still think... Because puberty blockers are reversible, even to an extent hormone therapy, not fully reversible, but it's, you know, whereas a surgery of that caliber is not really. The reason so, I asked that, Vodja, those are two that. important things in the bill that we're not discussing. Y'all keep focusing on puberty blockers, and I'll be the first one to say, we can, we can run around this all night, but that's not what's left in the bill, the one that Dylan shared. We're also talking about hormone treatment. We're also talking about cert. We're talking about more than just puberty blockers. But to my yeah, knowledge, we're kids weren't really like getting. I don't think kids and were, were really getting those surgeries. Actually, I the last time I checked, it's, I it's think, not a matter if people are or not. That's what the bill entails. Well, if That's a bill, the if if a if a waiter brings me a, a you know a sirloin and two piles of shit, I'm still going to be mad at them. Even if there are some provisions in that bill that aren't particularly harmful. I mean, the puberty blockers thing, I think, is pretty anti scientific, charitable. Yeah, as in, as is okay, the uh, demon mama pleads it was my turn to speak if you could please be quiet you've had your turn interrupting people and everything um, too yes i asked vosh interjected as i started to speak yeah, so yeah. If, if you don't vosh mind if i don't vosh thanks and i didn't mind it was a time, fair yeah. interject so to answer vosh's interjection there no i don't i think that you're assuming that the only possible explanation for that is that the doctors were so successful but here's the problem if we know 80 to 95 percent of the people that experience gender dysphoria grow out of it what is the chances if you start with the puberty blockers that that then totally psychologically impacts them to where they decide to go. And if they wouldn't have had those puberty blockers, chances are 95% of the time they would have grew out of it. You saying, oh, no, no, that, that is proves the conjecture. correctly. No, it's also complete conjecture on your point that no, you assume wait, that 5% no, of you times have... that this occurs. How could you prove that you're right any more than I could prove so that wait, I'm right? There are, so because there are two possibilities, one where you're right and one where I'm right, we both have to make right. an assumption. So my right. assumption is that people whose job it is to detect gender dysphoria in children are good at their job. And your assertion is that puberty blockers make people trans 99% of the time. Now, I think my argument is way more reasonable than yours. I admit I can't deductively prove like the proficiency of these doctors, but your assertion that like puberty blockers make little boys into girls and vice versa, there's no evidence to suggest that. That's what it leads okay, to. Okay, and so anyways, so no, I think that the I think the assumption is strong that if 95% of the people that experience gender dysphoria, if left untreated, grow out of it, I think that that shows that there's something that's most likely that there's something negative going on with the doctors. Why can't create, the doctor just impact. be good at finding uh, out uh, when it's actually gender I, I, like, I, I, I can explain I've heard, this. I can explain I've, I've heard, this. I've heard, I've heard, uh, Demo, please. Um, Thank you. Um, so in addition to that, right, we do see that there are long term side effects, such as I could read the side effects of bone density, we could read psychological side effects and things like that for bone density, for example, there's an obvious self fulfilling nature to encouraging young child with GD to socially impersonate the opposite sex and then institute preparatal expression, purely from a social learning point of view, the repeated behavior of impersonating being treated as the opposite sex will make identity align with the child's biological sex like like. Uh, yep, it is. I'm, I'm just reading. Okay. He's actually, so, you don't, he's re he's so actually they, reading the data. I was reading reading, uh, uh, reading a doctor's opinion. I won't read it. Like, I'll just do like you all do and say, oh, the, your studies are nonsense and we're not going to read them on here. No, like, it was not that those studies. Sense. I was it's reading. Like, the, is anyone dig it, it, so, it, so after Demon Mama misrepresented what I said, uh, you acknowledged that that data is correct. That, Vosh, correct? 80 to 95% of people that But your interpretation of it is insane. That pediatric psychiatrists can't insane, do their job. You acknowledge yes, that's no, your job, you your assertion, wait, 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 your assertion wait, 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 is that okay, puberty wait, blockers wait, 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 are making that, kids that, trans. That, that, uh, wait, it's not. Okay. So when somebody asks a question and somebody starts to answer it, I would like to hear like them answer the question before we like jump down people's throats. It's just uh, more productive. So Vosh, answer the question, please. Yeah, so the bone density thing is a fairly minor problem that I think often gets overstated. It's, I mean, it's, it's not that it's not real. There are some bone density consequences to puberty blockers. Though, interestingly, as I understand it, taking puberty blockers when you're younger means that there will be less decrease in bone density. So taking them starting at 10 will lead to less of a reduction starting at 12. Not sure why that is, but the data seems to bear that out. Um, but again, studies, yeah. data okay. isn't so just that... data. It needs to be interpreted. And when your interpretation is, 
that actually it's not that pediatric psychiatrists are good at diagnosing gender dysphoria, it's that puberty blockers have a side effect of making people trans and nobody's found out yet is ridiculous. Okay, uh, if I could, and so I'll finish up okay. with this. Like, and, and the and reason that done, this is- I'm gonna pass it over to Demon Mama. I just okay, the reason this uh, is in an absurd position is as follows, because think of the situation how this occur. You're nine years old, you think that you're the opposite gender of what you were born as, right? So you go to a doctor and through whatever magic they use, they say, yes, we agree that you're born in the wrong gender. Years of psychiatric analysis. Okay. So, it's their uh, job so, to so, find out whether so, that kid is Okay, sincere. so a nine-year-old, so we're talking nine-year-olds, so you mean starting at six, they realized that they were non-gender conforming? No, they would probably start at nine or ten. Usually puberty blockers aren't okay. assigned as early but, as nine. They're usually assigned but, around 11, but, 12, or 13. Okay, anyway, as the evidence of the bill I, or that I read said that people as young as nine have received puberty blockers. As Anyways, young you, as sometimes, you but generally. Okay, right. Okay, so you get, the, well, that would prove that the doctors aren't always doing the right thing then. If, they're doing anyways, fine if they diagnose it correctly. So you're told by your family, you're told by your doctor that you're, oh, okay, your belief that you're the opposite gender is correct. Then you never go through puberty because you take puberty blockers. Do you think, and we know that 80 to 95% of people that have experienced what this very kid that went in and said- We don't know uh, that. The said, I need puberty. Yes, we do. You've no, conceded. just because some giant- Wait, hold on, wait, you're doing it again. Okay. Just because some signs of gender non-conforming behavior are demonstrated by so many children doesn't mean that every single one of them who demonstrates any form of gender non-conforming behavior gets diagnosed with gender dysphoria. The doctors select for the real cases. That's their entire job. It's not like kids are going in there with lipstick and then the doctor's like, you're a girl. Wanna... Okay, okay, okay. So I am, I am using, a, I'm using executive authority right now, okay? I didn't vote authority. for you. <laughs> I'm well, sorry, I couldn't help. I, couldn't I help. voted for you, Dylan. Sorry, I used Dominion, okay? So, too bad for you. I used Dominion, and uh, all of my votes were mail-in. So, I'm um, throwing it over to Demon Mama, who's been waiting for a while. So, I want to make sure Demon Mama has time to speak. So, this study talks about people who ever express any gender dysphoria whatsoever. And it's a very broad categorization that it uses, okay? when And you are comparing this to people who end up on puberty blockers. To get on puberty blockers, you have to have expressed gender dysphoria for a long period of time, multiple times. The study, anybody, you might have one issue with gender dysphoria, you end up on the study. But you have to have many in order to get puberty blockers. Do you see how there's a difference there? That is the main difference that's, that's being ignored here, and you're plowing through that in the name of trying to make it sound like everybody who ever has gender dysphoria is just is just being handed puberty blockers. And that's not true. You're comparing things that aren't comparable. We're talking about a study that talks about any person who ever experiences any gender dysphoria whatsoever, and you're comparing that to people who get puberty blockers, which those people have experienced gender dysphoria many times, discuss this with their parents, discuss this with their doctor, and eventually get uh, puberty blockers for that. So this is just an unbelievably ridiculous point, and I have to, have to say I agree with Vosh that the way that you're interpreting the point is insane. Also, there's another thing that I've been trying to comment on for some time, which is the, uh, the issue of surgery. Um, I believe that if a doctor and uh, and a whole bunch of, uh, of other people who are involved in this, usually at least three different doctors, if you're going to be getting surgery, sometimes more than that, all weigh in and say, yep, this person has had consistent genital-based uh, uh, dysphoria. They've gone through their puberty blockers. It's still not helping. If they want to get that, then that's, that is perfectly fine. And they should be allowed to do that because it's a medical decision. As it turns out, I happen to already know about this because – it's very, very rare for anyone to get uh, sexual reassignment surgery, sometimes referred to as bottom or top surgery, depending on the type, before they're 18. However, it does happen in certain cases where it can be demonstrated that someone is suffering massively, okay? And that is perfectly fine. The same way that we would give somebody a surgery if they needed it, if it was a, somebody under the age of 18, if they needed a serious surgery to save their life, then we would do that. The idea that they're just handing out surgeries is, again, fear-mongering based on bigotry, based on the idea that transness is some sort of like social contagion that can catch or that it's some sort of conspiracy that doctors are dropping pills trying to turn children into trans people. It's, it's totally in your imagination. That is not reflected in data. It's not reflected in reality. It's not reflected in any of the decisions that would have led to the Arkansas state, uh, state government banning the proper medical care for trans people. And if you try to contest that, you're simply lying, as you have so far, okay?
That's how it goes. Okay. So I'd yeah. like to get through a point uh, without some. So thank you. Um, yeah. So the, as I'll go back to saying is, so think of how this works. You're, uh, by the way, great demon mama just suggested uh, physically castrating people as children. So then that's fantastic. Nice. That's here team. now. So anyways, um, what, nice what, what, you're nine years old, ten years old, eleven years old. Your fam, you're talking to your family. You think that you have gender dysphoria. You talk to a doctor. Now we know eighty to ninety-five percent of the people in your position. Here we go if, again. The talking points. Same ones. Interrupt no, 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 NPC. I, shit. I wanna, you, 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 this isn't helping, right? You repeat you're just it. restating things that I just argued against. You're not even responding. That's how debates work. I could you're not responding. You're literally just I restating respond. things that we've already contested. As if, uh, would you please be quiet? No one, even your crowd, could not enjoy the content of you just interrupting people that are trying to have no, a civil. I don't know. Please be quiet. Okay. Now, anyways, so 80 to 95% of people that experience any sort of gender dysphoria and prepubescence end up growing out of that. Now, there could be people that obviously there's 15 to 5% of people that don't do that. But anyways, you go, you've been told by your doctor that, yeah, I think you have gender dysphoria. They give you pre-puberty blockers. Therefore, you never go through puberty. What do you think the chances are of you then later being like, oh, yeah, uh, actually, I think these puberty blockers were wrong. How would you know? Like, you already have your family and your doctor telling you you're the other gender. And now you don't even go through puberty to see if that experience would have said, oh, wait, no, I was just going through a phase like 80 to 95 percent of people that have this. So, of course, so when Vaj says this is a ridiculous assertion, it's not a ridiculous assertion. It is. You're far more likely to continue to say that you are non-gender conforming or have gender dysphoria if you've never had the chance to go through puberty. And there are long-lasting effects that matter. And you could see the slippery slope that this is leading to. You actually have Demon Mama suggesting, yeah, how young? 11 years old? 12 years old? Can you have the surgery at 11, 12, Demon Mama? Maybe we should let the doctors no. figure this out. Yeah, maybe. Wait, hold on. I got I to ask you about that, though, Vaughn. Do you, you also, trust wait, doctors wait, wait, implicitly? I, well, I was... Not every doctor wait, wait, in all situations, clear, but... Okay. Okay. Huh? Very quickly, but that was directed at Demon Mama pretty explicitly. So I want to Okay, I'll Demon hold off. I'll hold off. All right. All right. Okay, Demo. So again, again, we see fucking rambling Rob over here restating his exact same talking points in, in the most robotic fashion you can imagine. No response to anything that I actually said. And then going on to make some sort of weird snide remark about 10, 11, what are you going to do? Castrating kids? That is fear mongering, my lovely, lovely audience. That is what we call fear mongering. Why are you and talking to the audience? You just Rob. Why do you keep correct? pandering to the audience? Because I You're don't. You're doing the exact same thing you accuse Rob of. I don't care about Rob. I care about the people out there who are going to be voting on laws that will determine whether my people. Why are you can getting get so medical angry? Why are you just have a conversation? Please shut the fuck up because I'm talking. Right Whoa, now. excuse me. Excuse yeah. me. Excuse Please me. shut the fuck up because I'm no, talking. No, right no, absolutely not. Well, that's, that's, okay. You don't have to be disrespectful like that. Why are you? Why are you so? Why are you so emotional? Okay. Why are you so emotional? Okay. My God. Oh. May I speak now? Nam Namaste. Right. Do you know, Good Lord. I believe that I have a right to be very frustrated when I have people on here who are completely misrepresenting facts, who are totally and utterly lying to every single person watching this right now, repeatedly, just repeating the same talking points, refusing to engage in any way with things that matter to me and many people like me's life okay i think i have the right to be a little pissed off about that with all due respect and secondly especially especially when we get snide little comments like oh what are you gonna do chop off a 11 year old that's ridiculous as young listen please are you gonna actually let me answer it or are you just gonna get triggered again it's a, that's what it seems it, to be happening me 10 seconds here we go again and here come wait, your talking okay, points right okay, wait, okay let's be clear rob uh when, when she was know. talking during your thing you, you shut her down and she stopped and made sure that happened. I just want to make sure that she has the same right to do the same thing here. Okay. Dear mama. Doctors will make the decision that is necessary. The earliest I have ever heard of someone getting surgery, and I am pretty well versed on this. This is sort of something that's important to my life, uh, is 16. And that was, again, in the case of somebody who was experiencing extreme dysphoria based on their genitals that was made with the consultant of many doctors not just one not just some magic doctor who came in it was like i'm going to trans you also it's clear that you're incredibly ignorant about the state of familial support for trans people in the united states just so you know most trans people do not get the support of their family in fact their their doctors often have to combat with their family in order to even get them basic health care as in 
when families find out their kid is trans, they often do things like what my family did, which is they try to get you siloed off to a Christian therapist who will in, who will in, in, introduce you to to conversion therapy or or conversion therapy light. That's what they try to do. They fight the doctors. They fight science. They fight science just like you are, just like Arkansas is, just like every other state that brings these ridiculous anti-intellectual, anti-science, trans. Uh, anti-trans laws into place and it is bigotry it is and yes you making stupid snide jokes about whether i'm gonna whether people are gonna castrate an 11 year old is unbelievably first of all unbelievably stupid and embarrassing but also it is bigoted yeah i'm gonna go there i'm gonna go there i'm gonna say it that's bigoted okay. hey fine man uh, so Rob, she and then Vosh afterwards. Said, Vosh. Like, what, five sure. minutes and answer a simple question. We're not talking about the youngest that you heard of someone having transition therapy. You were quite explicit. You said, yeah, John made a point. I didn't think anyone would argue it. He just made a point like, look, this bill also says you can't have, uh, you know, adolescents having this surgery. And you took it upon yourself to get a chip on your shoulder and say, yeah, I'm going to go there. Uh, if you went through the puberty blockers and stuff and you still need the surgery, then yeah, you should have it. So I thought it was a reasonable question to my point to say, you're suggesting no, you don't know. He's 11. I th like again, like you, you're purporting yourself in a very unprofessional and idiotic manner. I think uh, if this if this is the content that people want, that's fine. I, I heavily disagree with Vosh, but I think he's been nothing but gentlemanly the whole time. Uh, and, and I think we could have had a much better conversation if you weren't here. I'll be honest. All you really do is talk about feeling you know, your personal feelings and like you know how you're a victim, and then you repeat Vosh's talking points. So congratulations, I guess. But I I, I just I, I I just I'm tired of this idea that somehow that you're entitled to some sort of ground on this because this is an issue that you're heavily concerned about. That's fine. There's all sorts of issues I'm heavily concerned about. I would never think Vosh's arguments like you have to do, that, again, the dead, dead bodies. Okay, so wait, okay. okay. Let's that's be very, okay, wait, 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 okay, okay, let's be I very, didn't realize you could speak for Vosh. Wait, okay, let's wait, stop. Wait. Okay. Represent him too? First of all, um, as, part, as part as part Yeah. Huh? Okay. okay. Gonna say a few things. Rob is going to be able to finish because I shut Rob down when Rob tried to inter intervene on Demon Mama. So now Rob's going to be able to finish. For everybody complaining in chat, shove it. I no longer care. You're not criticizing my debate style because you or my moderation style because you care about moderation. You're just going rah rah for a team right now. Shove it. If you don't like it, tell me. I don't care. Got it. Continue, Rob. Okay, so again, I just want to get back to the idea that I think that the analogy that I made, or that the scenario I painted, it, regardless if you have familiar support or not, if you have a doctor telling you that, yeah, they agree with you that you're the opposite gender, even though 80 to 95% of the people in your position ultimately will grow out of it when they hit puberty, and then you take puberty blockers to never go through puberty, the chances are that you will remain that transition gender for the rest of your life. That seems to make, logically make sense. There is no evidence one way or the other, as Vosh admitted, so we're going with which story makes more sense, that the doctors are just almost always impeccably right when they're relying heavily on what the child says when determining what their gender is or that if you give puberty blockers to someone that the doctor's acknowledging might already be the opposite gender that they'll never go through that puberty to become the gender that they would have naturally grown out of the other thing is there are serious side effects as we talked about with the bone density there's also serious psychological side effects how many people's lives have been detrimented because they would have transit been in that 80 to 95 percent population that would have transitioned back or would have admitted that they didn't act once they hit puberty, they were actually the gender that they were born, but then they don't. So there's possible psychological side effects. In addition, there are specific gender or puberty blockers like Lupron that have actually resorted in horrible side effects for people that take that drug for puberty blocking in this case and in others. And lastly, uh, I just want to say Demon Mama says that this is the medical information of the entire world. The NHS in the UK, which we are told in America oftentimes is better than the United States, has ruled. You cannot give puberty blockers because the Talvistock Institute figured out that or claimed after a research, they said that these puberty blockers did have long lasting effects and that children were not capable to make these decisions and that the doctors were not able to make these decisions successfully. So 
it's not the entire world. There's clearly a debate about this, which one, I side with the people on that side of the debate. But even if not, even if you're someone reasonable at this area like Vosh that's saying, no, actually, I disagree with that. It is clear that there is room to have disagreement that doesn't just mean that you're a bigot or that you're hateful or that you're ignorant and things like that. So it's just really childish debate tactics. And I think that there is a, a that, like we should heavily, especially now when we're talking about literal castration, uh, manual castration of people that are underage. I think that you can see where this is going and it's a really bad place okay okay so d mama i'll Wait. give you 30 seconds of response oh. this is a back and forth then vosh i know vosh i'm sorry but d mama you got 30 seconds of vosh um yeah i mean i don't even know how to respond to that it was just the exact same robotic npc talking points that we've heard this entire time i don't really think i need to restate all of my arguments over again so that rob can just do it again five minutes from now um okay, but yeah uh, the, 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 one study I will say one other thing that's that's unrelated, which is the, to the new information that was introduced about the a UK study. One study does not a uh, does not a uh, consensus make, and and the WHO, the American Psychological Association, disagrees with these these findings. So yeah, uh, it just sounds like you're finding trying to find post hoc justifications for the fact that you came into here not knowing anything about trans people and trying to make uh, your uninformed opinion a matter of fact when it is not. Okay, Bosch. Okay, I have a lot to say, actually. <clears throat> First of all, it wasn't the NHS that decided that puberty blockers shouldn't be given to children. It was the courts. That was not a medical decision. That was another political Smart. one, exactly like what we're dealing in Arkansas. You say, right, but that completely refutes your argument. We're talking about the medical consensus here. We are talking about what bureaucrats and legal experts decide. But sorry, they're not doctors. Second of all, Rob, I'm really sorry this has been explained a few times, but you seem to be critically incapable of understanding this data. Your argument that because some children at some point in their life experience some kind of gender dysphoria means that almost all of the children who get puberty blockers are actually like turning trans because of the puberty blockers instead of the doctors just being able to discern is absurd. Why do you think they spend years with these kids? Do you think every single Single child who's ever expressed even a slight bit of gender non-conforming behavior gets to survive i mean gets to run through years of psychiatry from a uh, pediatric psychiatric professional that's ridiculous like every kid who ever put on lipstick is like all right off to the doctor with you and they get shepherded for six nine twelve months on this issue ridiculous no that'd be like saying that um just because like 99 percent of kids who go to the doctor with an arm pain end up getting a splint but 95% of kids who injure their arm at all end up recovering without a splint. So, like, are splints unnecessary? No. The job of the doctor is to determine when the pain is severe enough to warrant a splint. That's the job of the psychi psychiatric professionals. Additionally, first of all, as part of the Biden transition team, all political rhetoric on the left stems downstream from me. Demon Mama doesn't copy me any more than I copy Destiny. Third of all, I think it's a little bit crass to repeatedly accuse her of being uncouth or tone policing when what we're essentially arguing right now is the extent to which the medical treatment surrounding her identity is valid. Okay? Um, I can understand a person being frustrated under the best circumstances given those preconditions. As a white guy, I mean, I guess I'm pansexual, so I fuck men, but beyond that, really, I'm pretty hegemonically accepted. All the discussions that I have on these issues are product of me being completely alienated from the actual consequences. Trump could win again. I don't care. I'm rich. I'm white. It doesn't matter to me, okay? The only reason I care about these topics is because I have some abstract moral allegiance to them, but some people live them day in and day out. Can't really blame them for getting frustrated. So with all of that being said, with the what, what do we get? We got the NHS. We got the analogy. We got the all of that. Look, yeah, okay, look. The science on this stuff is relatively new. The sociology on this stuff is relatively new. But just because it's new doesn't mean it's unfounded. I understand some trepidation on these topics, especially since we're dealing with children here. But when we look at it, children have been subjected to, fairly and with good research prior, decades and decades and decades worth of medical treatment that is to their benefit, whether we're talking physical, psychiatric, it's to their benefit. And when we do it, we do it because we know it works. And it seems like this stuff works. So if we're going to discuss the edge cases here, 
I would do what I think is most responsible to do when talking about a highly technical profession and defer to the expertise because I'm not a doctor. I never will be a doctor. And while I understand this issue better than most laymen, I certainly don't understand it as well as a researcher would. So all I can do is try to see how well they're putting this info forward. Now, I don't trust to say what you say earlier, John Burke. I do not trust all doctors flat out. Doctors have incentives to lie sometimes. Take a look at the pharmaceutical mm -hmm. industry, the opioid crisis. They overprescribe mm -hmm. pain medication. You know, you get a little yep. step, you get a splinter in your toe, and all of a sudden you're being given, you know, 12 Over months Medicaid, of opioids. Yeah. I'm not here for mm -hmm. that. But the difference there is that in the case of the opioid epidemic, in the case of the pharmaceutical industry, there is a direct link that I can point to. These companies are pushing these doctors to prescribe yeah. this product. It's easy, it's verifiable, mm -hmm. but there isn't some multi-billion dollar trans lobby that's like pressuring, pressuring doctors to give puberty blockers to kids. There is a conspiracy theory that, um, that uh, the psychiatric uh, industries in this country, the, um, the APA, changed their definition on the uh, homosexuality, whether or not it's a uh, mental disorder or not. They changed it back in the 80s. And there are people who say the only reason the APA changed that definition in the DSM is because there was a big protest outside of their building. They say the only reason doctors do not believe that gayness is a mental disorder today is because of a protest. But I don't believe that. And I don't believe that the public progressive pressure that we see today, the pro-trans lobby, is influencing decades of medical practice. I think they're pretty on the nose with this. And hey, maybe there are some mistakes. Maybe in the future there will be amends. But right now, I feel like we're looking at a pretty decent set of data that affirm a pretty effective set of positions which are necessary to address a very real world problem. Because I'm not a parent, but I knew that if I was, I wouldn't want my kids committing suicide. I'd want them to be happy. And I would fully investigate whatever research allowed me to realize that dream. And that's I, You can even count that as my final statement, by the way. John Burke. While I, I agree, or well, actually I, I disagree, in regards to uh, what Vosh said, that he doesn't feel like there's kind of trans lobbyists trying to force opioid or a specific kind of trans medication for treating children, I, I think that's a little bit beyond the point. What I would rather discuss is the idea that if we agree that we, we're dealing with an opioid epidemic, we're dealing with an opioid crisis, that pills are being forced down children's, like you're talking about Redolin, things such as that. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's like realistic, like these, these, these companies are saying, well, based upon what we want to see happen, this is the medication we're going to force versus it's about money. They just want to make money. In regards to that being said, um, I, I'm trying to, uh, hmm. I, I just, I, I disagree in the sense that to sit there and say, if, if doctors have the possibility of being wrong and misdiagnosing, which has been shown to be done, malpractice, I mean, my God, and just in the VA alone, I think it was in 2019, it was over like $6 billion. It was, it was insane. Um, the fact that it even exists, would it not make more sense? And this is me just speculating here. Would it not make more sense to say, for example, bring that child to a therapist to get help until they become to the age of a consenting, consenting age to where they can make that determination. And I'm not trying to argue that people should not have access to receiving the surgery or the medication. I think it's your body. You do what you want with it when you're an adult when you're 18 years of age to make a permanent reversal to go back to what was also said in regards to that's the point, but that's no, no hold on now we're not phrasing just puberty we y'all keep doing that well that's, that's what i'm mostly the arguing bill. for that, the surgery no, thing that's is not more... what's in the bill that's what we can't we can't just cherry pick one we're talking about the bill that's what we're talking about here so we keep missing these other two more important things of surgery and hormone these are we keep we keep we keep missing this but so anyway, are you okay the with the puberty is, blockers then no, absolutely not. Well, no. in that case, I mean, we know what the medical treatment here is. We do give these the kids bill. therapy, but the therapy comes Ooh. alongside treatment that seems to be most effective. Mm -hmm. It's just, I mean, with all due right. respect here, and again, I understand mm -hmm. the position, but it seems like your opposition to this treatment is an intuitive one. That the bulk of medical um, analysis seems to overwhelmingly verify that this leads to lower suicide rates, higher rates of happiness, but it like, it feels like dangerous, you know, or it feels wrong. But we used to feel the same way about surgery. Germ theory wasn't even around until about 170 years ago. And up to that point, the idea of surgeons washing their hands between treating patients was seen as like a backwoodsy, like phobic, right. you're a new guy on the job type. Right now. We're not worshiping certain gods that don't or don't exist or worshiping. You're, you're, you're making very inaccurate comparisons here. I think that we're in an age now where common sense is, it's pretty common, well, maybe wrong, wrong. I shouldn't have said that. Uh, I, I would say that we're I very don't know. Well you educated. said it though. I know. 
I know, I know. I shouldn't have said that. Common sense is certainly not so common anymore. But I, no, I think the consensus across the board for, I think a lot of people that, are, that are agree with me is a sense of these are children. Children go through phases. Children sometimes are unhappy whether it could be depression. But if there's a possibility of misdiagnosing just one person and possibly, as what this bill is saying, what was vetoed, that they could undergo the transition therapy permanently, irreversible, wouldn't it be worth saving one person from being misdiagnosed and having that permanent thing done? Or, and this does exist as far as, far as parents How trying many to influence their children into being trans or gay? Themselves. But That's here's the thing. Business. But to, the other point that I wanted to make was in the sense of parents not trying to uh, change their children. That actually does exist. It actually happened here in Plano, Texas. A big court, Governor Abbott, Ted Cruz got involved. The mother was saying the child was trans. The child was saying it was a boy. The mother was saying no. Court custody. This does happen. To say it doesn't is actually a fact. That's, that's false. But it does every happen. medical procedure has a risk of there sometimes being malpractice or harm. May I? Should we never yeah, do like triple that. heart bypasses? Miss, miss Should we never do... Though radiation therapy for cancer i mean literally all medicine could be condemned if, because there's always a possibility you can give minor anti-allergens to a kid and they could die from a, from a reaction to that but that doesn't mean you can't give these we're, medications we're talking to... about a surgery though, a permanent surgery you're, you're, what you're about anti-psychiatric meds those have okay, a severe I'm gonna, effect. I'm just going to intervene. Like, uh, so uh, one, I wanted to respond to something that Bush wait, said. I, I wanna, he said that clear. we wait, wait. Let me be clear. We have 13 minutes left before I have to end stream because I got to get to an. That, that was my closing Six statement tomorrow. as well. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Was, yeah. So uh, it seems Rob and Dean Mama both want to say things. So Rob the Dean Mama, then we're going to okay. wrap it up. All right. So uh, Vosh said that I that it was just uh, politicians and a court and uh, that ruled in the NHS. But the problem with that is the court made their decision basically on the findings of the National Institute in Health Care of Excellence, uh, which said the quote evidence for the use of puberty blocking drugs to treat young people struggling with their gender identity is, quote, very low. An official review. What file. was the name of that organization? That, I just want to know uh, just the National know. Institute of Health and Care Excellence. Nice. And I'll link this. This is from the BBC, but I could link it to you. So here's the problem, right? So this is the misnomer that, like, what I think the disconnect with Bosch is saying. Bosch is saying, well, he even admits, he says, there's not a large body of evidence about this. Think of what we're talking about. We're doing something that throughout human history and evolution, we know is something that is homeostasis and normal for humanity to go through the proper puberty, uh, puberty, what criteria is, to basically non interfering when it comes fallacy. to puberty. The problem, no, it's not a fallacy. And People again, didn't use like, to fly. Like, I, no, no, Vosh, I, I, humans maybe used I, to have the heart wrong. they maybe were born Maybe with. you're rubbing up, maybe you're taking deep cribbing no, demon but like you could, again, you could argue against any time. medical like, procedure. I mean, that I way. sit here quietly. Like, it seems like every time I talk 30 seconds in, someone else chimes in, and then I never get to finish my thoughts. So, anyways, here's the deal. Why would we do something like, why would we do something against what we know is normal human health until we have evidence to suggest a big body of evidence to suggest that it's beneficial to do so we don't have a big body you of evidence, evidence as you even admitted excuse me please stop interrupting as even you admitted it's even you admitted you said there's not a big body of evidence on this we have no, I didn't. The, uh, the, 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 yes you did you said that it's new we don't have a lot of evidence on here's it. a meta analysis it's a new field, of so we should trust studies. the doctors again you can keep interrupting because anytime someone's making a point that you disagree with that's the only option that you have here's i understand that tendency so i'll finish my point and i'll just keep talking so again okay. we have an actual medical we journal that we have a one minute ending statement so anybody wants to say anything right now just remember that okay rob finish yeah so anyway so even uh, this organization in britain that the court based their decision on shows that there's not a lot of evidence or a body of work to suggest that puberty blockers work so why would we take a radical solution for children as young as nine years old and put them on these puberty blockers when it can have long-term serious health effects Right. The evidence that you're citing that says, oh, uh, suicide rates go down again, as far as I know, and I'm willing to prove uh, see, be proven wrong. Demon Mama says one study does not make a, you know, a consensus. Well, I've only seen one study that suggests that the suicide rates go down. And I already talked sure, about that more. study. Sure, that's great. And I would love to read them. That study interviewed 89 people. These were and it was we don't know if it was causation or correlation because these people that received that treatment clearly had the support network to be able to get that treatment in the first place. So yes, later in life, they said I had less suicidal thoughts. We don't know that they would have committed suicide if they don't get this treatment. We don't know if it was the hormone blockers or the puberty blockers that caused them to not have the suicidal side effects, yeah. or the fact that they had doctors and family that were clearly closely taking uh, taking interest in their situation. We don't no. Now I'm willing to look at other studies, but one study of 89 people doesn't seem to be enough to outweigh the fact that we're t doing something to people's bodies that is it would be a serious medical intervention that has serious long-term consequences such as bone density, psychological impacts, and we could be changing people's life. Again, 980 to 95% of people 
that experience gender dysphoria if untreated will grow we, out of it. How many people keep took doing these hormone me, blockers, these we, puberty, how many people took these puberty blockers and then they never experienced puberty that would have elsewise said, oh, wait, no, I was just going through a phase. We can't keep we doing don't this know. to me. We, we, okay, sure. I have to go to, I really have to go to bed at midnight, so we got to throw it over to Dima Mama, and then we're going to have final statements, and I'll announce who won, okay? Dima Mama. Um, yeah, uh, it, I don't even know what to address here. Uh, I guess we're going to go into final statements after this, so I'll take this second to just address something that John brought up before. Um, that there's a there's an attempt to fixate on on the surgical thing because it is you know it's the most shocking the most extreme version but as i stated before it is very exceedingly uncommon at this point for any person who's under the age of 18 and especially under the age of 16 to ever receive it it's only reserved for the most extreme most uh well vetted cases and so that part of the law really doesn't matter it's it's touching on something that basically doesn't exist what does matter about this law are the two other uh the the two other major um uh i can't even think of the word that i'm trying to come up with the two other pieces hormone and the uh puberty yeah, blockers. The, the puberty blockers and then the other one which is denying adult trans people health care which can happen it is now legal in the state to deny trans people uh, for an insurance company to deny trans people uh health care coverage which wasn't previously legal now it is um and then we didn't even talk about that but yeah the uh with regard to the puberty blockers this is the bigger issue the bigger issue right now is that there are states that are trying to restrict this and we just found out that arkansas is willing to do that even though the science disagrees with them and it will continue to disagree with them. We've been studying this stuff forever. The downsides are next to nothing. They're much, it's much less risky than almost anything else, and it has massive positive benefits. But I guess that doesn't matter at the end of the day because, I mean, really, we, we just witnessed this whole thing. Uh, we witnessed Rob come in here and, and say that he didn't know anything about it, but now he's suddenly an expert on every study that's existed. Um, and we've seen a complete disregard for the actual impact of these things. Um, and also conveniently ignoring the fact that these decisions are not made by medical institutions. These are made by highly, highly politicized, often right-leaning groups that push these things through into law and intervene between the medical treatment of a trans person and their doctor. So, Okay, yeah. so let's do final statements. We're going to start with Rob. Okay, uh, yeah. Um, I think that, obviously, this is a topic that people get emotional about. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But at the end of the day, like, my final statement is basically what I just said. It's that there's not a large body of evidence of this. There's clearly disagreement, and we should resist the idea of allowing children to have input on serious, life-changing, life-altering medical decisions. Children as young as 9, 11, things like that, that we don't trust to make serious decisions about the rest of their life. It's not completely reversible, and we don't know how much influence them getting these puberty blockers leads to them making a decision they elsewise would have not made and would have grown out of if they didn't get these puberty blockers. We know that there's serious side effects of bone density. We know that there's serious side effects with some of the particular medications that were used that would harm people's lives. There is nothing that says that when you turn 16, 17, when you get to be an adult that you can't make these decisions. Uh, there are all sorts of treatments at that point. There are all sorts of surgeries you could get at that point. I fully support anyone who's an adult getting any of these uh, medications or any of these treatments that they seek necessary. However, having children do them is a huge, huge, huge problem. And you can see the slippery slope we're leading to where Demon Mama says, yeah, it doesn't matter. We should be able to have the surgeries as well. Uh, this is devastating. We could see that I presented evidence from other places that talked about how most of the people grow out of it. I presented evidence from a British source, uh, a techno uh, I'm sorry, a British NICE, uh, National Institute of SAS, children something i forget the name of it uh that talked about how there's just not enough body of evidence to show that these puberty blockers are successful and the study that we've been talking about the whole debate was 89 people who said yeah i guess i felt less suicidal after i got the puberty blockers um maybe there's more studies out there i, I would be interested to see but uh yeah i just think that this is something that we could see the slippery slope we're going down to uh we're having these serious medical interventions for children and it's something we should strongly resist because if it turns out that they're wrong they have just sanctioned doctors ruining the lives of countless children and that would be devastating next is going to be john burke oh yeah well for starters dylan thank you for the invite man thank you for always coming over on mine as well thank you for being an amazing moderator tonight man a lot of uh, a lot of love there uh vosh always a pleasure sir it's the first time getting to actually have a conversation with you heard a lot about you um certainly not um uh i am i'm sorry I'm, it's been a long freaking day and i'm tired uh it's been very it's been very nice to have a conversation with you you were gonna uh, say you'd heard mom, bad things weren't you no 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 i said you certainly lived up to the expectation i had in regards to just how intelligent you are i would love to have more conversations with you in the future because uh 
I think there's just, I, I love talking to people that I probably don't agree with, but at least they're able to explain their point in a very intelligent manner that does make me think, and I do appreciate that. I'd be happy Demon to Demon Mama, I know we're, we're probably not going to see eye to eye on a lot of things. I don't hate you. I, I want nothing but the best for you and to have access to the same human rights as every other American in this country. Um, but, yeah, and then Rob, as always, my man, always a pleasure being on here with you as well. Love the points you make. And, yeah, that's all I got to say. So thank you for, for inviting me. Okay. Now I'm going to throw it over to Vosh. Yeah, um, it was always a pleasure. I appreciate these conversations. Um, I thought that we actually were able to get a lot of um, really interesting discussion out of this, which I appreciate. I didn't feel like it was too circle jerky at any point. Um, to anyone who's still on the fence about like the child transitioning thing, I understand that it's a fairly complicated and I guess intuitively, um, uh, I don't know, concerning topic. But there is a lot of data out there on it, and I would encourage you to look at it, maybe segmented, you know, bit by bit, puberty blockers at first, because a lot of the stuff there, I mean, hey, listen, okay, I'll sell you on a different argument, okay? Not just is it cool and seems to be medically functional, we're laying into transhumanism soon, okay? Trans people are on the forefront, okay? They're the vanguard of this, because we are getting better and better and better at making people the way they want to be, and I think that's phenomenal. I, I really do. Anyway, um... So that's great. Uh, hopefully it's better than Cyberpunk 2077 was. Um, Dylan, <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate you hosting this as always. You look lovely in your robe. Um, John and Rob, thank you both for taking the time to talk to me. Demon Mama, you know we buds, so it doesn't even need to be said. Hope you're doing well. And yeah, that's I, I seed my, my uh, ending. Bit. Okay. I'm now going to send it over to Demon Mama for the last statement. Appreciate that. Yeah, this is a pretty heavy issue um, for me, uh, and uh, I get pretty frustrated when I see the level of um, sort of blatant and willful misinformation, the rattling off of lies and misinterpretations. It really, really annoys me, um, and it annoys me because I have to see – I have to live every single life not only knowing that a lot of this stuff could eventually affect me, but that it will affect people that I care about deeply, um, and I've watched this. I've watched this for – decades i've watched this for my whole life i've watched uh us you know trans people in the trans community make very minor wins and then have those things stolen away from us uh and then we're told that we're uh irrational or screeching or or mean or whatever when we try to fight back and you know i get used to it it happened on the last panel i was on and of course immediately afterwards i was subjected with thousands and thousands of comments about how i'm a horrible monster uh, uh not a not a woman and all of these other things and it's a uh, just another day in the life of being a trans person in america and it, this this panel really displayed exactly what i'm talking about there's a complete disregard for any actual seeking of truth it's all just concern trolling all the way down and these types of laws are fueled at the end of the day by bigotry and they come at the cost of trans lives and that's why uh i get pretty worked up about it and uh, also why i get so mad when uh, people come on to public platforms, state that they don't know anything about it, and then rattle off a bunch of pre-prepared NPC-like points. It is very annoying. It's very annoying because it affects me and it affects the people I care about the most. And uh, if, it, if, it, if it bothers you um, that, uh, that I get mad about this, well, with all due respect, die mad. And uh, that's all. Trans rights and trans thriving forever. Wait, you you said you care about people dying, but then you tell someone to die? Yep. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. I said okay. die mad. Everyone's going to die. Still okay. die, though. Well, Wait, she could be saying, like, when you're 98, oh. surrounded by your family, oh. like, the last oh, second yeah. before you, you death takes term, you. Term? Yeah. Okay. Die mad is a, is, a, is a common slang term. I know you might not be caught up with the youngins these days, but, uh, yeah, it's something. Nah, yeah. Nah, I kind of kind of have my own thing going on right now. I don't, I don't, I'm not hip. I'm not with it, I guess. Fair enough. Yeah. This is interesting. This is interesting result. Okay. I have the results. Are you all interested in hearing what the results are? <laughs> sure. More pause, okay. champ. Everyone in chat. The way the voting worked is there's three rounds. Each round, there are five judges who all decide who did like the best during that section. And then you add the three rounds up to see who the winner is. The first round was a tie between Vosh and John Burke. The second round, Vosh. The third round, 
Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Am I reading this right? Boss is ready for it. He's ready to get up. <laughs> no, it's, it's going to be Destiny or something. It's going to be some <laughs> soaked on left. And still the hippy dippy champion. Vosh wins the third round, meaning he retains the championship. Thank you for taking Congratulations. that. Congratulations. 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 Bring it in. There we go. I want to recount. <laughs> Stop Hanging chads. Bring it in. There we go. Hold on. How, how fat am I? Let's find out, huh? There we go. Happy. I got it. it. No, wait, I don't even have it on. There we go. Does it help keep your pants up? Will it fit through a loop? Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> depends on the loop, it huh? Has the, it has the uh, little clicky things. It clicks it together. It a, it's place. actually a really mm. nice belt, like, unironically. It it, each, thing, each single little uh, plate is custom designed with a different thing that represents either Twitch, YouTube, Mike's the world, etc. I can do it. Hold on. Bring it in. Yeah, there we go. Oh, uh, yeah? You say I'm fat, huh? That's four notches in. Last time I did this, it was three. How about that, huh? Yeah. Look at him. Bring it in. The retaining champion. For anybody who wants to see how the votes went for the specific rounds, uh, that will be posted publicly on Twitter later. Uh, and I can tell you, the amount of detail some of these judges sent me in documents after, after the fact of how they actually judge each round, um, we're really improving the game on how the judging system works. I'm happy to see Vosh retain. For anybody else, last comments before I ask Vosh what he wants to do next as champion. Rob Noor, what do you have to say? Oh, no, just thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Uh, I do. We do debates on Wednesday if anyone's interested, uh, normal debates. Uh, other than that, you can find me pretty much every night live streaming on Rob Noor on Twitch or other places, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern time. Only on weekdays, though. Weekends, I take off usually. So thanks so Wonderful. much. Next is going to be uh, uh, Demon Mama. Oh, yeah. Bosh, congratulations. Uh, as always, the reigning All bribes. of debate. Congratulations. And John Burke as the only person who tied around with Vosh today. I think Rob did far better than I did. I think Rob did way better. For me, it was a learning yeah. experience. I, I, like, I like getting to listen to other people with very good intellectual background or intellectual solid points to at least get me thinking about things. So, yeah, I was a little bit quiet. I, I still have a lot to process after this, a lot to think about. But it uh, doesn't mean I'm going to agree. But I, I do at least want to give it some consideration. So, But thank you for at least having me on here and having these good debates. I love this. Happy to hear it. And uh, Vosh. You're uh, the retaining champion. What's next for you? Well, um, now that I've beaten Bloodborne, and that's kind of the whole reason I got into this, I'm probably going to be deleting my social <laughs> soon. So this was kind of a last hurrah for me. Um, I'm going off the grid now. Um, no, you know what's next? I want You know who I want you to get on here? Get Jordan Peterson on here, okay? I've got to be with that guy, all right? Make it happen. You're the, what, youngest foreign Jordan policy Peterson. advisor in all of American history? You can do it. Jordan Peterson, you want you're challenging Jordan Peterson for the Hippie Dippy Championship. I'm challenging Jordan Peterson. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna talk about a lot of stuff. All right. Wow. Well, I'll I'll do my best, Vosh. Wonderful. I believe uh, Jordan Peterson yeah. v Vosh coming to a theater near you, 2040. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody for tuning in, uh, and uh, you may all uh, leave. Thank you again for coming in. Uh, Vosh is the retaining champion. Uh, we'll see the fallout on Monday. As we uh, look at tear tear through the different analysis of the debate. See you guys yes. later. Thank you See all you later, very guys. much. Everyone have a wonderful evening.